Block 3 Dash back inside the Manila Dash Samantha? Do you have a moment? Iris approached the lieutenant just as she was about to retire in her bed. Sure. She answered as she handed the list back to Robert and followed up inside the cargo ship and into one of the staterooms. Iris. What's with the need for secrecy here? Iris closed the door and moved to the viewport at the end of the room. Do not trust the elf. She turned back to look at Sam with a stern look. She's not who she says she is. Sam stood still for a moment before walking up right next to Iris. Looking through the viewport, she saw Vincent and Aliathra in the former's car. The man still trying to put the charm on the girl that was obviously uncomfortable with her current dilemma. We know she's a spy, Iris. She turned to look at her friend who didn't look surprised by this fact. Diaz and Abidia must have told her. We figured the best way to try to convince her that we are not demons is to show her who we are. Hopefully, she'll realize the truth and we can avoid conflict with the Gleasons. Vinny's been with her trying to charm her right now in his car. And if his Mustang bumping up and down in any indication, he's taking the James Bond route. Samantha gave her side of the story. It was already so obvious the moment that Aliathra crashed into their little diplomatic expedition. She and even the likes of the simpleton Abidio it was obvious she was a spy. Normally a spy's fate would be a quick death or a trip to prison to be tortured off of their knowledge but the elf was a very special case if stock knowledge served Lieutenant Rose right. She probably misunderstood the youth's intentions and perhaps she should take some notes down from Sun Tzu's treatise on espionage. Double agents. Enemy agents originally intending to exploit us, who we then recruit to our side. Hopefully her little gamble with using mercy pays off in the long run and the elf woman would put in a good word for them to the wider Gleesian world. Iris closed her eyes and shook her head before responding. Sadly, that is unlikely. I noticed when we were having pizza yesterday, the fake smile and empty flattery. How mere moments ago, she was eavesdropping on what you and Mr. Byongchen were discussing behind a stack of crates. She still believes you and the youth are demons. Or, at the least, a grave threat to the order of Gleesia. And then there is that prophecy that states the end of everything at the hands of demons. No doubt left to fester in the mind of Empress Laeja for a while now and spread to others. I don't see this ending without bloodshed. Unfortunately, the vampire witch is right about being too optimistic. Gleesia is a primitive, medieval world and its people are driven by their own superstitious fears and paranoia. Add the magic factor and it's no wonder they believe that demons are real cause they might actually be real. They even claim to have faced such beings in the past. This is so ridiculous. Sam leaned her back on the wall as she tried to think. Well, you're Gleesian. Iris. What do you know about the elves? Iris blinked once before moving to sit on a chair. That play, I mean movie, Lord of the Rings, gave a pretty accurate depiction. The elves were the first to discover the mana crystals. Their continent of Alfelnora has the largest deposit of crystals in the world. They were the first to uncover their power and the gift of magic which was eventually spread throughout the world. They stand as the most advanced and powerful nation in the world. Even when my kind were at our apex, we were only second to the elves and nowhere near as strong. Let me guess. They looked down at the other younger races and species, thinking themselves above all others and more adult to them all. Sam used quotation fingers for emphasis. Iris gave a light chuckle before replying. Are you sure you never encountered any elves before Gleesa? They both shared a short laugh at how accurate Earth's depiction on elves really is. They do indeed feel like they should be the parents to the other species, guiding them to a great future without meddling in their affairs much. But there are those who believe they should take a more active approach in guiding them, she said in a grim tone. The lieutenant moved off the wall as her mind processed what Iris just said with the way she said it. Oh boy. I see where this is going. They believe they should rule over all others, right? Iris nodded in confirmation. They grew to the point that a civil war broke out and eventually lead to the split of the continent between the two. The elven divide it came to be called as the passing of Jeltigar's comet signified. Wait. Samantha raised her hand to stop Iris from proceeding on. Jeltigar's comet. Aliathra mentioned that during the interrogation. Why is that so special? 
the comet passes every 200 years or so. When it does, it signifies a great change will happen. Whether that change is good or bad, no one can truly say. Just speculate and wait. The comet actually passed by just a couple of months before your arrival. This was vital info. The passing of the comet and what it represents in Gleesian culture plays a key role on their civilization. If they thought this comet's recent passing meant something was going to occur. Iris, did anything happen when the comet made its pass? Amazingly, when the comet passed, it affected the Monarch crystals and mages alike. Increased the energy exponentially. My necklace went. What you would say hey why during the passing, it glowed brightly and it illuminated the room so much I was nearly blinded. She gestured to her necklace with refined unbinilium. Aliathra mentioned that a future vision foresaw our arrival and their destruction. Is that even possible? Iris was in a bit of a lose with that. I, I heard theories about the possibility of using magic to glimpse the future. But the amount of power and crystals needed. Not only is it impossible, an attempt would be dangerous. Suicidal even. The lieutenant gave out a heavy sigh as she cupped her hand over her face and moved to sit on the bed across from Iris. It seems they did try. Aliathra confirmed it and I don't believe she was lying. From what you said, they took advantage to the boost in power thanks to the comet. And whatever they saw lead them to think we are demons that will destroy everything they love. Which could end up happening if they keep trying to fight us. self fulfilling prophecy if there ever was one. The act in which people make the prediction come true. Sam turned to Iris after hearing what she said. Abidio explained it to me. Their attempts at trying to stop the prophecy from happening is what's making the prophecy come to pass. Rather insidious. The moral being, careful not to become the architect of your own demise. Which leads to something else to consider. Sam leaned back in her chair. What else is wrong? Not telling Aliathra that she has that metal heart. Iris said bluntly. Sam stared at Iris for a few seconds before lowering her head in thought. They haven't told Dahlia through the truth. Too afraid how she'd react. Might even kill herself with the way she believes the youth are demons. But if they don't tell her, and the mages in Gleesia can tell her heart is not natural and do the killing for her. If Iris' opinion had any weight into it. Either way, Aliathra is one way or the other screwed. A shame to see such a beautiful ranger and cleric of sorts be dashed away from this cruel world by her extraordinary circumstances. Dash. Meanwhile inside Dias's Mustang. Dash. A slow melodious tune played on the back of Aliathra and Vinny's ears. The sounds coming from the Mustang's sound systems, with Diaz having the elf maiden's body tucked on his chest, awake but her eyes close and ears focused on the soothing music being played. He gave out laugh, he knew just by the damn actions of this elf that Aliathra was some sort of spy. The girl however, was a horrible one in his expert opinion. He counted the various obvious mistakes the elf spy made that just made her scream espionage. First was her dynamic entry into the manila earlier than week. Second was her constant questioning of various specific technical things and lastly was her eyes. In his experiences with micro-emotions, Aliathro had an agenda of unknown but most likely shady of kinds. If it were up to him and a paro corp. They would all too eager get the chance to rip the intel off of a live person, and in the case of Aliathra plus her elvenirs, would fetch a high price in the more red lighted of markets. If it weren't for as Samantha calls it Clark's third law he would have gone his way in a heartbeat. But then again, Vinny loved to have company in his car, and rarely a beautiful woman such as the elf who was breathing steadily yet delicately on his chest. He could feel the warm beat of her heart through his built-in heartbeat sensor. Curiously according to the AI that connects all of his augments together, the sensor says that the elf's body was inside and out physiologically similar to humans yet the sensor also detects several unidentified elements it was not equipped to further analyze. I wonder if half-elves exist in Gleesia. Diaz muttered carelessly. Who? Aliathra opened her as you rise and looked at his eyes. A. Eh? Nothing. So, Miss Aliathra, 
tell me more about yourself? Diaz asked for some questions. Even the littlest of details can go a long way as Samantha and Vinny's own corporate agent's experience would tell him. I really love the songs you played from your car Sir Diaz. At first they sounded quite different and... you exotic for my own senses but after a while I started to enjoy it. Aliathra confessed. Weird, senses say her heartbeat and breathing are normalizing, telling something in good faith as Sata would say. Diaz said to himself. Yeah, I saw you dancing quite nice, you were enjoying it. Diaz smiled, he could remember the sensual swaying of the elf's lithe body move in rhythm to the sounds of such classical electronic artists of over 200 years worth of musical history in Diaz's own private library. His demeanor was an accommodating demeanor he painted his face with to try to get the elf to loosen up to him. So, I recall you were some sort of priestess, right? Cleric of sorts? Shrine maiden? Vinny asked. I am devoted to the goddess of life, motherhood and fertility Nanith Aliathra answered. Diaz's monitors continued to say that the elf was speaking the full truth. Tell me more about your duties, he pressed her. The temple of Nanith housed some of the best apothecaries, physicians and clerics in the land. Especially the main temple in Earth Island where I studied. I was a student to many of the best healers in the land, Aliathra said. So you are what we would say, a medical student. A very hard but potentially prosperous path to take. Science exams aside, it must pay very well. Diaz gave out his own insight based on his own interpretations. Oh, we don't get much money. Nenith preaches self-sacrifice and thinking ahead of others. The temple relies mostly on donations for their livelihood. Aliathra answered. So, philanthropy. I mean people like you am I right must get a lot of money poured in still. Medicine. And or what we call pharmaceuticals aren't cheap you know despite all the talk of your charity and stuff. Which is why many clerics such as myself go to the Grey Order in Slaeja and offer our services so we can be able to go out into the world and get herbs, scrolls and other sorts of magical items for our temple. That still doesn't explain some of the more survivalist type of skills I see in you like animals, bow and arrow. You're quite an interesting bit of a ranger and cleric you know. Who taught you? Diaz asked. Well, 210 years of your life is plenty of time to know so many things. I was originally a scout ranger for the Earth Island Army. Trained with them for about 20 years but never really experienced any real combat outside of hunting some dangerous animals such as bears. Draculisks and the occasional hippogriff. After I served my anand, I wanted to pursue a more noble profession in the Grand Temple of Nenith, Aliathra said. Diaz's heartbeat monitor gave a slight anomaly on Aliathra's speech and heartbeat. She was saying a partial truth. So, what is your training like being a cleric for this Nenith? I was taught restoration magics almost up to the master classes. I was taught how a body works. How to identify ailments with the spell True Sight, close and disinfect wounds and cure even the most lethal of maladies such as Creosad's spite which I managed to cure on a few occasions recently. My teachers told me that I was one of their best students they have ever seen. Aliathra said. For this statement, it was spot on that she was speaking like an open book. Taking into the account that elves live long and must be something right? Diaz commented. Much more than that Sir Diaz. Aliathra smiled confidently with an air of superiority into it. She knew she was exceptional in her talents in restoration and it was shown when she had healed that young child back in Kesselheim earlier in record time. Normally without magics or immediate intensive care the injuries that child was inflicted would have been fatal by Gleesian standards. Okay one more question. Explain yourself. What brings you to Tyrian? You must be a long way from home, huh? Vinny changed the subject. I was going around the human realms looking for work when I heard rumors about a strange new people who arrived from the sky. Aliathra said. The monitors say that she is speaking another half-truth again. Normally for Diaz this would be the time for him to crack his knuckles and play a bit of bad cop with his quarry. But extraordinary circumstances say he must show restraint. Besides, 
He never tortured a girl before and he himself didn't know if he had the heart to do it. To Aliathra of all the snake-like women whom he has seen in his road days back in Kesselheim, the elf was more of a naive child rather than a backstabbing femme fatale he was so used to disposing with back home. So, after we touch down back in New Albany, where will you go? Diaz asked. Vercourt. It's a logging town in Slaeja west of Tyrian. Some of the priests there requested for my help in treating the woodsmen who get injured often. It's that time of the year when the trees get cut down. Aliathra answered. Well good luck helping them all. Beneath that nice face of yours. You got a kind heart, Diaz said as he gently lifted Aliathra's chin to have her look him in the eyes. They both smiled like friends turned into budding lovers. In the elf's point of view these earth humans as they insist to call themselves were firm in their force but fair to those whom they considered friend or trustworthy enough to win their trust beforehand. Despite his rather unnatural body parts and bindings, Aliathra couldn't help but reminiscent the various romantic novellas of dashing rogues. With their colourful personalities win the hearts of the fair maidens they pursue whilst pluckily striking down their antagonists who wish to see them harm. But alas, that was decades ago when Aliathra was much more free-spirited and naive to the cruel realities of the outside world from the safety of her opulent palace. This Vincent Diaz was an invader and her love of her people and her family as expected from the house left the family comes first above all else. She still must treat these youth, demon or not, they are a threat to the balance of all of Gleesia. Less a catastrophe unlike anyone has seen before strikes them to the very core whether they intend to or not to. Based on her own instincts, Aliathra sense it could. No would be the former. Will I get to see you return to New Albany someday? Our doors are always welcome to anyone with good intentions. Diaz asked. I might return for some of the food. Vercourt is about a few days trip from Tyrian. Vinny laughed at the primitive calculations of the elf. By the time Governor White is done with all the modernization efforts with Prince Clovich, you could travel without even walking. He laughed. Oh? What makes you say something so bold? Aliathra widened her eyes. Humans tend to look up and feel humbled by the sight of elves. Their prowess and knowledge stocks were of an unfathomable level compared to the average human and other races who live in Gleesia. Well, after we safely hand back Princess Aria and company to Prince Clovich back in the Citadel, there's gonna be a big party celebrating the first day of friendship between Gleesians and the United Federation. There will be food, fun and a big old declaration signing. Diaz said. A declaration signing? What will happen? Well. Governor White, the leader of our colony and Prince Clovich is going to sign this big piece of paper that details a whole bunch of stuff. A. Trading contracts, technology sharing, alliances, and a bunch more of formalities should happen in about five days after we get back to New Albany. Governor White needs to talk with the council on what to put on the paper. Diaz answered. The elf was taken aback by the cyborg's words. They all sounded quite imposing. She recalled in her past observations with the Tyrian royal family of their seduction to the youth's sphere of influences with their miraculous gadgets, unearthly strengths and their eldritch knowledge on the many mysteries of the universe. This was the sound of some sort of pact. Of alien nature, was the prince signing off his entire land to these otherworldly visitors? This would mean that the youth would have a strong foothold in Gleesia and could expand in any direction with impunity thanks to the might of their armors that the elf self concludes that no army in Gleesia could even hope to fight back against. Additionally, this Governor White sounds important, judging by how Diaz spoke highly, as best as he can speak highly of someone in a casual tone. Of this Governor White he is the leader of the New Albany settlement. Aliathra shudders at the thought as Diaz looked on with her change of demeanor. Is something wrong? Diaz asked her. I may want to have moment alone right now. It is about to be bedtime and we should arrive back in Gleesia around tomorrow. I need to get some rest for I leave for Vercourt immediately after. Aliathra excused herself. Oh sure. It is getting late too. 
It was fun sharing some music with you Miss Aliathra. I never got the chance to share company with such a beauty like you. Diaz waved farewell as the elf exited his car. When the coast was clear of her, Diaz picked up his smartphone from his jacket's pocket and pressed a button that displayed the black square symbol on its silver medal. He was recording every word of their entire conversation the moment it started. The nerds are gonna love to hear from this. Diaz coyly smiled at his cunning gesture. In his entire life as a corporate agent with his fair share of tales of corporate espionage and warfare, this Aliathra is a horrible liar. Dash a few days later in Vercourt, Dash, remember when I told you no matter where I go, I'll never leave your side. You will never be alone. Even when we go through changes, even when we're old, remember that I told you I'll find my way back home. Tildu Aliathra sang a tune to herself as she walked the sawdust and wood splinter covered dirt road of Vercourt. She had to admit, that song got stuck in her head and it didn't help to treat her earworm and Diaz and encouraged her to sing along with him when that song way back home came out of his car's music speakers. Maybe it was not that but the themes of the song. It was romantic yet somber at the same time. The lyrics of the singer's desires for home resonated with the elf's homesickness. The song reminded her of her current circumstances. She wanted to cry but she hid those tears lest she opens up to the alluring Diaz a moment of weakness. Half of her mind would scream that behind all the fancy sights, smells and taste, Vincent Diaz as that man in the red with roses painted jacket with the metal hands is a demon trying to stir her away from the path of righteousness. So far, she had guarded her soul against all the youth's advances but she didn't know if it will last the next time, she encounters the youth. Especially if it's from the likes of Witch of Diaz again. There was something about him that made Aliathra wanted more from. Was it the way he acted like the romantic rogues she and her sisters would read in the dark of such rebellious scretins who win the hearts of the fair maidens? Or was it the fact that he was the first man Aliathra ever met that never treated her like a piece of untouchable political symbolism of power that the Lethar household represents? The streets of Vercourt that day were at peak season for the harvest of lumber. Woodsmen and carpenters frantically ran past each other as their very city burst with intensive activity. During the late spring and midsummer months the trees near the town's forest grow exceptionally tall and strong. Additionally, the forest was also home to several small gaming animals and other wild but edible flora that make up several regional delicacies. She can see huntsmen and trappers from abroad mixing in with the locals, but such a spike in activity also directly heightens the chance of something going wrong, woodsmen getting crushed by falling trees, trappers getting bitten by their own traps, at least one accidental amputation and a whole lot more of maladies, the grey order office that the elf is going to pass on her invaluable intel with is also right next to Vercourt's local temple of Nenith which contains a hospice designed to cater to the needs of the locals and associated problems that occur in the town's chosen industry. The hospice was maintained by a mix of donations and funding from the next door Grey Order office. It was constructed by philanthropizing adventurers who pooled their earnings to help build the healing temple after several adventures clearing bandits and escort quests in the area. They wanted both a place that the Grey Order adventurers and the people of Vercourt could have a place of respite and sanctuary from the harsh realities of the outside world, a classic case of social entrepreneurship in action. Aliathra admired the charitable origins of the temple dedicated to her goddess as she opened the door to the guild building. Aliathra, you look like you had better luck than we did. A weary Carlia greeted her by the door. The sorcerer's serene face was tainted with sweat, wear and a few wrinkles of stress plastered over her skin. The elf could sense that the sorceress had just recently underwent a harrowing trial of her abilities. Her solemn eyes also indicate that it was very heart-wrenching experience too. What happened to you? Aliathra asked. Remember in those letters we all send each other back with. We mentioned that we will be sent to an expedition to an old tunnel that used to go under the mountains bordering Tyrian. Carlyle explained, 
You said you will bring about a few hundred or so men am I correct? Aliathra nodded receptively. This is all that is left of us. Carlyle stepped aside to reveal only a few several dozens of heavily injured soldiers, adventurers and camp followers laying miserable on their woolen cots. Several had bandages tainted with their crimson blood or a purplish darkness that cemented their weakening state. The elf heard the humans' harrowing moans and cringed gnashing of teeth as they were attended or for lack of a better word for attended by an overwhelmed staff of clerics and healers frantically trying to save as much of them as they can. Unfortunately, the oncoming demands of Vercourt's peak business season would surely dry out the hospice's resources quickly without any intervention. You, elf girl, is that a necklace of Our Lady I see? A cleric of Neneth pointed to Aliathra's necklace. I know, I shall assist. Aliathra cut down the formalities and promptly went to work. The elf was quickly assigned to several patients relieving the previously overwhelmed healer to draw his attention elsewhere. Conjuring a bright golden glow from her hands, Aliathra channeled the restorative energies within herself and got to work. She applied the positive healing magics on the wounds of the injured gently caressing their bodies before the energies disinfected the breach before closing them. To the miracle surprise of everyone in the room, Aliathra healed those who she lay her hands on at thrice the rate her human counterparts could manage to patch their share of the injured on their own. To those in the hospice, it was like Neneth herself descended from heaven and shared her overwhelming generosity of mercy upon her children. As she healed the sick and wounded she began to see some sort of familiar pattern. The wounds she had closed up each excreted a strange foreign metal object before the completion of their sealing. Upon an average of two bullets per wound it had these foreign objects that were inside their bodies before Aliathra laid her hands on them. She knew from experience that these wounds were a smaller form of puncture wounds based upon the deep holes and epidermal ruptures she had managed to mend back together. Most of said puncture wounds she had encountered were from arrows, spears, stabbings or any thrust and force being shanked down upon the afflicted, but these were much smaller yet so much more deeper than what she had experienced back in her homeland. She collected these strange foreign objects into a table for a closer observation. They looked like malformed shells made from a slightly luminescent metal when she placed the trinkets upon light. Some were crushed to a flattened state while the others were formed into a star-like shape. Then she began to smell said objects and a familiar scent entered her delicate yet sensitive nose. I know these, Aliathra muttered. Know what? The voice of Petra approached behind her. Turning around, Aliathra saw that the magically gifted knight was shirtless exposing his well-toned body to the young, by elven standards, maiden. Yet his form was polluted with bandages and signs of heavy bruising on his breasts and abdomen with a violet hue tainting his white pinkish skin. I know what are these things that everyone here was struck by. Go on. Petra leaned closer to the elf eager to hear her. They are called bullets. Small metallic objects, sort of like arrows but very small used for the outsider's weapons. Aliathra answered, How do you know of these elf? You are not an occultist when I read your papers. Petra curled his eyebrow upwards. Because I managed to get inside their camp. Home. Or fortress. I dot never understand what exactly are they calling New Albany. Colony if memory serves me right. Aliathra thought back to her previous excursion. Colony. Petra's eyes widened in horror. I managed to get close to them. I saw many things you wouldn't believe. Aliathra continued. Let me write this down. Carlia butted in. She grabbed a notebook and quill pen that she keeps in her pocket. Aliathra with as much clarity as possible detailed everything that happened to her from the moment she was whisked away by the demons to their strange realm of metal trees called Kersaheim and met up with such larger-than-life characters such as Donna Paro, Lieutenant Samantha and Sir Vincent who displayed such power the likes of which not even an elf, despite their advanced civilization could fathom. She described as best as she could such concepts such as guns mega corporations and pizza to her slay each and colleagues much to their astonishment. That's astounding. This is all incredible wait until Mita sees all of this. Carlia said as she closed her notebook. I already did. Mita's voice echoed in the hall. 
The crow emerged from the dark shadows under the group much to the surprise of everyone. Even the grizzled find Ramon's soul jumped away from its vessel by the surprise of the crow. Mita carried with her on her hand a scrolled paper with faint traces of a weak adhesive on its back as if she just tore whatever information she had acquired it from. By the gods damn you Mita, that's the, I can't remember, nth time you jumped on us, learn some respect. Carlia scolded. Yarg, that's right even you gave this old dud in a scare. Findrim frowned. Oh, you can be such fun scaring. Mita playfully giggled. Where were you? Aliathra asked her. While Aliathra was busy with those other worlders I found something interesting. Mita said as she unfurled the piece of parchment. It was poster. The likes of which found in a tavern's corner or a grey order's notice board. It presented two banners standing equally to each other in distance height whilst crossing over to form a X mark union of flags. In Slay Asian culture, this was a diplomatic gesture between nations during important summits to signify goodwill and respect amongst the various and diverse cultures, peoples and other forms of political clout within Yusenagrad as the elf could remember. The first flag was obviously the kite shield shaped with a windmill insignia on a checkered background of red and green, the heraldry of Tyrian. The other one was a barely recognizable flag however, a crude parody of the United Federation of Earth. It had a sky blue background with a giant orb of poorly squiggled lines to signify intricacies followed by white dots that seemed to be painted in randomly. According to Samantha, the youth insignia was meant to represent Earth and clearly, whoever the artist was in hand painting these posters did a horrendous recreation of the flag. Artist renditions aside, it was the details below the crossovered flags that was eye-catching. Declaration of Tyrian and Terran Friendship Day in the Citadel. Food, festivities and foreign curiosities to be shown from the strange world of Earth. Witness flying boats steel horses and other exotic gizmos on 20th day of awoken sun. Calendars were named differently among cultures, for the men of Zanigrad, they base their 13th month long calendars on the rising and fall of the day and night, the first half of the month is the night months where autumn and fall happen since the humans mark the beginning of the years with the harvest season. Spring and summer are the day months where the sun is almost always shining throughout the day. For the elves, months had a predetermined name based on the elven pantheon and mythology with the suffix of newer which is a shortened version of the elven word for month. What day is it now? Aliathra asked. Seventeenth day of the awoken sun. Mita answered. Only three days away? Carlia's eyes widened, her heart skipped a beat on the news. Indeed, it seems that the Tyrians are going to fully give in to their new friends, Mita said with some snark on her tone. They are going to turn it to a place like Thiers. Aliathra muttered. What did you say? Petya turned back to her. I have seen their cities. Giant towers of metal and glass piercing the sky with an air of defiance as if they mock heaven itself. Steel beasts will roam the soil belching hot breath from their anuses as they devour the land in an air of choking smoke. The skies will light up in parodied rainbows in reverence to them. And the people of Tyrian will bow before them. Aliathra gave a grim description of what she had seen in Kesselheim. She can still remember the sensational overload of her delicate elven tastes and touch she saw from the exhaust smokes, the neon lights and skyscrapers from that planet. To see Gleesia fall into such a radical ecological change will be world-shaking. She barely survived an entire week inside Kesselheim and she doubts any of the other peoples of Gleesia could stand being in such a viral influence that only seeks to expand until there is no room left. Such magnitudes at such a cost will only mean death for them all if not stop. Aliathra shed a mournful tear and a soft heartfelt prayer to Nenith for salvation in such slowly darkening times. First it will be Tyrian, tomorrow. The world. Kalaya realized. We need to take down these vile demons. Ah. Petya stood up bravely but his still injured body weighed him down. Not while you are that I concur. Aliathra reprimanded. And not the same way back in Cambervale. A direct assault was foolish just look at what happened to everyone here. Mita spread her arms around to display the sorry state the survivors of the expedition were in. But once the demons gain an inch of souls. 
they will take a mile. Findrum gulped nervously, uncharacteristic for him but given the current circumstances, he feels out of his league. Is there any way we can defeat them? Petra anguished at the stacked antagonism of such a prospect of a second demon invasion. I think I do. Carlyle proposed, most demons or the ones we read in the textbooks I read, have a kind of leader among them that acts as uniting figure among them and also the strongest among the host. This alpha demon would of his accompanying followers and would be the entity that any mortal who summoned them would be the one they would talk to the most. Alpha demons would be responsible for all the deals, lying and all sorts of magics as foretold in the legends. The sorceress relayed her history. So, after we take out this alpha what will happen to the rest of the outsiders? Findrim asked. They will flee back to whence they came. Aliathra said. No leader, means no direction. Most demons are just inaudible monsters with unsatiated appetites for souls. Carlyle said. Aliathra would disagree with that but she kept silent. She still can't take much chances with these other worlders. Then again. These descriptions of the Alpha Demon did implicate a certain named individual that was casually mentioned to her during her travels. But there's an entire army of them between us and whoever is this Alpha Demon, how could we fight them all? Petra questioned. White. Aliathra said his name. The color? Meta asked. No, that is his name. White. Jeremy the White Governor, Aliathra said. The demons, I heard them in their whispers. They call their leader Governor White. He controls the armies, the machines and the buildings being erected based on my discoveries, Aliathra said, that's an unusual name for a demon. Petra was dumbstruck by such an average sounding name, perhaps this is just an alias, a false name that demons give to their quarry a false sense of normalcy. Jeremy is a name that you can find a man with that name without too much difficulty if you just look hard enough, Carlyle said. He will be there in person to sign a decree of friendship between him and Prince Klovich, Aliathra said. A demonic pact you mean? Carlyle said. Where do you know all of this? Aliathra asked the sorceress. I had some colleagues from the militant wing of the Sacred Circle. Witch hunters to be clear. We shared some moments together. I know some faint basics of demonology. You. Aliathra are by far our greatest source of information on these other worlders. I can send a letter to them immediately to them so they can question you further about what happened to you. A soul who got in and out of demon lands and lived with their heart still pure and mind still sane. Carlyle turned. That still doesn't address the demonic pact Prince Klovich is going to make with the demons. We can't call in more soldiers lest we risk the citizens to panic. We can't attempt another attack right now since most of us here can barely walk or hold a sword. Petra argued. Perhaps we have to use not force this time, but cunning, Mita suggested. This may be our last chance in expelling the demons. This gathering of sorts, Friendship Day as this calls it will be quite an auspicious event and I am no stranger of blending into these types of occasions, Mita said. Can you get close enough? Petra asked her. I wouldn't be the crow otherwise, she winked. I can gather some more of my initiates into this and we will see what are our options are when we get there, she said. Get in and take out the alpha demon. I see. Petra affirmed. What about Prince Klovich? Aliathra asked. If he is still the rock of Vescent then he might at best be under the demon spell. But if worse comes to worst, he must die too. Carlyle said. Then I have no moment to lose. The party is only three day away and it takes one day to get from here to Tyrian. I will make sure the demons scatter. Meter with determination bowed. And if you fail? Carlyle asked nervously. Then tell the Emperor that we tried. And we went down fighting. Petra said. He knew in the worst case scenario. The Empire would have strategic war plans for a sudden breakthrough of invaders in their southeastern borders but it addressed the nomadic hawks or the southern suzerainties not otherworldly demons from another dimension. The news of such an event would ripple all over Gleesia, civil unrest, economic downturn and all sorts of problems that the knight can't fathom ever experiencing will happen. He cursed his own cocky temperaments from earlier for his incapacitated state. All of the Empire's hope for a quiet prevention of a worldwide crisis is going up in smoke. 
Gods be with you Carlyle. He reluctantly wished her well. I make my own miracles, Meter replied before she disappeared out of the hospice door. Alia threw respirated with anxiousness. She felt her heart beat the same in such a very real possibility of a demonic invasion in Gleesia. It took a combined army of all Gleesia's races to be able to fight back the first one but in her eyes, she saw the youth Goliath as a titan with unmatchable strength. To any gods that hear her silent prayers, she asked for one thing. Answers in such uncertain times. Deep down in her heart she has doubts over existence and her own purpose in life. Being the last in line in the throne she would have been just a mere pawn in the great political game but she secretly wanted to defy from the moment she understands what it all means to her as a princess and as a powerful cleric. She reflected back to Diaz, a man so free from such cares, if he was only human or another elf she would fall in his arms in a heartbeat. She then remembered the caring smile of L.T. Rose or Samantha as she would prefer to be called to from her. Her understanding and emphatic nature, her aura was like one who listens and understands those around her, a skill that not many people could easily boast into having a way with. And lastly, she reflected on her family back home. Surely, they know miss her and are worried sick for her. Despite being the youngest she is one of her nation's greatest treasures, a byproduct of elven eugenics to create the most powerful magic user possible with the combined bloodlines of Alphalnora's most magically gifted families. She retired in a private room inside the hospice to meditate and pray for a sign from anything of the answers she seeks. What will become of Gleesia when the Terrans inevitably come out of Tyrian? Chapter 22, Back in Action Anne this chapter's plot, S are brought to you by the EODEM community and Space Battles forums through a specially made survey. If you are one of my Reddit or Wattpad fans PLS join Space Battles forums, I am more interactive and alive there. The Manila, the naval logistics ship escorting the Terrian delegation to Kessaheim landed back in the New Albany Star Dock at 5.56 a.m. A red carpet welcoming map was set up where the docking bay was meant to unbinge her and Pops. Awaiting them was Governor White and Prince Clovich as they restlessly await the landing procedures of the ship before the passengers disembarked. The Prince was anxious of comparative stress to his normal day-to-day -day duties of administering his lands. Did the miraculous procedure he agreed to have his dear sister undergo through work? Will she run to him to the embrace of his arms? Will they finally have to ditch the carrying cloth that his servants have to painstakingly carry on over when she had to move away from the safety of her chambers? Feeling nervous? Governor White asked. I just... I'm not so sure. Ever since I took over Terrian about six years ago and I'm still trying to understand what my father had left behind. Clovich confessed. How was your father and also your mother? I never heard you talk much about them. My mother died of sadness when she gave birth to third child after Arya. My father was no longer the same afterwards. Clovich explained, there's a third Tyrian child? How come I never met him? The governor's eyes widened. It was malformed, too tiny, pink colored. She passed away a week later. Clovich said, I am so sorry. White apologized. A new dimension to Clovich's character opened up in the governor's mental journal. He studied meticulously all the natives of Tyrian, knowing their curriculum vitae is like the type of educational background of primitive construction, their jobs which were precursors to more modern jobs that the youth take for granted. Alchemist equals chemist, innkeeper equals hotelier, merchant equals businessman and city guard equals policeman, and their psychological aspects, fears, aspirations, worries, memories and desires. Having here Clovich suffer through what the medical term from Dr. Lee Hainanel being preterm birth was heart-trenching, the type that pierces the soul and the soul's soul to put it into picture in his head. Technology back in the youth core worlds would have easily addressed that unfortunate turn of events. It was a shame they should have been in this planet sooner. These people, despite their access to this so-called magic still had primitive understanding of the nature, science and physics. I will see to it you and nobody else have to suffer like that ever again. Jeremy whispered, how can I be sure that you can keep giving me and my people these miracles? The prince asked, 
We have been there before, he briefly answered him sternly. The ramp felt down, slightly off the alignment of the plush red carpet by a few inches to the right, or maybe left. Out comes outstride a group who marched down the ramp with an eagerness of a sailor wishing to meet his legs with solid land once again. Surrounded by them was none other than Klovich's dear sister Raria herself alongside her entourage. What he noticed about her now is that she is now standing upright but was being aided by two crutches tucked below her shoulders. Her newly strengthened feet acted out as a support for her as she trotted down the ramp with some aid from her accompanying handmaidens. Brother Arya exclaimed as she painstakingly pushed herself to him. It wasn't what he exactly had in mind when he saw her again but his legs instinctively moved forward as he rushed to hug his sister Arya. I am so happy you returned safe. Did it go well? The necklace? How was Kessa? He began to unleash a flurry of questions at his young sister who promptly hugged him back, letting go of her crutches. Unlike before she would have to be hugged from the bed or through a chair but it was a whole new sensation to embrace her shoulder to shoulder. I am well brother, the earth humans have been nothing but kind to me during my excursion. And here, Arya answered ecstatically as she showed him the same personal memento that her brother gave to her before her departure. The prince could only sigh in relief as he embraced Arya deeper. Wait, you're not exactly perfectly running to my arms however. I thought they cured you of your ailments? Klovich asked. She is still getting used to her new legs. Not being able to walk for that long until now can do that to you. Samantha explained as she picked up the fallen crutches and passed the twin walking implements to Arya. I prepared a lavish feast for your return dear sister. Governor White is invited, you and I have so many things to discuss. Klovich said as he and his bodyguards merged with Arya's entourage as they made their way to their coaches that will take them back to their castle. I will catch up with you in a minute, Lieutenant, you have moment? Governor White turned to Samantha, at the ready. Samantha naturally stood in attention her arms and hands behind her eager to her next orders. You remember the Adventurers Guild? The governor said, I do. Samantha nodded, well we began the outreach initiative while you were away. We are going to take some of their requests all free of charge to gain some goodwill from the locals. The governor said, that explains the captured wildlife we've seen on base. Guess the time has come to become a bunch of D&D heroes now? Samantha asked. A slight chuckle escaped her mouth at the prospect. Yeah, pretty much. Saluna Amirian and Captain Mendoza will be there to put you into the details. And silly as this sounds for you boots, this is the only way we can get along with these folks. So I expect you maintain your professionalism on your... EM. Quest. White smiled showing a bit of his upper teeth, in his and even some of the soldiers' perspectives, who have earlier been sent out on such missions were shown to have the excitement of going into and rebounds per game for ARs, but he is concerned that the soldiers might be more lax than usual. They are all in a possibly hostile new world after all. He quietly left stride a group as he ran back to Prince Klovich to attend the banquet. So, we are going on a quest? Crocker laughed as he asked. It sounds damn like it. Does that make me the ranger if we are going by Dungeons and Dragons talk? I honestly never played that game before. Abidar commented. I got the gadgets and that makes me an artificer and Iris the major warlock. I played some real games and digital games before. Ken said. Artificer is a homebrew class, not an official one. I am the rogue then. And Aliathra can be the killer. Oh wait I forgot she left for that logging town. Diaz said as he realized that the elf is now missing by his side. What is this Dundee you speak of? Some sort of children's game? You all seem to snicker like them when you say it. Iris added. Me and Kane can explain on the way to the guild office. So Iris, and D means Dungeons and Dragons we are supposed to gather up on a table, make a character and roll some dice to determine. Samantha huddled up with Iris alongside Ken as they walked back to their tactical all-terrain car. Dash, an hour later at the Grey Order Guild office building of Tyrion Dash, 
To say the humble two-story establishment was abuzz with activity is an understatement to say the least according to Flynn the Terry Ann Branches Guild manager. He had never seen in his entire career seen so many intrepid-looking adventurers or more as the foreign soldiers insist on their duty of volunteered peacekeeping gathered inside the humble establishment. An officer stood commandingly on top of a box declaring out loud to the youth soldiers the details of the job requests on the board. All of that language barrier breakthroughs were all in part thanks to the linguistic shortcut that Iris Kudahagan had provided to the youth. A group of officers, soldiers and NCOs gained literacy in the local language of the Stla Aegean Empire called Diaesian, named after the peninsula where the empire's capital of Herring Point is. During initial studies of the language, linguistic experts from many of the youth's top universities discovered several phonetic similarities between IES and the little-known Romance language of Occitan. Back to the quests, normally in Flynn's decades-old experience, the Grey Order Guild members would be very nitpicky about the promised rewards and who they are working for. There was a heavy bias for more high-paying jobs from more financially well-off individuals like a caravan escort of a merchant's wares or a bounty hunt for a notorious brigand by a local lord. This leaves more boring and low-risk quests left hanging like for example defending a farm from pests signing up for some manual labor in infrastructural development or going down to vermin-infested areas and perform some extermination of their nests, all of whom paid majorly by the peasantry with a handful of copper coins which is the lowest valued currency below silver, gold and a translucent precious metal called scintillite minted ingots of distinctive shapes and presses that each denomination equal a certain amount of ducats, one copper equals one ducat, one gold equals 100 ducats, one scintillite equals 500 ducats, and that was a best case scenario. Worst case would be a basket of moldy food and mild ale, essentially a free lunch from the new Albany administration and their military attaches. From a grand strategic point of view, this leaves development to grind in a to a painfully slow pace. Famines logistical derailments and other economic drawbacks festered while the heroes fight the large beasts for their valuable materials from their corpses or help the wealthy secure ventures which was threatened by the socio-economic upheaval of the aforementioned neglect of the functional matters of running a healthy state. The actual complaint to the worker is the insecurity of his existence. He is unsure if he will always have work. He is unsure if he will always be healthy and he can predict that he will reach old age and be unable to work, if he falls into poverty, and be that only through prolonged illness, he will find himself totally helpless being on his own, and society currently does not accept any responsibility towards him beyond the usual provisions for the poor, even if he has been working all the time ever so diligently and faithfully. The ordinary provisions for the poor, however, leaves a lot to be desired. Colonel Polonsky implored Governor White to have Prince Klovich explain this injustice when the time is right to bring up such a topic since the priority in the meantime was to gain the local prince's trust and friendship. In the meantime in terms of gaining someone's trust and friendship, with unanimous approval from the military top brass, even from the likes of the hardlining Major Holyfield, that the most righteous thing to do right now was to delegate a significant population of their soldiers to walk up to Tyrion's Adventurers Guild building and start working all of the available quests for free until more permanent solutions of most of the principality's woes can be put into stone. This audacious and revolutionizing, at least for the first time to happen in Gleesia in its entire history of political shifts, initiative was called Operation of Emeria meaning prosperity in Greek. The aim of the initiative is to restore a sense of order and a sense of pride amongst the medieval and backwards thinking people of Tyrian of a better tomorrow through phases of social programs such as the aforementioned free quest jobs. Free medical clinics conducted by Dr. Lee Hainanul and a team of doctors and paramedics for the first phase of the initiative, the next phase which requires cooperation and political connections with the people of Tyrian to conduct engineering projects to turn the principality into a modern state with instructional workshops on how to create an effective government. 
educational programs to introduce the concept of education for all to the medieval age people and then finally a huge engineering effort of modern day infrastructure like roads, irrigation and finally electricity which will make Tyrian with pun intended, the bright new star in Gleesia, with the aid of their divine, as from the perspective of the natives, equipment like guns, night vision goggles and everyday store-bought rat poison that you can grab off of a shelf in a convenience store, they were able to quickly and easily resolve many of Tyrion's quests, low level to high and much to a grateful populace of both peasantry and nobility all of which at the cost of goodwill and friendship, my family is starving, we would pay any price for someone to protect my farm from the monsters and raiders, a peasant told Captain Mendoza, the farmer held a sack of his impoverished family's savings insisting that the youth captain take it. You need this more than I do sir. Mendoza politely rejected the monetary reward. He and his squad had to protect a peasant's farm during the week before a big harvest of his crops. During the harvest season, it was a golden time of opportunity for unscrupulous individuals and pestilent beasts looking for an easy meal to rush into defenseless farms and ruin their crops. This particular case as Mendoza noted was a desperate cry for help, the family of the peasant was consisting of the father, his wife and a young daughter who look no older than just above 15 years of age. If their harvest would have failed then they would have been forced to either sell of their land, forced into crime or have the females resort to selling their bodies to sleazy men looking for a one night stand. But thanks to Captain Mendoza and his squad, they can rest easy this year, he and countless more youth soldiers have been vigilantly protecting the farmlands of Tyrian from those who wish to bring the peasants means of livelihood to harm. So far, they have covered about 78% of all the farms in Tyrian yet their quotas for their jobs is the unanimous 100% coverage of the entire principality during harvest season. We will never forget your kindness. The peasant farmer bowed as he pocketed his money and walked away happily. Just the sight of a peasant feeling for the first time in his despondent life that he was feeling protected valued and empowered by these sky people made many to believe that the youth are angels sent from heaven to be with them was a very moving and sprightly motivation for the youth soldiers in the guild to aim for 100% pacification. Plus, it felt good to do some humanitarian work, even though some of the cases they have encountered several beast folks like fox people, horned humanoid people and sometimes orc nomads too. Hey Lieutenant Rose. Good to see you again. How was Kessaheim? Mendoza waved to Samantha as she and the rest of Strider group entered the guild house. It went well. The princess is going to walk again much to her brother's delight to say it straight. Samantha nodded. So, patch me in with the situation captain. Yes of course. Well my squad plus a few dozen more are right now protecting some farmlands for the season and we are about to wrap it all up. Some hazmats and CRBN have been fumigating the sewers and shitholes lately of all the nasty stuff which leaves this odd one out for you and Strider to take on. Mendoza explained. The captain pulled grabbed a manila envelope from his back and passed it along to the lieutenant who promptly opened it. This looks really out of place. It's a letter from a company from the Youth Core Worlds. Samantha commented. The paper was an official looking and business like letter that was requesting for an escort service of a large employment agency called Integral Hands. The company looks into recruiting talented people and place them in jobs where their potentials can be utilized. Curiously, this company wants to see what kind of special talents can the people of Gleesia can do. Hey, I know those guys, they are a Ah, uh, ancillary company in line with Aparo. Diaz said. Oh, you do? Who do they recruit? Clay asked. Well it's quite dynamic to say the least based of my personal experience in my dealings with them. Integral hands have clients in the entertainment business, private military contractors and modeling and even culinary arts to name a few. The guy probably someone that my old dear friend Bobby must have brought in through his connections. Diaz answered. PMC seems pretty out of place Vinny for a company who mainly looks for dancers. The next myth's July and a cook for some fancy schmancy Michelin star joint. Crocker commented. Look. 
Do you guys wanna see a big titty fox girl in the cover of Playboy or not? Diaz asked with emphasis. Yes, majority of the youth soldiers inside the guild house including Crocker, Abidia and Clay yelled in unison. Samantha and Mendoza facepamed, hiding their reddening face at the circumstances that could entail whilst Ken was taken agape by Diaz's words, frozen for a moment before bursting out to laughing. That's... That's I can't even. Ken laughed. I actually find that one funny. Samantha giggled the laughter infecting her. Being a moderate geek herself, the prospect of such a fine would be groundbreaking. So, let's find ourselves a big titty fox girl for all nerds back home or die trying. Diaz added, and also, the next big hit, some exotic mercenaries and a baker. A very flashy man in flamboyant Tyrian purple suit walked in front of Strider group with an eager smile and excited demeanor. His accompanying jewelry of reflective golden rings, chains and plated sunglasses breathed socio-hierarchical elitism compared to the fatigued draped soldiers, the leather and cloth combo of Flynn the Guildmaster and the amalgamation of modern designer wear and medieval lady clothing of Iris. Marco Miria talent scout extraordinaire. I believe you are my escorts this fine day? The integral hands representative initiated his hand forward to shake Samantha's. All eyes redirected to the corporate man in his outlandish clothes. Out of place he may be and visually looking like someone who would run a red light district establishment. Mr. Miria had a briefcase with Integral Hands Company logo on it alongside his smartphone and a pocket-sized notebook with a pen tucked inside the binding while the entire stationary item was tucked on his suit's breast pocket. So, we are going to escort you? Samantha asked. Well, since everyone is guarding farms lately, this dump has been so much lacking in any capable hands. And who is this? Marco said as the side stepped to Iris being face to face with him. Marco formed an L-shaped gesture on the vampire witch, observing every pore and flesh of skin that Iris had. You know my dear, I can pull some strings with Playboy to extend their glee easier special to add in more women such as your, Marco said. Hey, back off from Iris. Ken interjected. He didn't know if it was defensiveness or just the invasive method of, wait, the Iris? Miss Kadahagan, that woman who helped you understand IEs? My apologies. I thought you were just some random guide. Marco apologized, but I do say, you are indeed attractive my dear. If you do ever decide to pose for Playboyler, let's just get on with it. So, Mr. Miria, do you have any leads on any possible people here in Tyrian you would like to see? Ken said. Oh yes. I went to this dwarf proprietor named Luna Amirian and he pointed to some promising candidates. Miria answered as he pulled out his notebook. Dash. A loud explosion burst out of Kessie's conical hat as the plumes of white duck feathers transformed into a small fortune of gold ducats to the uproar of the crowd. She then placed the coins down on the table and she smiled as she took of the handkerchief from behind her neck. Several of the men snickered and wooed at her when she removed the neckcloth revealing her cleavage in which she let out a sultry smile. She unfurled the cloth and covered the coin-filled table blocking the view of the shiny coins from the crowd that had all gathered outside the city gates of Tyrian. All eyes were on her as she performed the tricks. It was a trick any self-aware illusionist with a punch on of fooling the eyes of all those who see her tricks and use such talents to earn a living through entertaining crowds of onlookers. Yet what makes Cassie and the rest of the cast Tarnic siblings traveling troop are that they are Visigths. Her people are horned humanoids of fawn-like stature of normally 5 feet 2 inches to 5 feet 8 inches feet in height with a pair of cloven legs per feet in their bony and pushed back deformity. Their people about less than a century ago, just known as the Goths were from the eastern deserts at the farthest reaches of the continent that were conquered by the Dur, Black Tree Pact, Elves. Those who stayed and were put under the yoke of the Elves were known as the Ostra, East. Gths whilst the ones who fled away were known as the Visigths. All Gths had horns of various shapes and sizes, some curved back or pointing up to the sky like spears held up. Their skin tone however was much more aesthetically diverse, red as lava skin which Kessie had, pallid yellow to almost white like complexion, 
pitch black as night and orange like the setting sun. Her companions that make up the cast Arnix were as followed, the twins Karen Ra and Kal Lea who were both exceptional musicians and dancers, Duma a reputable marksman with his bow who would often ask the twins to be subjects of many dangerous shooting feats much to the twins mixed emotional reactions, Idiot or as known by the entire company to be called Ednan is the jester and the show's comic relief. In addition to being Cassie's assistant when he is not making a fool out of himself for the show. Finally, there is Ashes, a female gth of well-built physical prowess as achievable to a gth female can be with if one can look closely from her bare midriff, ridges that form the outline of her toned abdomen. She got her name due to her grey skin and her tendencies to use fire when it comes to her strong woman stunts like lifting weights, gymnast wires and even weapon swallowing. Another fact that only a few people knew about the troupe is that they aren't siblings in the traditional sense. They were all adopted by an impoverished circus animal tamer named Castanic hence the name. He was long dead of about five years prior to that day when Strider Group and Mr. Miria quietly moved inside the gathered crowd. Castanic mentored all six of the Gths whom he adopted as his own children in their respective occupations, after he died. The siblings in respect to their mentor and father kept his name on their wagon train whenever they travel around between the Slaeetan Empire and its puppet states to the eastern desert sultanates. If that old gth was in heaven now he would be proud of his children if not for the fact that Visigths are a discriminated group in Gleesia. Gths were known to be entertainers but are also stereotypical very free-spirited and anarchic individuals. Many of them are perceived to be promiscuous, irresponsive to established authority, general alignments to chaotic virtues and worst of all very slight with their hands. It is often blamed on traveling gths of any spike of pickpocketing or robbery due to their innate nimbleness and the Castanic siblings traveling troop were guilty of it. Occasionally, the females of the troop would discreetly perform escort services to rich clients by their testimonies and their customers. They had an exotic appeal with their skin and tails. For Ebnon, he was also a known filcher and pickpocket who would often steal valuables and occasionally food from merchants to share with his siblings. They have been often chased out of town with a persona non grata to boot by enraged wives and angry merchants. Tyrian however was their favorite spot due to the less likely chance of them being victims of racially motivated hate crimes and so and so. The new sky people often call the Gths Taiflings due to their similarities but Kessie hated the fact that the Taif part in Taifling sounded like the word thief. And what is this? Kessie said as she lifted the veiled table. She gestured her hand upwards with a sultry flare with her feminine hands in presentation. The coins were transformed to a crudely stitched yet barely presentable stuffed doll. The crowd especially the children who so happened to be there clapped their hands. It wasn't no builder bear or a feisty pet. It was more of something handmade by an amateur toy maker. The Visig illusionist picked up the doll and walked towards a crowd of children and gave it to one of the urchins who was delighted with her new toy as she hugged it and cherished it. And now for the twins and their spectacular bitten rocket dance. She gave way to her sisters as she exits the stage from her left. The twins Karen Ra and Kal Lea ran eagerly into the stage with Karen holding a red tambourine whilst Kal Lea wielded a sky blue see-through veil large enough to cover her body from head to waist. Whilst Karen Ra's dance was passionate and fiery with intense twists and sudden turning, Kal Lea was elegant and soothing with a slight tease. Their dance's contrast is the basis of their signature button rookid which caught the gaze of all of their audience. Except Mr. Miria whose eyes were locked into Kessie. He knew from Luya Amirian's information that Kessie is by default of being the eldest by one year to be the unofficial boss of the troupe. We need to meet the magician there. Miria whispered to Samantha, in professional courtesy. Samantha nodded and gestured her squad to follow their mark through the standing crowd. Bloody hell and it was about to get fun. Croc gnashed his teeth, he really wanted to see those two Taiflings dance. The Earth humans moved their way to the backstage of the traveling troupe where the siblings rested in between their performances. The Gths easily spotted the youth humans and they stopped their rest and relaxation time and stood up, their hairs raised and bodies sweating from their brows. Yule.
you're one of the sky people, Kessie muttered nervously. She had heard the saying about these strange foreigners, how they came from cities made from the lightest of steel and their staffs of thunder that brought down even the mightiest of foes. To say she and her siblings were terrified was an understatement. Tamad Mikhore Ashes, easily the most physically imposing of the troop told her siblings as they retreated behind her. The Gth bared her teeth threateningly as if in their eyes the youth were like the same people that tried to drive the family apart. Relax, we are not here harm you, we, or me I just want to talk, Mr. Miri initiated. About what? Leaving? Ashes asked. Oh no. Actually I am here to give you some good news for once. Miria smiled as he opened his briefcase and pulled out several documents. Upon examination from Miria's right side, Lieutenant Rose saw that they were brochures for the old school circus theatre company Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey's, and Yishu Circus. She recalled that they had been recently revived thanks to an eccentric Chinese billionaire who ran real estate and integrated resorts who has been recently investing in reviving classical bread and circuses from trapses, strongmen, animals and more. She concluded that these tieflings were going to make a huge draw for the third incarnation of what was once the greatest show on earth with the first alien act. The Chinese were always splurge on the exotics. You got talent like nothing ever we have seen before and the fact that you look very beautiful and handsome got my boss Yishu to say that's who I want on my circus. Miria said as he passed the brochure to Kessie. You can get all that you need and want if you work for them. Food, shelter and best of all. Ahem. Security. You don't have to worry about being chased away from angry people and all and look at this magazine photo. Imagine you on that cover for all the A's to marvel at you. Miria charismatically appealed to their desires and Maslow's needs. He passed to her in a contract that was conveniently written in IE's detailing what the troop are obligated to do and will receive in return. The contract was good for five years with a monthly payroll of a noble's ransom with housing and food taken care of. All the contract asked was to go through some training to further own their individual skills all paid by the circus company before they are let loose to perform throughout all of youth space for an interplanetary tour of all the core and frontier worlds. How can we trust you? Cassie asked. Miriam told me all about you. And your performance. Earlier was truly and I mean truly magical. Besides, look at all of you four. You're actually attractive by our standards. Outside there. Hooves of course. Miriam commented. Sister. Who is this? Karen Ra, sweating down from her dancing garment returned backstage with her twin Cal Lea, who was equally sweating and was carrying with her meager and revealing garments. A small collection of coins that were thrown upon their feet of the completion of their performance. Hamiship officially, Kessie said in her native tongue. Nyashirim, she exclaimed cheerfully followed by the joyous jubilee that her siblings shouted to heavens as if they yelled for salvation and their prayers were answered. I take that as yes. Miria smiled with a sense of accomplishment. Dash. Man. It smells horrible. Samantha gagged at the awful smell of the horse dung and hay bales that permeates the Citadel's public stables. And you are used to these smells? Miria said as he covered his sensitive nose with his handkerchief. His nasal sense is more used to the refined sense of perfume and hygienic floors of the core worlds. Hey, just make sure you don't all step on them horse shit while we are here. Actually can I ask again? Why are we here? Abidaya asked. Looking for horse riders. Got a request from some security agency from some far off frontier moon asking for some mounted security guards. Heard this place is crawling with mercs who come with horses. Blay. Miria answered a disgusted spit from his mouth followed suit. He was starting to get irritated with the smell. Oh, heard it becoming like a... A renaissance in the frontier last I heard. Mounted police. Ranger, and security guards. Cheap and doesn't require any much fuel or electricity to maintain. Crocker recalled. The group moved onwards as they pushed their way through the public stables. They were relatively right next to one of Tyrion's gates so the area was littered with caravans, yeomen and ranchers who groomed, 
fed and bathed their steeds with their gentle care. Samantha noticed that the horses or what seemed to be like horses here in Gleesia sported more exotic furs and manes. There were purple, crimson and pale blue breeds of horses alongside the more mundane, brown, golden and white furred ones. Their legs were of a very muscular and thick built due to all the work that these horses are made to do every day carrying the carts and people around with the appetite to match with all of the tremendous amounts of hay being poured on their mangers. Strider Group took care to keep on their escort mark yet Samantha felt nervous being in such a potentially unkept place. She was still new to the realities of pre-industrial era living and she shudders at the thought of having her combat boots. Despite being designed to endure far more harsher means of punishment, step on a large mound of horse dung, the lieutenant would scream at the thought of it happening to her so she focused on what she treaded upon rather than what was ahead of her. Ouch, Samantha said as she felt a blunt force struck her in the head. She barely kept her balance stable as she looked up to meet her eyes with the angered eyes of a large intimidating man in heavy chain mail armor. Watch where you going you dumb girl, he roared. Sorry about that, Samantha apologized. Wait a minute, I know you're kind. You're one of them sky people aren't you? The ones protecting the farms? He asked. Yeah, we are working tirelessly to help the good Pio. Samantha was about to parrot a cookie cutter phrase when one was asked about their actions for Operation of Emeria, when a warm and sticky matter impacted her on the cheek. She reflexively shut her eyes as she placed her finger on the foreign substance that impacted her face. It was saliva. You cahooting bitch. You just ruined me I tell you. The armored man said. Ruined you? Samantha exclaimed in confusion. Me and my crew been living off of protecting these pathetic piss for their money for five years and you came along and offering to do all of that for free. And also, the Grey Order building is offering no more jobs cues you sky people keep taking them all for free, he said. His voice rumbled with resentment. It then hit the lieutenant over the head, she would have known this might have caused some unintended consequences in terms of the adventurer, mercenary oriented economy of the implications of a substitute, i.e. the youth and their operation of Emeria public service could do to the Grey Order. Having so many goodwill missions of humanitarian works began to drive out the adventurers away due to the youth substituting their services for a much more superior performance at a fraction to no cost versus the lucrative fees the Grey Order and other mercenary groups services for comparatively inferior service. But we have been helping you, Samantha tried to argue. You can help by leaving, the armored man said as he threw a handful of hay at Samantha. Thankfully. Crocker got in the way of the disrespectful cell sword. Do that again and you will have to start to talking to me. Crocker cracked his knuckles readying himself for any escalation of violence. Sergeant. Excuse but let me handle this. Maria interfered as he turned his eyes to the armored man. He painted a marketing attractive smile on his face as he let out his inner charm. Why hello my good sir. I see that you have been down right now. No money? No food? Too much bad news? Is that your horse behind you by any chance? It's a beautiful one if I say so myself. Ah, no governor but my horse is over there. And yeah people like you've been taking our jobs. The armored man replied. His belligerent voice slightly lowering in tone. Are you some sort of mercenary that comes with his own horse I presume? Is your steed fit and healthy? Are you by any chance proficient in the ways of horseback riding? Mary oppressed. Indeed I am. The man answered honestly. Biceps look strong, feet too. Good for stirrups, and proper posture even. I have the solution to all of your worries if you so listen to me. Mary boxed his fingers to a focus lens gesture as he meticulously examined the armored mercenary from every angle. Going by the looks and the man's words alone, he might be the type of man he is looking for. Go on. The mercenary stepped forward listening intently for Miria to explain further, clearly intrigued. I know a guy, works in a ranch from afar off. A. Place called, New Corinthia. It's a very mountainous place but ideal for horseback riding. He needs people who are great on horseback riding to help guard the trails from.
bandits and other scoundrels. Miria stuttered to best explain the details of the job to the potential candidate. Never heard of this new Corinthia? Is it somewhere here in Zanagrad? The Merc asked. Oh no. You will have to take one of our ships to GE. Miria was about to say the truth but he was stuck by even more dirty hay as thrown by the armored mercenary. You ain't kidnapping me you silly old tart. He defiantly yelled. Yeah you show those Amwa, heckled a bystander. His expletives were multiplied by a slowly growing crowd of natives who are slowly surrounding the squad with insidious intent. Crocker, remembering his experience dealing with such rowdy individuals but also realizing that the native Gleasons are much more easily controlled due to their lack of understanding and the general fear that the you foreigners have amongst the populace. He pulled out his sidearm and expelled two warning shots in the air. To his expectations, the hecklers were silenced, stopped dead in the growing spur to forming an angry mob of lynching levels of threat assessments. Some of them even jump in fright at the mere thunder of Crocker's 9mm. Sir, this is not working out for us. I suggest we move on from here. Crocker asked Miria as he helped Samantha get up and wipe away the spit and hay from earlier. Yet in the lieutenant's own ears, Crocker's voice sounded more like an order than a polite suggestion. I think I can let go of some of the finding fee. I told him that getting mercenaries to agree was going to be a long shot. Miriam muttered as he followed Strider Group as he was led away from the public stables. Dash. The final place that Strider Group that Mr. Miriam wanted to visit was the more affluent district of the Citadel where Devico's mansion, now known as the Youth Embassy and imported goods stores nearby. Samantha can see the fruits of youth branded capitalism being shown by the familiar items that she sees the nobles and even their attendants were displaying from t-shirts, umbrellas and even Korean beauty products. The face of the Terrian nobility changed almost overnight as they opened their purses to the many merchandise the youth brought over and introduced. Who is our last one sir? Samantha asked Miria. According to Ludera, there is a high-class courtesan who hangs around this part of town called Shella the mayor of Terrian. The rumors said that she is considered the most beautiful person to be living here. Miria said, for what kind of job this time? Clay asked, his breathy voice revealed fatigue from all of the walking and staying vigilant for threats against their and Miria's lives all day. I won't mince words on this one. This is a talent scout for none other than Playboy magazine. Miria confessed. As in, the Playboy? Crocker asked, the one with the women kind? Sexy, beautiful and sometimes naked? Samantha asked. Miria nodded with an embarrassed smile. Saving the best for last? I am gonna like this one. Diaz smiled with a juvenile pervert's grin much to Samantha's chagrin and Iris' bemusing confusion. What does this Shella look like? Samantha asked. Oh that Shella I have seen her several times during my trips here. She may look a bit intimidating for a woman but she is nice for her kind. Hey that's her over there I think. Iris added before she pointed to a figure standing idly by the corner with a hood on their head. The figure's arms were thick of an almost masculine shape due to it being exposed to the midsummer sunlight. But what betrayed any resemblance of normality was the skin tone. It was green like the summer leaves that could almost blend easily with Shella's skin. Miss Shella? Excuse me madam? Muriel approached cautiously. The usual rate for my presence 500 ducats per hour. Shella responded. Oh, I need a much than your mere presence my lady. I demand something more. Intimate. Miria said with tact. 1500 ducats for one hour and no more. And the room is on you. Shella said briefly. Not the time of intimacy I. I just want to talk to you of a special business opportunity that can pay much more than what you can get servicing clients here. Miria said, oh, is that so? Tell me, what kind of services does the sky people want from a courtesan like me? Shella asked. Well, I was told from a reliable source that you madam are the most prolific courtesan in all of Tyrion. is that true? Indeed I am. These humans would pay fortunes just to have me for one night. Do I interest you? Shella said as she removed her hood revealing the rest of her face. Shella is an orc. Samantha whispered to Iris. Yes. Surprised? Iris nodded. 
A bit, and I don't know orcs supposed to be a bit. Uglier, Samantha commented. Shella was by all accounts quite attractive for a woman of such a robust build such as herself. Barely any physical flaws on her face and her brunette hair with several braids that fell down to her back gave her an exotic yet not too alien appeal. You do look interesting, but I digress. Any woman can braid their hair and pamper their face nicely, but I don't understand is one thing. Why are you the highest paid courtesan in Tyrian? Miri inquired, still not convinced why Lulia spoke so highly of her. Ten ducats and I will show you. The orc courtesan said. Miri quietly reached into his pocket and luckily, he exchanged some of his youth credits for ducats before he left in case he needed to rub some oil with potential candidates but he was surprised his foreign exchanged funds were relatively intact until now. Most of the people he had interviewed either said yes to his smile and brochures alone while others flatly refused for a basketful of reasons. He placed the ducats on Shella's awaiting palms and gulped nervously. With monetary motivation in hand, Shella smiled and she began to lift the top of her dress which was a separate piece of clothing from her skirt. She moved up her top halfway through revealing her abdomen, but it was all enough for every male within a ten meter radius to gaze at her. Whoa. You're it. Diaz's eyes widened. I can grate. Cheese on that. Abida's jaws dropped. I feel inadequate. Samantha humbly and bluntly confessed. Shella sported a magnificent six-pack. Well maintained and was sweating slightly from the heat convection inside her clothes. But the excretion made it all the more desirable for men to zoom in on her. And I also have this, Shella said, lowering her shirt down and then lifting her skirt partly to reveal her leg. Above her leather slippers was a perhaps the most well-sculpted leg the lieutenant had ever seen. It looked like that leg was built in an android factory with all of the asymmetrical cuts and linings the leg had. The orc had a leg worthy of an Olympian athlete that can make even Crocker who by far is the most physical imposing of Strider group with his regular exercise regime to feel envious over. The Tyrian nobles like women who can keep up. Shella said, may I hold your leg or do I have to pay more? I want a closer look, Miria asked. Only if you don't touch the hip. That's an extra ten if you do, Shella answered. Miria probed Shella's bare leg feeling every inch of her well-defined muscles, the sight of the uptown district's favorite socialite and escort bearing her skin excited several of the men much to the snapping and slapping of their wives and mothers also present in the scene. Miria after about a minute of his hands caressing Shella's leg, slowly dropped it gently before he for the first time in this excursion, removed his glasses revealing his blue but glowing mechanical eyes. I know. A client their name is Empower Arts Publishings, a group who owns two magazines, Playboy and Women's Health. They are looking for the next cover girl, and I believe I found her right in front of me, Miria said with a solemn confidence. A magazine? You mean like a book? Shella asked. Yes. You will have your face and name on it and you will look beautiful in it I guarantee it. Miria appealed. But a drawing is an imperfect reflection of beauty a poet once told to me. Shella shot down. Oh, but I can draw you so much better like. Right here. Right now. Miria said as he pulled out his smartphone and aimed at Shella. Smile a little bit but not too much. He added, Shella seeing that she doesn't have much else to do at the moment but make the most out of this rather strange client's requests complied and gave a soft smile which made the men and even Samantha redden with swooning delight. Sending this over to a friend for assessment. And here. Your drawing. Miria said as he turned his phone to the orc. She was amazed that the drawing was completed almost instantly and then she was equally amazed again at the quality of her own self-image. It was like staring at a mirror to her. Her dress, her face and the tree behind her. Their textures were captured and recreated perfectly on the canvas. She had never seen such a beautiful thing be so gracefully reflected ever. It is said it was impossible to capture a maiden's smile for it was fleeting yet one must savor and value the memory but this drawing proved it otherwise. The orc could feel her own life reflected from that moment, when she was taken in by the local brothel and educated in the arts of seduction, poetry, sex and music. Yet her own orcish instincts got her restless and every morning she grabbed some buckets of water, 
or use crates filled with wine and work out which consequently was done in the middle of the brothel for all onlookers to see. It grabbed the attention of many of the nobles, either in the category of having military backgrounds or were just bulging with their own stuffed bellies to see her lift such weights as she often works out in nothing more than her undergarments. Maybe it was the sweat that dropped from her body like zesty market produce from all of that effort or the way her body was sculpted like the classical statues of heroes in their glory but in the form of a feminine yet very strong-faced woman. She can remember the hounding she received from those brothel patrons throwing money at her just to simply be allowed to privilege to touch her. She was once told from a young age that hawks were a crude and often violent race, running loose in the eastern steppes as mere bandits and smelly herders. But in the brothel, she was called the mare which in orc culture was considered the strongest and the most prized steed a tribe can place their saddle on. As she continued to admire herself. A ring noise came from her phone which caused her to drop the phone in fright. Oh no! Miria screamed as he checked his phone. Luckily no cosmetic damaged but he did know that the ring that startled the orc Amazon was a message ring. He clicked on his messenger application and examined his most recent mail. Oh yes! Miria changed tune. The mail was from Empower Arts and it was only three words. But those three words meant the world to the recruiter. Show us more. I am so sorry. Shella grimaced. It's okay in fact. Here, have some more ducats but under one condition. Can you follow me to New Albany? I want to take you to a photo. I mean drawing studio to best capture more of you. My clients want to get more drawings of your beauty which will involve having take of your clothes to your undergarments but... If I ever ask or try to solicit you for sex, I am powerless to defend myself when you inevitably beat me within an inch of my life," Miria said. Is this like what does clients who work in banks call a collateral? Scheller asked. I am the collateral, not you, me. If you don't want to agree to this you have every right to punch me and these minions here are witness to this. You all witness this? Miria turned to Strider Group. They all nodded. At least this flamboyant recruiter of what a potential essentially eye candy headhunters was not resorting to the vile casting couch. Even Samantha would admit that even if Miria tried, he wouldn't last half a second with the orc woman. If all goes well with my clients, I can take you to places you didn't know you can dream of. So, what do you say Madame Scheller, the mayor of Terrianne? The recruiter forwarded his hand. Shella couldn't resist the options. It was an unusual request but it was relatively low to medium risk of any physical harm to herself. She heard the trickled news about the mysterious sky people who took down Divico and have been helping out the people of Tyrian and she couldn't find any wrongdoing from them. And if they did try to make a sinister move on her, she's of enough prolific status amongst the social circles of the principality's elites that they would notice her disappearance. Additionally, she had always aspired to do more higher paying and much more adventurous jobs outside of slathering her body in oil and have men caress her or just be an attractive personal trainer to the less physically abled. Although she does admit she's proud of getting those slobs to go out and walk more which they appreciate she accompanies them, now with an opportunity for much greater things with these sky people, she decides that in this moment, she will take the risk. Yai, help. A loud cry disturbed the peaceful bustle of the noble district. It looked like it came from nowhere else than the youth embassy. They could see civilians fleeing from the complex's direction which only confirmed the soldiers' fears. Damn it, Crocker, Kane and Iris stay there with Miria. The rest follow me. Samantha commanded. Even though through a technical standpoint that the lieutenant was semi-abandoning her mission, Samantha knew that the embassy was a priority defensive structure to be defended from any threats. Whatever was the commotion there must be something very serious. Show us. Lead us. Take us to a new age filled with chaos, domination and lust a naked man wielding a knife heckled the shopkeepers and embassy staff yelled in a sententious inflection. The irksome individual brought with him an entourage of half a dozen of so similarly composed men. Their bodies were scarred in symbols that seemed to glow with magic. Are they some sort of type of mage? Samantha thought. Metal demon. We waited so long for your return. I bled for you to take us back to glory. 
The man heckled one of the embassy staff, Demon, I am a born again Christian who prays every mealtime and the last time I did any wrong was when I got mad when they phased out cocoa pebbles. The embassy staffer awkwardly answered before pushing the heckler away in disgusted confusion. The prophecies are all true. The return of Allbone is upon us to lead us to a new age. The towers, the magics don't deny it. I know who you are and we wish to serve you again. The man continued to heckle the embassy staff. I don't know what you are talking about but you need to leave. The now annoyed staffer urged them but his words fell on their oblivious ears. Deafened by years of relentless persecution and endless aspirations of a new age in their twisted image. Samantha. Lieutenant. They are dangerous. Iris voice yelled from the lieutenant's back. Then maybe this will show you your true selves. The leading heckler said a slight menacing tone that sent a chill on Samantha's poignant empathy. The troublemaker's voice sounded dogmatic in the same vein as someone in a cult will be. The heckler lunged himself towards the Gleesian onlookers in the scene and forcefully pried from the hands of an unforeseen mother her small babe. He cradled the baby in one hand and pulled out an ornate knife with many serrations and of an unconventional curve on the other. He raised the blade up to the sky to bask on the sunlight and tense his arm as he forcefully smashes it down aimed at the child. No, Abidaya screamed. He didn't have to think about what he did next. His muscles in a split second he reached into his revolver and snapped it out of his holster quickly drawing it before in the same split second pulling the cock expelling the .44 magnum at the insane heckler just as he was about halfway through the path in plunging the blade to the child. The bullet struck the man at the neck between his head and the upper body decapitating him and slicing his throat. His body grew limp as he dropped the blade. With a child's life on the line, Samantha sprinted to the shot man as he was in the middle of his fall and grabbed the baby from his cold hands before ducking down with motherly instincts in a fetal position while taking care not to accidentally smother the baby with her body in order to protect it. The knife's blade had fallen rather half-heartedly on her left shoulder but Samantha's body armor caused it to bound harmlessly aside before falling to the groan. Blade Riot still looking menacingly thirsty for blood. Shit. Diaz cursed as he pulled out Ruina opened fire at the other five hecklers. Shots fired and screams were made but the hecklers, in their fanaticism pulled out their knives and began to start slashing and stabbing wildly at the natives. Protect them. The embassy man ordered. Iris ran in to join Abidia and Diaz as her hands glowed with magic. I will hold them down and you take them out. Iris said. Abed, recocking his revolver again Fan fired his gun and was able to shoot down two of the other cultists. Meanwhile, with his rapid movement boosters, Diaz dashed towards a cultist whose blade was within an inch of slashing some civilians. He grabbed the cultist knife hand and pushed it away from harm before quickly knocking him to the ground. Another cultist tried to cast a magical spell but Iris casted a counter spell causing him to short out him before the vampire which casted a magical dart that easily pierced the bare chested man. It was a paralysis spell causing the man to stiffly fall down to the ground harmlessly. Now all was left is one lone cultist, visibly shaken yet still from a standpoint a visible threat due to his unsheathed knife. Put the weapon down. Embassy security began to surround him. Allbone has returned. Beautiful and gleaming. The cultist said before he plunged a knife down on his belly and sliced it open before he began to chant in a dark and eldritch sounding tongue. His bleeding body began to glow crimson and gold as the blood began to form around his scar ridden body before crystallizing into a hard metallic secondary skin that rose up from his gutted stomach to the rest of his torso. Blast him. One of the security guards ordered. They opened fire their automatic weapons at the cultist. To the astonishment and sudden reflexive ampasses, several of their bullets ricochet in random directions, hitting objects and narrowly missing people on the way. Yet a majority of their rounds managed to pierce through the cultist making him collapse as the last points of his life were fired away. He collapsed face first into the ground. His blood created a pool of the crimson body fluid on his torso as embassy security began to pull out some crimson investigation yellow tape. Samantha seeing that the coast was clear checked on the baby. 
it was tearing up but was not as loudly crying from earlier when it was in the hands of that madman. It's okay. Shush, Samantha cooed. My child. The mother rushed to the lieutenant. Here you go. Samantha gave a stately smile as she lovingly passed the baby to his rightful mother. Those cultists call you demons. Pa. No demon would try to protect my child. May the gods bless you sky person. The woman politely bowed before she walked away now more careful to never let her child go anytime soon. The lieutenant turned back to her squad to check on them. Abidaya was quietly reloading the chambers of his revolver and refused to speak much at that moment. Diaz in the other hand was visibly distraught of what he just witnessed. Quite something for a criminal but then again, the cold-blooded murder of children was something that not even the most unscrupulous scoundrels would even stomach tolerating. Rose, may I have a word with you in the embassy? I know those people. Iris stepped forward, dash. So what you are saying Iris is that these people are some sort of demon worshipping cult? The holographic display of Colonel Polonsky spoke in video conference. Yes my lord. They are known as the Inheritors of Albone, a very secretive cult of rogue mages who perform blood rituals and enchanted metallurgy in a bid to restore the Demon Lord's old presence back before his fall. Very awful people, not even all the ducats in the world would let me work with them when they came to me once for some help. What kind of help? Polonsky asked. An ancient altercation spell called Blood Armor. Your men I believe saw it firsthand. Iris answered. Yeah. Looks pretty tough. Managed to ricochet a bunch of the bullets but it went through. Diaz commented. The legends say that's how Allbone managed to have nigh unbeatable army that it took many of the tribes of men, the dwarf clans and the elves to be able to stop him. It is said the armor can self-mend itself by splattering blood on it. It was such a horrible spell that witch hunters from the churches have been hunting them down to extinction. In short. They want this spell to be forgotten forever. Ironic, coming from a vampire to say all of that. Samantha added, I may be one but there are just some spells that are just not worth studying. It drove many mad and caused untold amounts of chaos and destruction. Iris said, How many are these small fringes of these inheritors you speak of? Polonsky changed the subject. I guess about maybe a dozen or more? They tend to live in remote villages or in caves and act as bandits for their blood experiments. All of which very messy and disgusting even for vampires like me. Well, I don't think Major Holyfield would argue against seeking them down. The way I am hearing this, these people need to be stopped. Your services are valued Miss Kodahagan. Polonsky gave his gratitude. And thank you for the kindness the United Federation of Earth has given me so far. Iris nodded back. Which reminds me Miss Kodahagan. Polonsky interjected. Iris' eyes widened on the sudden shift in Polonsky's voice from inquisitorial to the tone of congratulatory generosity. Something was up with the colonel and it intrigued her. Your services for the youth has been so far invaluable for the past few months and there have been talks about giving you something for all of you trouble, an offer that you will be a fool to refuse, Polonsky said. Go on. Iris pressed on. Me, Governor White and the rest of the UN Office of Outer Space Affairs and Colonial Affairs Office want to reward you with youth citizenship, Polonsky said. The conference room filled with Strider Group and Embassy staff began to erupt in gossiping whispers. The first alien to be granted youth citizenship? You mean, become one of you? Iris asked. As an enjoy the things we enjoy, access to healthcare, the right to vote for your leaders in government, the right of property and to open a business. We can help you out get started on the latter too. We even will give you a very lofty position of being the chief of Gleesian relationships due to your extensive knowledge of all the peoples of the planet. I, I, don't know. That seems quite a lot. Too. Iris began to reluctantly reconsider. Come on say yes. We can do so much more together. Samantha pressured. Imagine all the fun stuff and nice pad you be getting vampy. Diaz added. I want to think this over. Iris exclaimed much to the shock of everyone in the room. The vampire which normally was a reserved speaking woman but her suddenly shouting caught everyone off guard. 
the vampire stormed off the conference room leaving the rest to sit there awkwardly. I think we should give her some space. Maybe I can talk to her when I see her again. Ken suggested. Good idea. I was about to go to the next subject now. It is about the Friendship Day event so everyone listen up. Polonsky raised his voice commandingly which caused everyone to tense up. Within in about 42 hours Governor White will be conducting a speech which will be followed by a fair of shops and other fun new things that will get us to be able to woo the natives and get them on our side. Diplomatically speaking we are going to need friends to survive in this planet and the Wigs upstairs want to start in Tyrian and to just ride the wave from there. We need to show them that we come in peace so embassy staff. I want you to dress in your Sunday's best and be ready attend to the guests once the party starts. The embassy staff quietly nodded with a fierce determination. They knows their duties and they know them well. As for you Strider group however, I wish to not panic you right now but according to some investigations by Inspector Reed. We have reasons to believe that there might be an attempt on Governor White's life. Samantha's A's widened. Who could even try to take him out? We need to show them that although we come in peace, we are not defenseless. We have teeth, interrupted Major Holyfield in the video call. Holyfield? You're not supposed to be here you know? Polonsky protested. Yet I am the one in charge of the outer ring of security for the event so I have a say in this too. Holyfield argued. What kind of security will the event have? Samantha asked. My marines will be on the first and second layer rings as you can see in this chart. We will be scouting out the guests for anyone suspicious outside the entrance whilst our scanners will be hard at work on the second defensive ring. The third ring however is the most concerning for it has the most overstretched amount of security detail. Holyfield said with a grumble when he described the latter third ring of defense. The reason is that we are trying not to intimidate the locals too much with our guns and men which is the rationale behind the light security. Might give the wrong impression that we are conquerors and we don't want to be seen like that. As for you lieutenant, your team will be set up on a vantage point overlooking the embassy grounds. Observe the crowds and be ready to react if our intel is right that there will be an attempt on the governor's life. Look for assassins, shapeshifters, snipers and whatever. Polonsky said, affirmative sir. Samantha nodded, dash. Mita the crow arrived in Tyrian last night and quietly walked up to the crow safe house. She and her fellow crow and some disgruntled Grey Order adventurers who were washed out due to the youth soldiers taking their jobs. The plan was simple. Using her custom-made crossbow that can shoot exploding bolts. She had arranged an alchemist from Alpha Nora to provide her with one of the most lethal poisons known to Gleesia called Demon Bane. It was a purple flower that according to legends it can kill even the strongest demons with just a sliver of the substance either inhaled or injected into the bloodstream causing the victim to cough blood, lose his sense of movements, hemorrhaging and delirium. In practice it was a rare but stunningly effective poison that can kill any target quickly with only the best clerics can only hope and pray to cure all the essence from a specific vine find only in Alpha Nora to act as an antitoxin. And that's if first aid was immediate to stop the spreading of the poison from getting to all the vitals of the body. The plan was to aim her crossbow at the governor and shoot him with an exploding bolt with a demon bane toxin delivery. Then under the cover of an explosion and some help from the local Grey Order adventurers made their escape. With luck the demon invasion will be halted as their leader would be killed before they could attain the principality's control and bind them to their will. She smiled as she looked over the window where she can see the heart of the demon operation in Tyrian taking place. The youth embassy. This will be done and out, she said confidently to herself as she sipped her glass of wine that she habitually drinks before the days of an important mission to calm her nerves. As she retires for bed, she still has another day of preparation and planning if this operation is to go smoothly. The fate of the Empire might rest in one crossbow bolt. Chapter 23 the R half square incident. Abidia set up his rifle quietly at his half of Strider group's positions. The old sharpshooter, Private First Class Mudwin, 
Corporal Clay and Lieutenant Rose were in clandestine rented room with a view of the upper citadel district square that contained the youth embassy also known by the local language as Arhaf Square. Samantha was on her binoculars scanning the perimeter whilst Ken and Clay were at a desk where they set up shop with computers and monitors of their respective specializations. Clay was coordinating communications with all the other security teams in charge of protection of the youth delegation alongside and QRF in case something horribly wrong happens. Ken meanwhile had a joystick controller as he was directing drone reconnaissance with some small surveillance copters whose camera were equipped with thermal and magnetic vision. I am counting about 400 people attending, colonists and natives alike. I spy with my little eyes. Some orcs. I spy with my little eye. Ixth. I spy. Hey that's Mr. Miria over there, Samantha said as she scanned the crowds of people who were let through in attendance to this auspicious event. Today was the day, the formal declaration of Gleesian, or at least just within Tyrian, and the United Federation of Earth Friendship Day. The youth flag, with its blue canvas on the background of a combination of seven interlocking rings that playfully formed the basic drawing lines of a six-petaled flower on an ocean blue background in all of its stately magnificence. The flag first official use was during the 2032 Mars landing with the joint American-Russian-Pan-Asian, specifically India, China and Japan and European space programs and agencies when the first human colonists landed on Mars. Alongside, was the windmill on a green and red checkered background flag of Tyrian, standing equally tall as the blue flower of the United Federation of Earth. It was a diplomatic move on Anuza's part to show equal footing between them and the natives. The ceremony is written by the schedule, would start first with an orchestra of music from some musicians playing orchestral music alongside the UNDF anthem and afterwards some celebratory music of Gleesian origins as selected by Luya Amirian and Prince Klovich. After all the musical performances, Governor White head up to the podium and commence an approximately 20-minute long speech about Earth, how the EODEM, the kindness of the natives in accepting the youth colonists and the plans moving forward for both settlements. Afterwards Prince Klovich alongside an now upright Princess Aria will sign a document signifying the friendship between the Federation and Gleesia. According to Major Holyfield's best predictions. There's a 38% chance the assassins will make an attempt on the governor's life at the speech part. Which is why a protective security glass barrier that should protect him from anyone from range attacks but there's still the possibility of something magical can break through. Hence the reason why Iris is among the gathered crowds near the stage. I never seen our half this crowded since these two times I remember. The vampire which commented. Oh? Which one? Diaz asked. He was alongside Crocker who were wearing a regionally appropriate hooded cloaks that covered their body armor, cybernetics and guns. The three were on the ground in the middle of all of the hundreds of crowds that like drops of water in an ocean, blended so well under their disguises. Patrols just like the other half of their team was also not bearing much fruit. Do you think that they might have been turned off by our guns? We got patrols outside the city and sentries at the roofs. No way anyone can go through that. Samantha radioed into command. Don't say that until after the ceremony is over and the governor is back in New Albany Lieutenant. In my own experience, insurgents are tenacious. One minute they are up with their hands in the air. The next quick draw. Holyfield reprimanded over the radio. Well I don't see much here from my end. Crocker. What do you see from down there? Samantha radioed in her second in command. Nothing but confetti and people all over the place. Ove? Hang on. Crocker answered but he stopped himself when he began to notice something with his eyes. A window about a cross face from Samantha's position. It was open but strangely enough its drapes were unfurled. This contradictory and almost self-defeating circumstance alarmed him. The building, across you with the green walls. You see a window on the third floor with the sills pushed out but a drape covering it. Crocker described the anomaly. A B-Dyer set his scope on where the sergeant pinpointed and him too saw the anomalous window with his own visually enhanced eye. Yeah, it's just flipping for now reason. A B-Dyer said. 
Suspicious, Samantha muttered as she observed with her binoculars. Crocker, take Aris and Diaz and take a closer look, Samantha said. A.A. Crocker affirmed as he gestured his squad mates to follow him through the sea of people. Dash. Are they all ready? Meet the crow confirmed with her subordinates one last time. All are ready Athras. Her henchmen bowed with unquivering loyalty. They knew that what they will do within the next moments and they are ready to execute it. She had all that she needs. The poison, bombs, a card of illusion mages from the college and for some extra muscle over two dozen disenfranchised Grey Order guildsmen who were driven away by Yuf who were giving their professional services of exceptional quality to the Tyrianis for virtually now charge out of a sense of goodwill. Get ready with everyone because once I do it. We need to run away to the stables before they all realize what we have done. Prepare the screen. Mita ordered the rest of her disciples who scattered off to their assigned tasks quietly. She turned around to her table to see an ornate rectangular box with dwarf and alphabetics written over it. She carefully opened the lid to reveal an equally ornate dwarf and machine crossbow. It was made from a heavily purified metal from the dwarf and mountain clans but the real feature to the weapon was in the string and limbs. The limbs were made from the horn ivories of a wild ram whose males are known to fight each other almost at least once per day by thrusting their pointed skulls at each other until one of them gets knocked out or flees. The string on the other hand was from the braided silks of giant spiders but the same material was used for a variety of applications such as cloth rope fibers and even fishing poles of the highest quality. With these two exotic composites combined it created the crossbow with the heaviest draw weight in the known Gleesian world. Hello my beautiful child, Mita said as she picked up the crossbow. The weapon was of her own custom designed but saved for occasions where her best means of approach is from a distance. Now where are my other little ones? Mita rummaged through the box to find five crossbow bolts. But they were no ordinary crossbow bolts. All five of them had a broad head at their tips that had contained a small pinch of a dwarf and explosive powder called Juzigan. A compound made off of the grounded remains of a mineral and a rare moss found in their mountains. She opened the broad head's tips where a hollow container that once can additional explosive payloads or any special additional kick to the bolt. She had to be careful however for one the Uzegan is a sensitive substance that the slightest of carelessness can either ruin the explosive powder making it defunct at best or explode prematurely at worst. Second the broad headed tipped bolts were all handmade and so were pricey by default with a steady hand. Mita took her portion of the liquid poison demon Bane or otherwise as known in its home region of Alphalnora as Creosad's spite and poured all the poison on each broad head in equal portions before closing the caps again. She breathed a sigh of relief once she finished her modification before she bundled the bolts together before neatly forming them side to side so she could slip them in all at once at her machine crossbow's magazine. She smiled like a snake, now ready to strike her prey as she picked up from her utility belt a potion of invisibility before smashing it down and allowing the pixie dust envelope her body in a translucent and reflective light. Dash. Within only the course of a few months, the colony of New Albany and the Principality of Tyrian have known only peace and prosperity with each other. We have helped you rise from your tribulations, fed who needed to be fed build what was needed to be built and fought who tried and failed to bring you to harm. It was with our humblest gratitude that we ask nothing more from you but our friendship in everlasting solidarity. Which means friendship but much stronger for everyone here who don't know this word. Solidarity. Governor White said an excerpt from his speech. It was rather simplistic in terms of vocabulary but it got the natives entranced in his verbal spell. Unbeknownst to the locals, mixed in the crowd in local attire, are members of the youth military keeping watch for any suspicious individual among the onlookers waiting for an opportunity to cause trouble. High above the gathered, beyond the range of the naked eye, hovered many surveillance drones with multiple arrays of sensors to detect targets throughout the majority of the spectrum. Their scans transmitted to the new Albany military HQ and to the military personnel on site. Strider squad, like the other four squads standing guard over the proceedings, 
have on special visors that coordinated the drone's intel with everyone else. Even if the someone uses an invisibility spell they will be able to detect them. First-hand accounts made it clear that while the spell makes one invisible to the naked eye, it wouldn't work for every other sort of visual aids and enhancements like thermal and sonar. The crowds were over by several hundred from the immediate vicinity of the stage as nobles, commoners, humans, dwarves and other folks looked to the podium to hear the words of the mysterious and undeniably divine United Federation of Earth. Many nodded in agreement to the governor's choice of words. Was it not the youth who remained steadfast against the rogues and bandits that terrorized the principality? Was it the youth who lent their hand to the weak, poor? the abandoned and famished, was it the youth who showed the denizens of Tyrian that there is another way to a brighter and foreseeable future? The crowds clapped and cheered him on as White continued. Meanwhile, Cain hovered around one of his drones as the marching bands and orchestras played their songs to the ecstatic reception of the crowds. The crowd's attention paid no heed at the miniature flying contraptions hovered above them to mostly Eason's. The drones and their operators in their eyes are no different from those who practiced falconry with the way they take care of their bird and giving them training and direction in the form of their remote controls which they see is an exotic technique that the natives never heard of. Mudwin, get me a view of that house. Crocker ordered, with a push of some buttons and the pulling up of an on-screen joystick on his control pad, Ken flew one of his drones forward to the suspicious house switching to thermal vision. Kay nodded on command. His screen turned into a dark blue tint with the sights of yellowish-orange blips that squiggled in the screen showcasing that the house the drone had eyes on had signs of life. I am counting. Ten people inside that building, some are just standing around while others look like they are hauling something. Still can't see how it can be suspicious in my end, Kayn said. How about the window? Crocker asked referring to the suspicious window earlier. Nothing I don't see anyone behind it. Must be the WW. Wait. I see an eleventh person. He's climbing on top of the roof. Ken said dumbstruck and his conjecture grew immensely further. Hearing the team combat engineer's words, Abedaya zeroed in on the rooftop. His scoped tuned and rifle cocked but only to be greeted by a seemingly empty rooftop. A. Cain. I mean Mudwin. A. I can't get any eyes on what you're seeing. I don't see anyone up on that roof. Abedaya reported. He was more dumbstruck than wary compared to Cain. Samantha placed her binoculars on her two eyes and shifted her vision to the rooftop. And just as equally flabbergasted with Abedaya when she sees the empty rooftop. Is your monitor not glitching Cain? Clay asked his seatmate. Damn it. It must be one of those invisibility spells, Samantha exclaimed. Hang on let me turn on magnetics mode, Kane said. Magnetics mode was a shortened term for a relatively new camera mode function called sonar magnetics mode. It's a hybrid camera vision mode that combines sonar recolocation with X-ray vision that allows the users to be able to see through walls and to monitor and predict enemy movement. This comes at a drawback of its steep price range, its battery draining elements and the fact it had to be regulated to a few specialized cameras from drones or CCTVs due to the concerns of radiation poisoning from extended direct human use. Switching it on. Ken looked at his monitor again. This time he could see the faint hints of a feminine humanoid figure walking on the rooftop. I can still see someone up there, Ken informed. As he continued to observe the screen, his eyes widened to his absolute horror when the humanoid figure took a kneeling position and brought out on what he discerned as a crossbow. Middle window. One meter to your right a bed. Gun. Ken yelled. Take the shot. Samantha ordered. A bee dire. Without even hesitating, pulled the trigger, dash. Meter, at the very moment she pulled the trigger, felt a strong piercing breeze zoom pass an inch from her left as her perfect aiming posture was ruined when she reflexively twitched her hands, behind her the wooden and straw tiles burst in chaotic expulsion of dust and debris as Meter's eyes blink and shed tears by the sudden irritants on her eyes. The crossbow bolt flew falsely as it made its way across the plaza and landed where the orchestra was sitting by causing the bolt to detonate and erupt in a pale red smoke. 
The fumes began to enrapture both youth orchestra players and Tyrian minstrels alike as they began to choke on the noxious fumes which was thick enough to even screen the stage where the demon leader was having his speech. Bodyguards began to swarm around the governor protecting his being with their own lives as they quickly begin to evacuate the governor and the principality's royal family to safety, masking their mouths from the poisonous gas in the hopes that it doesn't enter their lungs. Mita, regaining her composure for a second soon saw her chance slip but she remained undeterred. She rebolted her crossbow before taking aim again. Another strong breeze breathed near her but now this time she felt a gashing sting on her left bicep. She had been shot. Mita winced meekly as she dived down for cover grasping her wound tightly. She could feel a warm and wet liquid leave out of her injured arm. She let go of her crossbow which her other healthy arm can bear with some minor difficulty. For the first time, in her own horror, she was bleeding. Mita was a very meticulous rogue who performed her plans so perfectly she never had to worry about the prospect of getting injured, but now here she is lying like a sloughed beggar on the blindsided half of the roof of her vantage point bleeding and her grand plan to assassinate the demon failed. She has been compromised and there's no other option but for her the rest of the crows and their grey order allies to do but flee to the outer city whilst they all still can. The crow leader mentally cursed herself. How could her potions, her skills, her experience and all her accumulated gadgets just fail her at that moment like that? She was confident of invisibility potion to allow her to penetrate the patrolled rooftops of Tyrian but now she was wounded, from an assailant she couldn't get her bearings on. He is line of sight but she doesn't and now the hunter is becoming the hunted, but she can't sulk behind the roof right there and now. She needs to escape. Clutching her two fingers together, Mita whistled which fell on the attentive ears of her constituents. Their cover is blown and their opportunity has been spoiled. Now is the time to leave while they still had their heads attached to their necks. Dash. Damn it. What the hell is that? Some sort of chemical attack sir. Some of the people are dead or barely holding on. We need a medivac at the double. None of my men have gas masks. Deploying a CPRN team now. Those were the chatter of the radio as lit up in a storm of words of alarmed and frenzied noise. Officers, team leaders and commanders scrambled to respond to the change of events. Samantha froze in the sight of the I half plaza descend into a chaotic madness of panic screams and rumbling feet as the people fled in multitudes of directions. She could see the orchestra band at their stations dying painfully to the reddish mist that engulfed them. To her knowledge it looked like they were gassed with some sort of poison. Lieutenant Clay tapped her shoulder. The colonel, he informed. Samantha picked up the radio and took a deep breath and gulped. Lieutenant, you have new orders, Polonsky said. We got reports of firefights lighting up all over the citadel. The royal family and the governor are locked up in the embassy but our priority is to bring order from this chaos. Firefights? How? Samantha's eyes widened as her tone changed from reluctance nervousness to concerned surprise. Reports of mages, fighters and archers are attacking several of our checkpoints. They got casualties and they are pinned down. I am reading you to a checkpoint where the fighting is at its heaviest. Get there and assist men. Hang on. It's your sergeant, Crocker. Let me patch him through. Polonsky interrupted himself when his call had a new entity joining in the field. He remembered Samantha personally assigning Crocker to lead the ground team during the assignment meeting. He patched him into their conversation to hear what the man has to say. Colonel, me and my team are in pursuit. Crocker's cockney accent flooded both the lieutenant and the colonel's ears. In pursuit? The colonel asked with intrigue. The assassin that smoked the orchestra. Climbing up on the roofs to get her but I need eyes. Crocker ordered. Got it, Kane. Stay here and provide drone support with your UAVs. Everyone else follow me. Samantha said. Yes ma'am. Her squad unanimously saluted. Dash. Crocker smashed through the door of the last floor leading to the rooftops. He. Diaz and Iris encountered several tangos who tried to charge at them but were quickly gunned down by the more Iris magic missiles. In his own experience however, these hostiles were more fanatical in their postures. They were practically suicide charging him and his team as if they had nothing to lose. 
most of the time based on his experience and glee easier as compared to his previous tours the locals seem to freeze in fear of the mere sound of a gun coming off but after wasting an entire magazine of his carbine against the assailants, it only got them to froth into a mad-like rage filled with hatred, fearlessness and a ready-to-die attitude unseen before since his time hunting down Islamic separatists in Mars gunning down the last of the assailants in the room. Crocker immediately detected two things, a window that he can easily access the rooftops, and a slow sizzling noise coming from behind the table. Diaz looked over the table to investigate and found a black and red barrel with a rope on top of it that was slowly being burned away by a sparkling sprite that was inching ever closer to the container. Shit. Diaz cursed as he placed his hand on the spark killing the flame. What is this? Some sort of dynamite? Diaz raised the barrel overhead. That's you Zegan. Iris coldly answered. Her voice shuddered at the barrel's sight. You know this? Diaz asked. Yes. It's a dwarven explosive powder. Miriam told me about these things. He said that if it comes in contact with even a little bit of fire it will explode. The vampire witch explained. If they have one then there's bound to be more of them. So basically dynamite. Fuck. We nearly blew up. Diaz sighed in relief. Meanwhile Crocker was looking out of the window seeing how he can climb on top of the rooftop. The gap between the tallest window of the house and the ledge of the roof was only less than half an arm's length between them so any able-bodied person can easily reach over and climb to the roof. K9 he dies. Where's our assassin? Crocker radioed. She's running west from your position. Warning. She's in some sort of invisibility cloak but my drones can still see her through other optics. I'll guide you through. Ken answered. Good one more thing. Have this house highlighted for an investigation. This place is a goddamn crime scene I tell you. Crocker added before he climbed over to the rooftop. Come on kids. We got a bad guy to catch. We'll tell Reed about it. Godspeed. Ken said. Fish on. Diaz smiled. Now's a great time to stretch his legs again. The three climbed over the rooftop and with the help of Kane's drone giving a live feed of their prey in his helmet's hood, the assassin was limping and bleeding her way through the rooftops of the citadel in her effort to escape them. Luckily the houses and buildings of Tyrion were tightly knit through the rationale of maximizing the 8.33 square kilometers of land the citadel consists of. Little did assassin knew that no matter how fast she and her craven rogues run, the invisible and agile UAV drones of the youth will would always be a few paces ahead of them. Additionally, the blood that she got from her wound from a Bedias sniper bullet was a breadcrumb that all of the thermo-optic cameras of the UAVs could detect with ease. Jumping from building to building, the three made hot pursuit of the assassin. Iris had trouble catching up with the fleet of footed Diaz and Crocker due to never having to run such a distance in such a speed before. She knew no spells of haste that could close in the gap and she felt discouraged by her own uselessness and helplessness. Until a loud explosion rocked one of the houses that the assassin passed by, blanketing it in burning ash and embers. A fire erupted as Diaz and Crocker stopped on their tracks to reface themselves. Shit. That building is on fire. Diaz said. Must have more of the dynamite. Using it to cover their escape. Crocker concluded while coughing off some irritants that invaded his lungs. I am seeing this too. Oh no. I am calculating fire outbreak risks of 86% and it's growing. Kane radioed in when his AI systems predicted disaster. Not only will these barbarians seek to launch a biochemical attack but also to leave this citadel in smolders with their fantastic answer to dynamite. These people are more tenacious than they previously thought. And everything was going so well. In terms of the soft push for peace and coexistence between New Albany and Tyrion. Iris, can you put out the fires that these bombs will make? Crocker asked the vampire witch. Yes, with some ice magics I can. She nodded. Good. Get on with it and keep safe. Be sure to follow us. Crocker acknowledged before he and Diaz continued on their pursuit. Conjuring a pale blue gale of her magics, Iris blasted a cooling wind device at the fires quenching them quickly and killing off any chances of the fire spreading at the tightly packed houses of the citadel. Iris, 
I will spot for any more of those fires and you stop them. Kane radioed into her. Yes. Iris passionately yelled as she moved on to catch up with Diaz and Crocker. The day was not how she wanted the date to be, and she was so looking forward to asking the nightman on a date to New Albany when it was all over. Meanwhile, Diaz and Crocker began to close the distance between them and the assassin to their encouragement. The invisibility spell began to wear off on their quarry as they could see the faint outlines of a feminine figure who now over time was being slowed down and her desperation of the escape made her start tossing random objects that she could get her hands on towards her pursuers. She also tossed in more of those dynamite-like bombs at them but Crocker's exosuit armor saved him from the blasts while Diaz's rapid movement boosters got him easily out of the blasts radius way. Iris was in hot pursuit behind the two as she quenched the flames with her ice magics and any fires that she might have missed during the rush of adrenaline she had in her cold veins were spotted by Cairn who pinpointed them to her, a service she wholeheartedly appreciates. Sergeant Crooker, this is Major Holyfield, the voice of the Marines commanding officer made its presence on Crocker's ears via his radio. The man's stern voice sent a slight shiver up the old soldier's spine. Then again, years in the military with many different COs, one can learn to remain stoic regardless of the personalities each of the myriad superiors Crocker had over his career. I am in the middle of a chase here Major. Crocker talked him back to his own legitimate concerns. This was an inopportune time to be getting spat at by his superiors. I know. And I want you and Diaz to know of this. I have the grave news that whilst the biochemical attack at our half square had happened, Prince Clovich and Governor White has indeed inhaled the unidentified chemical substance and have been incapacitated. They are both stable for now but Dr. Lee Hainanol reports that she has never seen such symptoms before. I have reasons to believe that the for you are in pursuit of knows something about the chemical used. Remember, we need that HVT alive. She is our only source of actionable intel on what is behind this attack. Affirmative. Crocker answered. The stakes were high now. It was either they get the assassin to extract the truth or be easy and relationships go down the drain today. Dash. Me to the crow felt her once air of superiority dashed like sand in a beach. Her plan was falling apart. It was all supposed to be a clean getaway. The Uzegan bombs were meant to cover her escape but it did little to hamper the demon's advances towards her. She needed to hide from them while she can still be remotely out of sight from their gaze since her invisibility spell was about to wear off any second now. Over here, a familiar voice from behind some windows called out. She recognized that voice as one of her crow lieutenants. Ada of many names. She was by the rooftop window waving her along to come in. Mita wasted no minute and dove straight in before her lieutenant closed the window sealing them from the outside world. Master, I am glad you're safe. Me and the rest of us weren't so lucky. Ada said with a solemn relief. Mita panned through the room and she was greeted by only one other of her fellow conspirators in the attack. She recalled that she delegated Ada to ambush one of the strong points of the demon army's soldiers and she assigned her thirty men of competent experience in ambushes and surprise attacks to be greeted by only one other survivor, whose stature was shaken of the mental scarring of shell shock. What happened? I gave you some of the poison and you should have slain those demons, Mita questioned. We did, but when we attacked that patrol of demons one of them who has red hair by the name of Rose warned them about our weapons and passed them some sort of masks that made them impervious to the demonspan. We stood no chance against their metal magics and me and Griswold barely hid here before I saw you running by the rooftops with that wound. I am afraid that we are all that is left. Grice passed me the healing ointment, Ada said. The other crow passed a barely filled bottle of healing ointment to Ada who applied the liquid to a piece of cloth before she placed the wet fabric to Mita's wound on her arm. Mita recoiled at first but eventually the ointment soothed the pain before the leaking wound hardened into a highly visible crater-like scar. She tried to twist her healed arm round to test the effectivity of the healing process but she quaked when her arm felt a piercing cramp on where the wound was. It was as if there was some foreign object inside the muscles of her arm that diminished her ability to reach out, curl and even simply flex it. But so far, 
the risk of dying through bleed out has been patched up to a favorable result. We need to s. Mita was about to give out the new plan for her remaining crows when suddenly the window that guarded their rooftop hiding spot exploded in a crash of falling grass and the gusts of winds as metal birds whose wings beat like the drumming dread of the sound of locusts ready to feasts for their own selfish machination. Griswold bravely pulled out his sword and tried to wave off these metal locusts with his weapon but they were simply too agile for him to land a blow. From what he could discern, these metal birds or locusts were of a literal metallic design, bathed in a reflective white color whose coat gleamed from the afternoon sun. Their wings seemed to be of an unusual pair of four sets that beat so fast that the naked eye would have deemed it invisible. But most frightening to him as he saw in that brief moment was the metal locust's one singular eye. It was pitch black and seemed to stare at him uninterrupted from the petty need of blinking. That uncanny characteristic unnerved the crows on these strange creatures. They were probably of the demonic outsider's origins by whatever reasoning or insane ramblings the three could think of. But nonetheless Griswold kept them at bay from me to and Ada. Go, I will hold them off, Griswold said. There was a swallow of pride in his voice as if he was ready to make the ultimate sacrifice for his people and nation. He pushed the girls out of the room and locked the door behind him leaving the girls up on their own. We both need to escape, Ada said. That what I was about to say, Mita replied. My pursuers know what I look like and I can't keep running like this, she said. Her condition was already reaching her limits as fatigue and exhaustion hit her body with a dozen of self-persevering methods that is detrimental when one is pursued by persistent predators. The wounds and the burning out of her gadgets left her metaphorically naked in the doctrine of the crows, and being caught naked was a death sentence as you would have no means of escaping or fighting back. I still have some of my gadgets unlike you master, I can shake them off, here. Give me your head. Ada told her master, her namesake of many names was that Ada, who was originally recruited from the Illusion School of the Wizards College has mastered a spell called Sculpt Face which allows her or anyone she touch with her hands to morph the shape of one's facial features. Ada had studied well how to exploit her talent of the Sculpt Face spell to make her accomplish many quests and missions which involves penetrating highly secured locations by impersonating someone who is supposed to be there. She had impersonated guards children, nobles and all sorts of folks who had access to restricted areas to much of her success, but now she is given the task of impersonating her master to allow her to escape. Will you be able to make it out? Mita asked. I hope so, but if they get me, I will let you know that I will be waiting for whatever horrors they might throw at me. But I will promise you this. You have taught me well about the horrors of this world, I will never give up the secrets of the crows. Aid reassured her as she probed and measured the lengths, nooks and grannies of Mita's face. Meanwhile the two crow women could hear a commotion at the next room. Drop the sword right now. A booming but focused voice echoed behind the walls. Die demon. Griswold's voice defiantly roared back. A burst of loud banging noises followed afterwards before a heavy thud came up next to that sequence. Tango down, beginning search for the high value target. Ada and me to close their eyes and pray to the god of the dead, knowing that Griswold did indeed perished at the room next to them. Before Mita knew it, Ada's hands let go of her face. When the crow master opened her eyes, she saw herself, like a perfect mirror image of her own face in Ada's hooded civilian disguise. Let's switch clothes quick, Ada told her. They stripped off their garments and traded them off with each other. Fortunately, both women were of the same height and build so the clothes seamlessly slipped into their new wearers without any complications. Years of experience of acquiring disguises made the two senior crows to quickly do the act in under 20 seconds. Now pretend some old lady and I was bothering you in this room. Ada winked. Mita could notice a tear fell out of her other eye. A tear of doubt in her experience. Intruder. Thief. Scum. 
Mita cried in her most convincingly hoarse voice yet. Ada, now looking like Mita from face to clothes stumbled out of the room and right in front of their pursuers. You, stop right there assassin. One of them who was wearing a very particular set of armor that had metal bones stick outwardly on his arms raised his hands and ordered the disguised Ada to stand down. But the crow ignored him and dashed off with him and his two other compatriots in hot pursuit. They didn't even spare a second look at Mita when they ran past her who was left sitting idly there waiting patiently for them to clear away before she can be free to escape. After a few moments of silence, her instincts kicked in deeming it safe for now to move freely, before Mita could leave. She peeked at the window that she and Ada were pushed out from by Griswold. The door which was once locked was forced open letting the crow master inside for a small peek. The room was empty of those metal locusts but Griswold's body lay lifeless on the floor, his corpses ridden with holes and his eyes were frozen open in a state frightened shock, blood poured out of the holes in his body while Mita, gently closed his eyes with her lithe fingers as she mentally wrote his name on her head to write down at the memorial at the crow's nest back in Herring Point. Leaving his body there, Mita in Ada's clothes snuck away from Tyrion, all glad to be alive but must bear the brunt of her failure to confirm the demon lord's death. She will need to head back to the Emperor as soon as she can and inform the Emperor of what has transpired. Meanwhile, Ada shaped like Mita ran towards the stables of Tyrion, her exasperated breath pushed to the limit by the sheer implacability of the pursuers, these demons no matter what distraction, disruption or other forms of misdirected subterfuge she could throw at them, they just won't stop. She was running out of ideas and now at the same of most difficult of spots in what she saw with Mita when she was trying to shake them off. She needed something fast or she will be caught. Then she saw a lone horse with a saddle on its back and unhitched from any anchoring stations whilst being attended by its owner. Ada pushed the owner who fell to the ground and jumped on the horse before immediately slapping its buttocks to giddy up. She's going to get away. One of the pursuers, a woman black hair and snow white skin pointed. Big mistake. The demon in the strange armor smirked. He tackled the horse from its behind before grappling it. Then, with inhuman strength tossed the horse down to the ground with Ada falling down with it, the self-appointed crow decoy, felt her right foot shatter as she was violently dragged away from the saddle by the armor demon, it punched her in the face several times mercilessly as Ada struggled to break free but it was no use. She was caught by demons and now she will be subject to the most humiliating of tortures by the demons who are not known for their humane treatment of high-value prisoners or women. As she feared as the demon slammed her head on the hoof-trodden and hay-littered grounds before dragging her cruelly. Major Holyfield, this is Strider Group Crocker, high-value target secure requesting extraction. The armor demon said, Roger, Inspector Reed will arrive the TAE 120 seconds out. An ominous voice echoed from her capturer's body to Ada's ears. It sounded of cold ruthlessness and calculating methodology, a popular description of some of the most powerful of Hell Lords. She despaired before she blacked out from the concussions of the blows from the armor demon and her own exhaustion. This crow's wings have been plucked. Dash. Aliathra collapsed herself onto the tiny surface area of a small stool sweat falling and muscles tiring. Her day servicing the dozens of woodsmen who were rushed towards the hospice built inside the Grey Order Guild building of Vercourt, the peak season of wood harvesting is now underway as the trees were now in season to be cut down and there was a rush by the town's woodsmen to cut down the trees since during the summer season the trees will be at their tallest but this will attract the attention of an unwelcome guest in the form of the white rot mushrooms a wood decaying fungus that propagates her spores during the late summer to fall season. The fungus had a particular appetite for the famous shield aophyne pines that surround the logging town and make up the Stla Aegean Empire's eastern forests. It is used to construct houses, ships and all sorts of industrious goods due to the tree's rapid reproduction cycle and its famous hardiness which gave it the name shield due to being used in times as old as the world to be used to make wooden shields. 
The shrooms degrade the structural integrity of the wood when they are made into planks so the rush was heavily justified. Woodsmen would search for any non-infected trees whilst mages or anyone with a means to control a fire would purge the rests to prevent the infestation from getting into the other trees. This rush however is not without its own consequences of workplace accidents. The elf priestess had to oversee her healing magics on crushed limbs head concussions and bleeding to categorize them all. The staff in the hospice however were of the traditional by hand healing with bandages and potions whilst she is the only potent cleric inside the building at that very moment. More help from the guild is on their way but she and the hospice staff have to make do with themselves until they arrive. So far, despite Aliathra's tender footedness, she was turning over dozens of patients that was placed under her wing of responsibility by the hospice's chief physician. The elf wasted no energy nor time diligently aiding the wounded. To the woodsman under her care, she was like an angel sent from heaven with the gentlest of her feminine touch she gave to each of them. Her shining aura alone can make even the feeble old rise up to the top of their feet. The weary reinvigorated with phoenix-like fire and the moribund attain their second wind. But even an elf in all of their superior magical innateness have their limits. Like a hydra's head, heal one and another takes its place. Again, she healed with all the positive energies that revolved around her to bring the damage back up but even more injured were past gnashing their teeth into the hospice's beds once the previous occupant was successfully serviced. Aliathra could feel her heart palpitate in the extensive stress of the work. She knew from her teachers and her parents that the real world outside the comforts of her palace and outside the safety of Earth Island's walls is a dangerous place and in so many cases, the only way to learn how truly cruel the world can be is to face them head on. The trick is not cracking down under the pressure. That is what separates all the children, from the long-living elf to fleeting human from the adults as her father would say. Aliathra, a familiar voice entered her ears. It was Petra. The elf princess turned round to see the magical knight in his casual clothing but still retaining a belt with a sword attached to it on his side. He was accompanied by several new people behind him that Aliathra recognizes the faces of. They were her friends from Eth Island and at the school of mixed backgrounds and chosen professions ranging from clerics just as her and to rangers and sword masters that the elves are famous for in terms of military sciences. One of whom managed to stand out, her dear friend Lindis. She was from a minor noble's background but she recalled during her sixteen years in her academy days that she was her roommate through and through. But whilst Aliathra underwent clerical apprenticeship and then afterwards from her academy days she applied for the Eth Island Rangers giving her an uncommon but very versatile set of skills. Lindis on the other hand went through political science and international relationships as she sought a career as a diplomat. Circumstances however landed her a role in not as an ambassador or elven embassy staff but as an inquisitor for the Eth Island Sephiliad. The Sephidliad is responsible for the many of the more subversive and soft power projections that the Eth Islands use to extend and maintain their influence across the world. Their tasks include from the opulent positions of diplomats and ambassadors to the more espionage-oriented positions of inquisitors. Linda's job often revolved around the tasks of attaining on the field intelligence as she was given by ambassadors who are also acting handlers for the inquisitors. Lindus, is that you? Aliathra spoke in her native elven tongue so that the humans don't understand what she is saying. Greetings again old friend and my princess. I see we crossed paths again. Lindus greeted back as she took off her hat. It was shorter than Aliathra's long golden white and the inquisitor's eyes had the complementary green eye color in combination with her auburn hair. It seems you know each other. Petra spoke in vigory. Oh. She was my roommate when I was in college. She's just a sweet one. Aliathra shifted back to the human common tongue. You know right about Lady Aliathra's unique background I presume? Lindis asked Petra. Of course, I read all about it. You're here to check on her well-being if I concur? Petra nodded affirming of his knowledge of Aliathra being the youngest daughter of the Eth Island royal family. I also took the liberty of bringing in an entourage of some of the Entente's finest clerics to help the people of Vercourt. We are sorry if we are late, 
Lindis apologized. She never wanted to bring the royal daughter too much intensity on her first time out of the comforts of Alfil Nora and the royal family can only put too much faith to the Grey Order partners and Slaeijin allies. Alongside the elf were ten elven healers. They robe were decorated in the colors and symbolisms of the Oath Takers of Nenith, an organization that Aliathra looked up to immensely. They were an alliance of physicians, healers, restoration mages, pharmaceutical alchemists and Hippocratic priests infected with Good Samaritan Syndrome who devote their time, parts of their income and efforts in the pursuit of the advancement of new discoveries in the field of medicine and physiological wellness. The elf princess initially wanted to join in the Oath Takers as an apprentice of one of the master physicians slash healers slash alchemists but her father insisted with some persuasion from her mother and elder sister that she goes through ranger training because he didn't want to have a daughter who is solely a scroll owl. Her father wanted to raise her to be able to fight on her own survive on her own if the worst ever happens to her or her family. But she did manage to leave a huge impression on the Oath Taker's senior members due to an award-winning thesis on a relatively new field of medicinal study, in which when translated to youth English in our own IRL equivalents mind you dear reader, toxicology which is one of the most dangerous of studies that not even the elves in their long life would dare risk themselves in studying due to the menacing and at first glance confusing nature of how poisons work against the physiological body. Of course, it is always splendid to have the assistance of our allies the elves. Shall I leave you to your rituals? Petra said, of course, my dear friend Daliathra, do you still have it in you to perform the Nanith's unity ritual? Lindis asked. Yes, I can still do it, perhaps for a few minutes before I retire for super, Aliathra said. She smiled upon the honor to be able to perform Nanith's unity with the Oath Takers. The ritual is a powerful healing spell that requires multiple healers of a proficient level of restoration magic skill to perform. It consists of a group of restoration mages to stand on a circle together and hold hands as they channel all of their positively charged arcane power into a focusing rune set up on the center of the circle beforehand which will be then distributed within an area of effect. It is a very versatile ritual that can address multiple ailments, maladies and injuries at once. The more mages that perform the ritual, the greater the area of effect, if they focus hard enough to concentrate and or the greater the degree of magical healing will be outputted. This depends on the circumstances or the collective will the ritual performers if they want to focus on healing more people within a large radius or being able to heal people much more thoroughly. In Aliathra's on-site observations, the ability to process through the wounded was more paramount in this situation. There were three other clerics that accompanied Lindis or Arthtaker's entourage and they began to prepare the ritual. One drew the circle's intricate lines and runic pictures whilst the others explained to the sick and injured the concept of Nenith's unity and reassuring them that they will be taken care of as painlessly as possible. So, Princess, I heard you managed to sneak inside the demonic rift. Lindis began to give Aliathra some small talk. Oh, I didn't manage to see any portal to the Seven Hells while I was there. I did manage to speak to some. Did they hurt you? Did they try to do anything to you? Lindis asked. Her voice raised in concern. By the gods no. They were in fact calm all the time especially this one named Diaz. He was quite a seducer with his red gambson but I managed to brush off his advancements. It had roses printed on them which was quite a shock for me. Aliathra answered. Well thank Nenith that you made it out with your heart and soul intact. I wouldn't want to dream if your parents who is my king and queen that they lost you to the void, but may I ask, why didn't you try to attack them when you had the chance? I am a ranger, I just scout, I am no fighter even with my enchanted bow. Besides, I was often surrounded by them whenever I had to talk to them on my scouting trips and the only time, I ever saw the demons act violent is when someone else acted violent to them first. Aliathra defended herself. Maybe they are trying a new approach. I heard rumors that they are courting Prince Clovich Tyrian at his citadel, offering him gifts and powers beyond imagination but that is not even something I would hear a demon would do. 
Most demons when they appear in this world often give contracts with conditions for the price one would pay to obtain whatever they want from them, yet these demons are strange, they offer gifts but ask nothing in return. Linda spoke about the hearses she had collected throughout her journey. I can confirm that what you heard are true, very unusual indeed, but they're metal beasts and Diaz scares me. Aliathra nodded, their beasts leave a roar and fume a sickening breath that makes the plants and small animals scream in agony. Diaz, this demon in the shape of a human, he is neither alive nor dead, I sensed him no life energy positive or negative otherwise. He says that he is human but his body is filled with note with flesh and blood but by metal and cloth amalgamated together into a parody of what a body is said to be as the books say. Aliathra explained the myriad of terrifying mysterious she saw in New Albany and Kesselheim. Then it is imperative for the world to be rid of them once. The legends say we have beaten them before and we shall drive them back again when the time comes. Linda saluted reassuringly in the holy hand gestures of the elven human pantheon. My ladies, the ritual circle is complete. We are ready to perform the spell. One of the clerics walked up to the two. Aliathra quietly walked aside her old academy roommate and was guided by the Oath Taker cleric to her designated spot on the circle. It glowed in a brilliant positive light that began to envelop the clerics in its bathing luminescence. Once Aliathra's body was fully engulfed in the magical energies she promptly grabbed the hands of the clerics beside her to complete the linking of their bodies and spirits with each other. How long do you want to help us on this ritual before you need to retire? One of the clerics asked. Maybe for half an hour before I get my well-deserved rest. Thank you for relieving me from this burden. I do not know how much my heart can take caring for so many of these people alone. Aliathra replied. As long as you know you're doing right and you gave your all, that's what matters princess. The cleric said before closing his eyes and began to concentrate his magics onto the runic focus at the center of the circle. Aliathra too promptly closed her eyes and began to focus. She felt the shared magical energies that surrounded and were being used by her and her Oath Taker colleagues jump into each of every one of their bodies, their combined talents multiplied the output of restorative energies that they could output compared if they had done it individually, there was a sense of solidarity between them and to aliate res on sensations she could feel the merciful presence of her patron Neneth being with them in her benevolent mercy. The elf princess could feel her heart skip merrily into such a beautiful feeling, but then, suddenly, she felt the hands she held let go releasing her from the magical linkage between her and her fellow clerics. She opened her eyes to see that the magical circle no longer engulfed in mana let alone bathing her or the Oath Takers in its nenith's light. The Oath Takers, their eyes and bodies were left frozen as if they saw a monster, and the way they faced themselves upon their worst fears was at Aliathra's direction. The elf turned back only to be greeted by the empty wooden walls of the Grey Order Hospice. Confused she turned back to her still petrified colleagues. Is something the ma? Aliathra tried to grab the cleric on her right side by the hand, but the cleric reflexively snatched his arm away just as they were about to make contact. SS, stay away from me. The cleric roared as he backed away. Lord Vimdon, shield me from the seven fires of hell. The cleric on her left knelt prostrate as he pulled out the iconography of Vimdon, god of law in the elven tongue, whilst he is known as Vimir to the humans of Sanigrad. Demons? Where? Aliathra raised her voice alarmingly. To invoke Vimdon's name, known as the Silent Judge loudly to the heavens was only acted upon when a great profanity of law and order was caught by the eyes of one of the law god's disciples, but Aliathra couldn't understand nor see any profanities being displayed in her immediate vicinity. Stand back spawn of all bone. Cleric she spoke to earlier who stood across her side of the circle began to raise his voice in a desperate but panicking tone as he began to channel for a demon sealing spell. Lindus, help. The cleric cried. Aliathra's old roommate barged into the scene with her rapier drawn with Petra too raising his sword on his left hand and a magical missile prepared to be casted when needed to be fired. The Cephidly Ad Inquisitor took a moment to scan the scene, 
a cleric was conjuring his holy magics to prepare for a sealing spell and it was aimed at her dear friend the princess. Alongside the ground, the other two clerics. What is happening? Lindis questioned. That is not Aliathra. She has a heart of stone. She is a demon. The cleric said. Demon? No I would never pervert Neneth's light. Aliathra defended herself from the accusation. But you said you went and talked to the demons have you not? Lindis asked. Yes. I talked to them and I. Aliathra tried to explain but she began to stutter. Did they promise you with power, money, immortality? Lindis asked. Well one of them did give me. Aliathra was about to mention the one time that Dias gave her clothes for her to blend in Kesselheim but she had to catch her tongue since it would sound at face value that she had accepted a demonic offering from the youth. You betrayed yourself demon spawn. What have you done to the princess? Answer me. Lindis roared as she charged at Aliathra. Both women had tears in their eyes. Mirroring each other on the two sides of the reception of betrayal. Lindis, betrayed by the demon's shapeshift of her dear friend and the possibility that her soul was devoured or corrupted by them. Aliathra, betrayed that her best friend would assume that a principled and upstanding elf such as Aliathra Letha, a paragon of the Letha's prestige in Alphal Nora would be so easily seduced by the evil forces of otherworldly invaders. With reluctance, Aliathra quickly grabbed her archery bow and with dexterity, parried Lindis' rapier away as she stumbled harmlessly to the hospice's floor. I am so sorry. I, Aliathra tried to apologize to her dear friend but the Inquisitor recovered her stature and tried to slash her blade vertically on her head. Again, Aliathra dexterously blocked the rapier with her bow. Its strong composites stood firm from the lightning slashes of Inquisitor Lindis fencing abilities. Give up. You shall be purge. Petcher. Lindis. Wound him down so I can cast the radiant drain. The cleric called. The spell that he described is a restoration spell that manipulates the mana of a creature and rapidly siphons it out of the target's body. For most magical creatures such as dragons, fee, demons and elves such as herself. It is a death sentence if the spell gets casted as when struck, her body will wither into dust killing her in the process. With no other choice but death or dishonor, Aliathra chose the dishonor of self-preservation. Grabbing her meager belongings from her rucksack, she then dashed towards one of the hospice's open windows and jumped out. Betcha and Lindis followed her towards the window but the setting sun they aimed at their eyes disoriented them allowing Aliathra to escape. For the elf princess, who was trained as both a ranger and as a cleric, she needed to escape. Confusion besieged her head as she tried to fathom what the cleric said that she has a heart of stone. She was she cursed? Did she spend too much time with the youth demons that some of their corrupting influence left their mark on her? She needed to find out what happened to her but first she needs to shake off her the Inquisitor and the Grey Order. Her lithe feet pushed her towards the direction of Verkort's surrounding forests where she hopes she can gain a head start and a chance against her pursuers, reluctant as she may be that they were at one moment her friends. Petcha, get me some hounds and some levy the yeoman. There is a demon on the loose, Lindis said looking onto the Verkort town view. Yes, I cannot believe this. First the tunnel now this. Petra cursed as he acknowledged the Inquisitor's orders. Dash. It was 6 p.m. when Strider Group were debriefed back in New Albany Colonial Hall. An emergency meeting was declared between the civilian colonial government, the military leaders of the Combined Marine and Militia Forces and as observes, and also as a friendly formality, the nobles of the Tyrian Principality led by the active Princess Ariarian gathered in the Congressional Hall. The squad was standing in attention who were personally involved in the what many people from tabloids to even the rumor-mongering murmurs of an average civilian deemed the events earlier the R Half Plaza incident. This isn't read my lips. A. Declaration. Of. War. Holyfield yelled to the top of his lungs with many hardlining members of the military and civilian officials, giving him an ovation of praises and claps that echoed even beyond the walls of the building. Mind you, Major. We're declaring war on a nation with over millions of supplies of manpower and resources in addition to one, they have home field advantage over this planet and two they are Prince Klovich's lieges, 
We are talking about going to war with a Goliath and we can barely muster up 15,000 men from our own reserves and that's if we enact the draft," Polonsky argued. So, are you saying that we should just let them get away with this? Holyfield fumed. No, what I was saying is that war will cost us too much if we let our impulses take the better of us, our technological advantage on them aside. We have problems right within our house. Two of the most important people in New Albany, Governor White and Prince Clovich are in the Aku and according to Dr. Lee Hainwell, she is lucky to get them in a stable condition but without an antidote or at least what kind of poison the attackers were using she can at best keep them and all the other folks infected for about three days, Polonsky said. Well unfortunately for all of us. The assassin behind the attack that Strider Group so kindly captured for us has yet to spill anything of value. I bet Reed is still on his first gallon of water and his first batch of car batteries with her. Holyfield said with a deadly sounding euphemism on the words of his latter sentence. What kind of poison is the doctor dealing with right now? Sir Polonsky, Princess Aria of the Terrian delegation raised her hand. Holyfield knew it would be detrimental to the governor's wishes to cast aside the primitives right now so he must temper his zeal when the real action begins. We are dealing with a toxin that gives off a pinkish red gaseous cloud that when inhaled causes the afflicted individual to gradually lose respiratory, nervous and circulatory functions in his body. You, I, Aria stuttered in confusion. Polonsky caught himself and had to face palm himself to hide his embarrassment. Even his peer Holyfield too shared the same sentiment. They again forgot to account that the primitives don't have such an extensive and intelligible vocabulary that the youth humans took for granted like respiratory, functions and the word inhale. I meant to say that your brother and our leader are having trouble breathing, moving around and keeping their hearts pumping due to the poison. And if doctor, I mean the physician. Miss Lee Hainanol doesn't find a way to synthesize a cure, the effects can be fatal, Polonsky said. Oh no, what will happen to everything? She panicked. Relax my lady, we will fix this. Bye. By any chance do you or any of the other people you brought along know any poisons here? Holyfield allayed the young woman's fears before asking her about the pictures that Polonsky began to display on the Congressional Hall's screen. She was silent and so were every one of the Terriani delegation who looked at the photos at first with studious observation but then to the youth's distress, befuddlement. I have never seen anything like that before, Luya Amirian raised his voice. And I had my fair share of selling. Dangerous goods. This is a really big world we all live in, it could be anything, my lord. Polonsky. Iris raised her hand and stood up from where Strider Group sat. All eyes redirected to the vampire which which unnerved her when the scrutiny of about 100 people gazed on her foolhardy display. Miss Kadahagan, do you have anything to say to us? Polonsky asked her. You can make the pictures bigger, right? With your magic mirror on your hand? Iris asked. She means can you zoom the images? Ah, uh, Iris, which one? Cain minded for her. The bright one with the governor's eye. Iris pointed. The vampire which had a hunch, a gut instinct when she saw that particular photo among the file images of the afflicted taken that day when admitted to the military hospital. Polonsky fingered his touchpad as he expanded the photo Iris asked to examine further. Closer, Iris asked. Polonsky again gestured the touchpad to zoom further. The room held its breath, as all hopes for a cure lay on Iris. This is the furthest as I can go Iris. Hope this is enough. Polonsky said. Iris, what are you seeing? Samantha asked. Shush. Iris silenced Samantha before reverting back to the screen. Her eyes scanned the close-up images of Governor White's eye veins and spotted something peculiar. Did, Lady Lee Hainanul mentioned that the eye's veins have a dark green color? Iris said. I don't think so. She was in a rush to stabilize all the victims that she didn't have time to give a full diagnosis to everyone. Polonsky said. The vampire is right. Hate to admit it. Eye veins are supposed to be red not this. Darkish green. Holyfield pointed out. There is only one poison in Gleesia that can do that. The demon's bane flower, also known as Creosad's spite, named after the paladin who discovered it, 
Legends say that this flower's sap which is one of the deadliest poisons in the world is so powerful it can fall the mightiest of magical creatures. It is said that Kul Delstla Ejak coated his sword with poison before he faced off against Tall Bone. Iris said, That's great news, does it have an antidote? Can we get the flower? Polonsky said, That's another problem I am afraid, you see the demon bane flower is only grown in Aflnora, the elven continent and during a specific season in a very specific place only known to the Eth Island Sephid Liad who are the equivalent of the likes of Mossad, FBI and, basically, like some sort of state security agency of sorts. Holyfield pressed. Indeed. The location of the flower and the cure for it is a top secret that even I don't know of. Iris sadly broke the news. Damn it. We need to march our ships to Eth Island right now and aim our missiles at those elves until we get our cure. I will even personally fire the warning shots myself. Holyfield roared to the ovation of his supporters much to the objections of the moderates and the Tyranny nobles, but there is an alternative means. That doesn't involve pissing on the most arcane civilization in all of Gleesia however. We need a cleric, Iris added, judging by our circumstances and your tone. I believe we need a specific cleric, healing priests or whatever, Polonsky said. Yes, one from the Oath Takers of Nenith. Their devotion to the Goddess of Life drives them to cure even the gravest of maladies. They are from Math Island again and many of them travel around the Empire but they tend to cover their tracks a lot since they are often conspicuous to more sinister intending people who have need of such skills and magics that they possess and can be able to do. We need to find one soon and fast. Iris answered, hang on, Creos adds, curse Iris? I think that Aliathra girl we know earlier mentioned she managed to cure poisons quite often. Do you think she's our cleric? Diaz said. Well she did heal me once back in that hunting trip Vinny so I say she might be worth a shot. Abida backed the penal soldier. Then we should find this Aliathra and these Oath takers right this instant. Holyfield declared slamming his fist on his table before he picked up his aviator shades. Call in Admiral Nishizaki, we need borrow some of his birds. Chapter 24, Aliathra's Breaking Point the slashing of the wind, the crack of branches, the stomping of the earth, the trotting of the earth and the rabid barks of hounds were the sounds that one could hear at dusk in the Cambervale forest outside the town of Vercourt. The lumberjacks normally stop the day's loggings as soon as they see the bottom half of the sun dip down on the horizon. Many of them already ran back home or to their communal camps to rest and enjoy their super. Unfortunately for the elven princess, ranger and cleric of Nenith, Aliathra, she could not enjoy the luxuries of a respite as she sped through the homeward bound woodsman deeper into the forest. She was followed by Petja and the elf's old college roommate Lindis who were hot on the trail with some local guards, Grey Order guildsmen and Linda's entourage of Sephiliad. The pursued elf could hear the sounds of shouting of angry and fearful men alongside the rabid barks of hunting hounds who were released off of their leashes. Aliathra recalled from memory that on her way to Vercourt she had to cross a bridge that was built over a river that when following it north to the dwarven mountain hold leads to the more remote parts of the forest that she can hide in. Clutching her bow at one hand and her ranger's knife on the other she sped through the forest whilst her pursuers still fumbled themselves by the growing crowd of confused lumberjacks who were unintentionally obstructing their way. She regained some self-confidence as she loses sight of the camp and now at the forest proper. She dashed towards the river that runs east of Vercourt. She quickly crossed the river. She ducked down behind a log and took a deep breath. Aliathra's muscles panged in soreness as she grasped the strained areas of her body. With a little bit of mana reserved in her, she relaxed the muscles that cramped her to remove all the pain. Once relieved of such material matters, Aliathra re-examined herself. She was quick enough to grab both her bag and her bow alongside her arrow quiver which to her account contained eleven arrows inside. Unfortunately for her, several of her personal items like her quill pen, her journal, a grindstone for her knife, her rations and a couple of herbal patches were left behind due to them being outside of her bag at the time. What was left inside her bag were some other wilderness survival items like a couple of flints for starting a fire 
a whistle to signal help, a piece of candy that she keeps to herself and her royal ring, the symbol of Ethylen Elven royalty which has a diplomatic and sentimental value to her and a locket of pure sentimentality to Aliathra. Tears fell down on the locket as she opened the heart-shaped piece of jewellery to see a very miniature-sized version of her family portrait made from the lithe hands of fairy painters who was commissioned by her mother Elosive so she can have lockets of their family portraits to each of her three children. Aliathra let a solemn smile as she remembered the amusing hours she and her family had to endure trying to hold still while the fairy painters delicately drew their images on the canvases that will become their locket pictures. She kept it hidden between her breasts throughout her meetings with the youth otherworlders couldn't bear the thought of them learning something more about her than her name. If there was one thing that Aliathra cared just as much as her people, it was her own flesh and blood. The royal Lethylan elven family, House Lethe, always remembered Valorian whined to dear mother that he wanted to go kiting that day. Aliathra reminiscence. She can still remember that day as if it was only yesterday. She recalled her constant humming of some of the Nenith clerics' chants that lightened up the silence of their ordeal whilst they stood still for their painters. She recalled the wish noises Valorian made to annoy the fairies to hurry up so he can play with his friends afterwards. And she couldn't forget Sister Lunafria or at least that her human name since she was named after a friend from her mother's travels. Her elven name is Ethiel which means Lady of the Moon due to her pale skin which poets sang that her glow outshines the moon. She was the heir apparent in many courts but her elven name faded to the background due to the name Lunafria being a much saleable name to remember. Ethiel is used by her fellow elves but to every other race it was Lunafria. She recalled the complaints by all three of them about why they need to hold still for an entire afternoon holding still while the fairy painters infamous for them meticulously. Her mother Elisiv lectured her that the idea behind that is that the king and queen will soon know that one day, the children will eventually leave the safety of the palace venture off to the world alone and she wanted to give each of their children a reminder of where their hearts were, with their family so that if they ever feel lost, they can always know that their hearts are still with each other as Aliathra's mother lectured after a grueling day of standing still while in the middle of a hot summer day. Her father, Aslanador and her mother Elisivan personally inscribed each of the three lockets with them signatures and insignias to give them a personal touch before handing them over to their children. I wish I could talk to you, she whispered as she continued to patch herself up. She could feel her heart palpitate quite frantically from this whole ordeal and if there was one thing that she needs to do right now is to calm down. She is a hunted elf and she needed to meditate her next move less one rash decision be her last. She closed her eyes, knelt down on a meditative posture and took a deep breath. In her studies this was a sort of quasi-ritual encouraged by her ranger masters of the important benefits of meditation and amongst the clerics who she was tutored by. The former stated that meditation is a great way for a methodical and cunning ranger such as herself to undertake as it helps relieve stress and the nervousness of the high risks duties the elven rangers undertake. The latter, the clerics told her that when a mage such as herself meditates she can actually multiply her magical potential less risks of overexerting herself from a general magic theory sense, but in a cleric's point of view, meditation can be used to help a cleric reconnect his restoration energies called DUI meaning flow to be able to accomplish better feats. Her nervous heart felt restless and even out of beat. Thus, Aliathra inhaled and concentrated. Her DUI as her inner senses could feel flowed around her body like a river rapid current. With practice gained over decades of mastering the art of meditating, Aliathra corrected her flow. She worked from her tired legs upwards but as she continued her self-diagnosis. But as Aliathra got closer upwards to her chest, she could feel an odd sensation. She could almost hear her high elven blood shiver in fear as they pass through as if they had witnessed the most horrid of crimes. Her nerves felt disgust as if they had seen with their metaphorical eyes a most disgusting of abominations. Even the very bones in her body could feel a sense of rejection as if they casted off an unfavorite child. 
This caused Aliathra to grow concerned and confused. Her clerical training had taught her to detect the signs of life and to listen on their speaking for she was taught that the very life of Gleesia sings to them for all of creation sees the God's children every deed as the religious texts goes. She mentally pushed herself further in her meditation. She needed to get to the bottom of this every inch of her body as she got closer to her heart. In the pantheon legends and myths, the heart represents the inner essence of a living being, their thoughts, personality and memories. It was the most vital part of the living creature although Aliathra did ask her professors one time if trees and plants have hearts. According to them and all the books she read, the plants often hide their feelings unless a cleric gently whispers to them to reveal it. At last after passing through many of the frightened blood particles and cells in her body, she arrived at the very core of her being, the heart, and it was called Aliathra if she could express herself physically would have her mouth agape in even more spiraling confusion. The very flesh of the heart was meant to be heartwarming like the gentlest of flames. When a heart gets cold, it signifies death but yet her heart beats, sometimes erratically and in other normal cases within a reasonable rhythm. Was some sort of physiological abnormality within her? The elf opened her eyes again. This time, she needed clarity. Again, Remembering her education, Aliathra conjured up a combination of illusion and restoration school magic spells simply called Sea Body which allows the user, whether with himself or to another person to see a luminescent live projection of their internal body. This was used by forcing the mana energies to create waves inside the body to whilst also applying some luminescent magic to vividly show from the tiniest blood vein to one's important vital organs outside under transparent scrutiny by the one performing the diagnosis. It takes a while for the mana energies to fully take place but Aliathra was determined to see the anomaly. Thinking back, she reflected on the excoriating words the oath takers of Nenny threw at her, stand back spawn of all bone. In the legends, the demons were often depicted with metallic or very hard and rock-like skin. Their life forces were non-existent if neither positive charged nor negative charged. But how could the clerics have accused her? A fellow devotee and faithful practitioner of the very antithesis of demons, the school of restoration magics be accused of unlife, confusion racked Aliathra as she beat her chest repeatedly like a war drum. Just then, she could feel her heart contract which forced her to let go. By the goddess, Aliathra panted. Ever since she left Kesselheim she had been having several occasions of heart complications and at each time grew more excruciating. It was no longer just the simple overbeat through the newfound stresses of her first time outside in the world at large, there was something genuinely wrong with it. She now lay on the log anxiously as she saw the sea body spell projection of a live visual feed of her entire body, and she screamed. Her heart, was not made out of the flesh which was Nenith's own blood, warm and soft but instead metallic with a reflective hue from the light that resonated back to the screen. It wasn't a singular united organ of tissue and blood but instead an amalgamation of artificial components all locked into place to form the satirical image of a living heart whilst Aliathra's pure elven blood flow and was pushed out by a pump that rises and hammers down the pressure needed to continue normal circulatory function. But normal wasn't anything about this heart. It was one sickening parody of a living, breathing and God-made heart. Worst of all were the inscriptions. It was the language of UFAE people that is called English. The text read, Asomembrum, Guardia MK-8, a product of Aparo Pharmaceutical Corporation, appliance installed by Dr. Hanjun of St. Luke's Medical Complex, Kesseheim. She was tainted. Her heart, is of otherworldly designs. Dash. Damn it. That's one hell of a thunderstorm. Captain Jennifer Carplian said as she flew the Super Osprey towards Vercourt, her tactical hug displayed on the cockpit the formation of heavy clouds slowly creeping towards the search area. The Super Osprey had several distinct features compared to its old American Air Force predecessor which boasted a 30% larger cargo, passenger hold and several armaments for door gunner fire support such as a minigun and even a grenade launcher. Additionally, 
In the more utility side of the plane spectrum was that it can be deployed into the vacuum of space and can be outfitted with high-powered radios to make it a command vehicle to relay orders and analyze any strategic and tactical information that its sensor will detect. Approximately one hour before it hits the Vercourt, unsafe flying conditions are to be expected. Recommend landing the Military Artificial Intelligence ISACC. Intelligent System Analytical Command Computer, Robotic Voice Warned on the Intercom Negative Ice Arc, We Need to Bag Aliathra or Governor White and Prince Clovich are going to die. Samantha reprimanded the computer. The AI had just recently integrated itself with all the available information related to Gleesia from important figures to all known geography of the planet. It was rather unusual for ISARC to be used for a colonial militia but circumstances have led to Major Holyfield granting ISARC's services to the colonial militia's studies and observations squads just like Strider Group. It can among analyzing the weather, coordinate recon and combat drones in the area, coordinate squad to company scale military battlefield maneuvers and even play satellite radio station from all the corners of the youth civilization. Samantha and her squad have all been retrofitted with an ISARC tactical computer on their persons and are now connected to the AI's growing roster of personnel under its responsibility. Multiple activity detected on Vercourt, the AI informed, it is the middle of logging season for the town, how can we find her in this crowd? Iris asked. With this Iris, Ken answered as he opened a box with a cage door on one side of it. A four-legged creature emerged from the shadows. Its paws were of a canine form but its skin was a reflective metal made with forest flecked and camouflage with the youth insignia proudly displayed on the dog's body. Iris, this is the Aparo Robotics Shaoshan canine drone. It's a robot dog. Ken introduced. Like one of your drones? Iris asked. Yes. It's all the fun parts of a dog minus the pissing and shitting that you got to clean up. Diaz smirked as he gave a final tune up to the all-terrain vehicles that Strider Group will be moving out from. They needed to move in and out of Vercourt fast. I can also have a therapeutic comfort mode and I am directly linked to ISARC. The robot dog said. Why do we need to bring this mutt with us? Iris asked. We need him to help find Daily Aethra and the dog comes with many autonomous tracking functions such as the bloodhound prog, I mean, it can smell things and track stuff like any good sniffing dog. We should have a lead on the elf once we landed. Ken caught himself again with the overtly sophisticated terminology that Glees and such as Aris have no grasp over. Hey Diaz, where did you say Aliathra might be at? Clay asked the penal soldier. The guild building in town shouldn't be hard to miss. Maybe they know where she is. Hopefully she's just there. But if not, the guild peeps there should know. Diaz answered, attention all outgoing personnel, we are about to land, get into your deployment stations now. Captain Carplian informed everyone on the intercom. Good, okay Fido, take point. Iris hold on to me tight, this ATV can be pretty fast. Ken told the vampire witch. The entire squad mounted their ATVs and revved up the engines as the Super Osprey made its touchdown. The denizens of Vercourt who were all dropping their tools and working moods to enjoy a rejuvenating night of tavern drinking and hearty suppers over a hard working day had their festive mood disturbed in the most highest of degrees when they heard the beating drums of the Super Osprey's engines as it approached the town's eastern entrance. The folks could feel the wind blow away from the mighty bird's landing spot as they all fearfully flee to their homes. Such a sight was nightmarish to them and not even the local guards dare move one step closer towards the metal bird that suddenly landed on their humble little town. Just the metal bird's back opened up as a ramp let out four riders in small but thunderous steads whose noise wailed as they pass. Many of the folks believed that it was the wails of a banshee come to signal their death and doom and began to pray to their pantheon of gods to spare them. Strider group quickly sped past the myriad of buildings with Crocker and Samantha's ATV plus the Shaoshan K9 drone leading the way. The villagers, startled by the roar of their engines shuddered, daring not to provoke the mysterious strangers. Many of them feared that they were bandits but the sound of their steeds invoke a mystical element that the natives couldn't fathom comprehend.
The ATVs soon encircled the Grey Order building, recognizable with the inherent symbols of their power, influence and prestigious legitimacy for a glorified mercenary agency, a weighing scale balancing a gold coin on one side and a sword on the other. Rose, times is at the essence for New Albany. Let me deal with this, Crockett told her. What do you mean Sergeant? Samantha asked. My instincts tell me they aren't going to give her up so quietly. Crocker said as he turned his legs out of the ATV, picked up his LMG and walked straight inside the guild building. There was a fire in his eyes Samantha saw in him. It was of zealous determination. Given the context of his colorful career, Samantha knew he takes terrorist attacks such as what had transpired in our half very seriously. Crocker budged into the receiving hall with a thunderous entrance with his exosuit chipping a good chunk of that door off. Hey, you need pay for. One of the people, presumably one of the guild hall's staff walked up to reprimand the sergeant but Crocker being about twice the man's size grabbed the hapless native and lifted him upwards until he was face to face with a Gleesian elf, blonde hair with blue eyes, heals people and carries about, goes by the name of Aliathra. Where is she? Crocker demanded to. I cannot disclose official, ah. The staffer was grabbed by the throat by the sergeant who remembering his discretion, turned off the hydraulic enhancements of his exosuit less he accidentally kills every person his hands came in contact with. The imposing British Maori man dragged his victim towards the guild building's clerk desk where he proceeded to violently slam his body to the table taking care, or just pressure, to make sure he still has his grip on the man's neck. I do not want to hear any of the official blah blah, tell me where is Aliathra's room? Crocker demanded again, upstairs, third room to your left, the staff member said, thank you. Crocker let go. That was. Harsh, Samantha commented. She was at a loss for words on Crocker's enhanced means of interrogation. No time to wank around now. Come, Crocker gestured. The two and their dog drone walked up the stairs of the guild building to where they were directed. Opening the door, the two entered into the room to be greeted by four robed individuals, each of them in green and rather gracefully designed clothing that demanded respect and awe. Samantha took a closer look into their robes and noticed that the most peculiar of the robes' designs was the religious symbol of Nenith, a glowing heart being held by a bloodied hand and wrapped with adorning vines. It is the very symbol of the goddess of life, Aliathra's patron deity. Those men, froze in fear, not knowing how to react to the intruder in their imposing armor and alien weapons. Looking around, Crocker spotted amongst the humble accommodations and the natives, several articles that he instantly recognized. A journal, that lay on the ground by a small rock, several patches made from some sort of medicinal plant and a quill pen. The journal was the most obvious revelation that Aliathra was indeed in that very room. It had a distinct-looking flower on top of some elven writing scribblings that he remembered confiscating during Aliathra's detour into Kesselheim. He may not personally know how the elven language was written but he swore by his guts of over twenty years in anti-insurgency as that journal was Aliathra's. He walked up. His exoskeleton's feet thumped the wooden floor like a hammer in every step towards the journal. Was this Aliathra's? Crocker said grabbing the book and showing it to the robed figures. By his and Samantha's observations, they were elves, fair-skinned, silky long hair had a rather fade demeanor of physical supremacy if it wasn't for their shaking bodies cowering at the sight of them and their robotic hound. There, here, one of them spoke. That elf was soon going to regret it when Crocker dashed towards him and grabbed him by the throat. He pushed the hapless elf cleric towards the window and forcefully smashed the wooden frames open with the weight of the elf's body and his muscular arms. He was not fooling around in this building any much longer. There were lives to be saved back home. What did you say? Where is Aliathra? Crocker asked as he pushed the elf's body leaning by the window. You foul monster. May Nenith. The elf channeled his god to curse his aggressor but it only further agitated Nevertly zealous Sergeant Crocker. Lewis pushed the elven cleric further down. 
his body now merely a few newtons of force and weight from being hanged upside down on the wrong side of the window. And that's not accounting if the armored clad beast holding him decided to let him go to full face first. Ah, ah, ah. She ran towards the forest. North, the cleric said. Crocker pulled the elf back up to the balcony safely before tossing him back to the beds as he turned around with the information he needed. The other three clerics in the room began to chant and waved religious iconographies at the youth soldiers. They held what Samantha can deduct from the context of their situation that they are trying to exorcise them. Subjects are non-hostile but are nervous. Suggested action, non-violent pacification. The robot dog said. His voice alarmed the clerics as they redirected their exorcism towards the Andromorph. Subjects are presenting now a threat level 1 danger to squad operational integrity, activating non-lethal countermeasures, the K-9 drone said as a hidden compartment at its back revealed to be a Taser gun. It shot a bolt of electricity to one of the clerics who was promptly shot down non-lethally by the electric rays. It then with lightning fast reflexes, fired its taser gun at the two remaining clerics who joined their incapacitated colleague on the wooden floor of the guild building. Potential threat pacified, the dog confirmed its actions. Samantha spat a minor disgust on that canine unit. It had several autonomous functions that when news got out into the public created controversy over the more potent features of the robot from the aforementioned taser gun facial recognition, an AI with a no-nonsense attitude against potential perpetrators and titanium teeth. It was George Orwell's nightmare made in metallurgic reality based on his warnings of his books of the dangers of such totalitarian measures. We got what we came for LT, let's get out of here, Crocker said. Was that all necessary? Samantha questioned. I wish I could apologize to you LT but you need to trust me on this one. In my experience. It pays to be forceful to people who perform terrorist attacks, don't fucking lecture me on Geneva Con this and human rights that. There is no choice here but power. Crocker grimly expanded as the two and their canine companion descended down the stairs. There is always another option sergeant. Samantha objected to Crocker's cynicism. Oh? What would you do? When lives are on the line LT. I have seen Islamists throw white phosphorus at a Disneyland. I seen separatist gun down loyalists like sheep on UN day. I saw suicide bombers toss themselves at delegations, people this. This grey order or whoever sent those marauders back in Ahaf cannot be negotiated with. Crocker argued back. That's because we just barged into their place and toss everything and everyone around like we already own it. For a start, Samantha fired back. These aren't our people, they look human smell and feel like a human but they aren't one of us planets fantastical bullshit maybe someone's own incessant writings on a keyboard they never knew what we do they only understand one thing strength now are we going to fuck around here or get the elf before our only chance of some resemblance of peace dies off in a cold hospital bed crocker reasoned n no, Samantha backed down, then what's our next objective? Crocker asked his superior. He still knows that she is still naive to her job. Find the elf. Now, Samantha said, the two exited the guild building where the rest of the squad was barely hanging on from an ongoing crowd of heckling townsfolk who overheard the commotion at the guild building. Up north, forest lands, Crocker told the squad. He then waved Aliathra's journal on top of their canine's nose who with its bloodhound protocol detecting the DNA from within the annals of paper it contained. Tracking, the canine informed DNA match, sent trail nearby. Enacting bloodhound protocol, the drone yipped as it began to dash off. Revving up their ATVs the squad followed the canine, moving away from the town. Strider group soon reached the edge of the forest where their ATVs easily penetrate the trees with terrifying speeds for a easy and such as Aris who was on board as a passenger with Cairn driving the vehicle. Hold on tight, Cairn warned. This horse is quite a fiery one love. Ah, Iris commented. Sometimes, the forest's vegetation became too thick so Crocker would quickly eject out of the ATV and with his exosuit did some heavy lifting to clear out the way from lifting off dead trees to uprooting lone freshly severed tree stumps. Thanks to his marvel of earthling engineering. 
He hardly broke a sweat. Come on, we got to go. Crocker yelled. That rainstorm is gonna hit us at 50 minutes Strider. You only got a short window before we lose our window. Captain Carplian radioed. It was now a race against time. Dash. Alia threw a collapse to fifth time again while in pursuit. Her legs cramped from overexertion at the extreme physical pacing she is going through, but she needed to keep running, she could hear the hateful shouts of the Cephide Liad and the encroaching barks of dogs who traipsed the landscapes with ease for they hand were of the local garrison's kennels, they were at their element here and there at the Cambervale forest where they spent many autumns hunting game animals for their master's nutrition. The warm dirt tainted her porcelain elven skin as she grinded and gnashed her teeth. Her body was at its breaking point. Only the faint trickling of the rainfall snapped her back to reality. She was in that green vegetated inferno, hungry, exhausted but most of all afraid. Aliathra's head was swarmed with so many questions, many of which that not even the most erudite of elven minds could formulate a coherent explanation. What is it like to be turned into a demon? Is she no longer herself? Am I lost and damned? All of these in her head rang like an everlasting bell that Elf's attention span was disabled. It was too late for her to notice her present as her unknowing foot took an ill-conceived step off an edge of a slope. No, Aliathra cried screaming as gravity did his cruel work. Her body slid down several meters on the rocky terrain tearing through the geological formation crudely as Aliathra shifted with strenuous effort to not crash through anything that could seriously injure her. She tumbled clumsily within a bumpy landing by the end of the slope on the ground with several bruises on her feet and one on her right forearm. She limped her way to a nearby rock to hide, with as much subtlety to her restoration magics as possible due magic always making some semblance of a sound. Alia throw exhaustingly applied first aid to her wounded limbs. She breathed a sigh of heavily needed relief as she felt the muscle pain soothed away. She collapsed on there. Her instincts kicked in soon afterwards. She knew that her pursuers would hear that. The elf unsheathed her bow and drew an arrow at the cliff's edge that she had fell over. She could hear their voices. Where is she? One voice yelled. Down there. She could hear Linda's voice. She saw the humanoid figures of several Slay Aegean militiamen walk to the edge of the cliff who scoured the ground above them. Aliathra held her breath, smelling the rainfall that began to grow ever more stronger as each moment passed and then she prayed, not to Nenith anymore but to any god or deity, holy or unholy that they don't spot her. Get around that quick, a voice from the back echoed. The militia soldiers turned around, not risking to take the obviously dangerous shortcut below them. With a moment of opportunity, Aliathra emerged out of her hiding place with a second wind. If she can make it to the edge of the Dwarven Mountain Clan's borders she should be safe. Dwarves weren't too involved with the elves as they tend to keep to themselves politically speaking outside of trade agreements with their humans. She could feign asylum there for a while until she could figure out her next move. But even that, Aliathra gave a second thought, where can she move to? Dwarves normally aren't the type of people accepting of immigrants and she would stand out like the tallest tree on Verkort's wood harvest. What if, the dwarves recognized her and heard the news that she might be some sort of demonic imposter? Running to the Black Tree Pact would be suicidal. They would instantly recognize the youngest princess of the Eth Island royal family and would kill her at best, imprison her at worst as a slave. The northern tribes beyond the boundaries of the dwarven clan holds were plausible, but surviving the frigid temperatures with her current clothes on her back were made any chances of finding sanctuary dim, and that's not overruling the possibility of her being forced into the harem of the one of the barbaric chieftains there like some toy to be used for breeding purposes. Then, to her own realizing horror, there was the UFAE themselves, the demons who corrupted her. Such a thought of her being now slowly turned to someone like that Vincent Diaz made her trembled. She saw what they did, what moral boundaries they would be willing to bypass in pursuit of their goals. Would they make her kill people for the sake of profits? Force her to be the sickening entertainment of their high masters? Would they force feed her more jalapeno peppers until her mouth melts? Her mind racing was interrupted again by the noise of a loud trumpet. 
No it sounded more of a hippogriff's mighty wings, practically naked and afraid, Aliathra hid again on a rock as she peeked over it. There was a large metal bird that glided or maybe it beat its wings so fast that the unaided eye perceives its wings to not look like its wings were flapping repeatedly to stay afloat. But then after some close observations she noticed upon a zoom with her eye a familiar group of symbols, the UFE, they are here now, Aliathra thought. Then she began to crack. Irrationality broke free as her brain began to open to broad expansions that she didn't know nor care were even possible. Did they know I was turned into one of them? Have their armies grown? Are they here to claim my soul? Then, just as her mind races with itself again, her instincts from her ears twitched. She could hear footsteps. They are now close to her. She needed to think fast. She couldn't handle so many of them in her state. Her eyes dart to a muddy puddle, it wasn't deep but it was soft and depressing enough that she can hide down there. She remembered her ranger training that camouflage and be improvised by covering oneself in mud when hiding in temperate or humid environments to evade foes. It was messy but it could save her life then and there. She dove down onto the mud, and quickly slathered herself with the mud until head to toe she is now covered. She took a deep breath expanding her diaphragm for maximum duration and held it as her pursuers descended onto the scene. They were oblivious to the unusual bump on the puddle behind them as their backs were turned. Aliathra rethink her escape options again. Maybe if she, after shaking of her pursuers, she can blend in as a normal human at the dwarven holds by painstakingly cutting off leaf-pointed ears with her knife, or being a concubine to a tribal chief isn't so bad anymore. Just then, the soldiers began to slowly move away from each other that there was a considerable distance between them that Aliathra can slip past unnoticed. Slowly rising from the mud, Aliathra tiptoed past the guards. She was fortunate that none of them were the Hound Masters earlier but a split-off group. She knew Lindis had to work with what she could levy up from the town guards and she was an excellent delegator. She was however, still exhausted from her ordeal that her self-awareness was still significantly hampered. Crack. The snap of a fallen branch that was so well hidden from the rainy soil betrayed her. Her heart sank as the Stlae Aegeans turned around. She's he. The Stlae Aegean pointed out before suddenly just as he shouted. His head exploded into a dispersion of organic matter and gore. Dash. Hit. Clay declared as he looked over his binoculars. He turned to a smugger bee die who with his rifle Leo found its mark on the most threatening tango closest to Aliathra. He was overlooking the patrol of Slay agent soldiers that Strider group overlooked. That was until they saw a figure rise from a muddy puddle and tried to slip away until the figure accidentally stepped on a twig of wood. He knew the figure was Aliathra thanks to their canine unit barking positively at that person. Open fire. Samantha ordered her men. Synchronizing their shots, Strider group picked their targets and shot them down with their guns. Visual confirmed on Aliathra. Samantha radioed to command. Good. Do everything in your power to bring her in alive. She is a priority. Polonsky said through the radio. Colonel. If I may ask, how will she cooperate with us? She wasn't so very fond of us and going to Kesselheim last time I saw her. What makes you think she will heal those poisoned? Samantha questioned. I have ways, but it won't work if those insurgents get to her first. Get to her ASAP, Polonsky ordered. The squad dashed past the Slay agent's corpses as their canine drone companion lead the way. As they pursued, Diaz felt a force of wind gush past his face. A soft thwack noise alarmed his ears as his eyes widened on an arrow's shaft that was mere inches away from hitting him on the head but instead landed on a tree. His brush with mortality made him nearly slip down as he scrambled for cover. She's shooting at us. Diaz yelled to his squad. The better. She's just slowing herself down. Crocker said. Everyone takes cover but keep moving swiftly. We can't let her get away. Samantha rallied moving through the trees with a sense of caution but a redoubled urgency. Strider group weaved their way closer to the elf who was only slowing herself down every time she took fire. 
Her aim was impressive albeit in her weakened state not good enough to be able to hit her intended marks of cutting down her pursuers as the ill-aimed arrows landed with close calls from a few inches off of her squad mates. Crocker's exosuit breastplate deflecting the arrow and even Obedia's sniper rifle Leah, who didn't take his second wife getting scratched that well when he saw a dent on the hull of his rifle's receiver, as Samantha can observe, for each shot that fired became more desperate. Like a prey being pursued via persistence hunting tactics, Eliathra was slowly losing the distance between them until she was finally cornered by Strider Group. There you are. We were looking for you but then you started to shoot at us, we need to, Samantha greeted before she was interrupted by the elf. What did you do to me? You, you, turned me, Aliathra shouted. She tried to reach into her quivers but soon found out to her horror that she was out of arrows. The elf grabbed her bow by the limbs and held them with her two hands like a sword in a desperate bid to fight off her so thought kidnappers. Did to you? We didn't do any. Samantha tried to reason with her but was interrupted again. You're lying. I know what you did to me. I felt your corruption seep through my heart. Hardening it. Now I am just like. Like. Him. Aliathra yelled as she pointed an accusing finger at Diaz. Oh shit, she knows, doesn't she? Diaz muttered. Now realizing what was Aliathra talking about, Samantha internally cursed herself. Getting her to cooperate is now officially the easier part of the mission. Now it is getting her to the Super Osprey that is going to be the challenge. The heart. The artificial here that they had used to save her life from that freak magical magnetic accident in her selfless effort to save a child from the roguish corpus trying to kidnap her and Iris. She had to personally rush in the elf to St. Luke's whilst the surgeons there attended to her. According to their words, Aliathra's heart looked like a well-done steak which was just a gallows humor way of saying that her natural heart was beyond repair of anything organic. Artificial in the other hand was readily available. Governor White had to pull some favors quickly in the background to secure a cybernetic heart for Aliathra in fear of any socio-political consequences of a missing elf who last traveled to the Sky People's City. You dare. You dare corrupt a priestess of Nenith? Aliathra shouted in hysterics. Samantha knew she was losing her, she needs her to get back to New Albany alive or Governor White and Prince Clovich is dead. In her people-to-people -people experience and learned knowledges from her college education, irrational people are often at that state to begin with by trying to, very desperately in their case fulfill a need. What do you want? We can help you, Samantha asked. She took a couple of steps forward, sheathing her rifle and holding her hands up to show she meant no harm to her. Don't come any closer. Aliathra raised her bow and shifted her aim at the lieutenant. I, I want my heart back. I. I can't have this. This thing inside me. Aliathra pointed to her chest and beated it hard with her right hand before resuming her threatening aim at Samantha's direction. The lieutenant would expect no less from your typical fantasy rebounds per game ranger of Aliathra's apparent expertise sides her excellencies as a cleric. She could be instantly taken a fatal shot to the head or her thighs could get punctured by Aliathra's bow if she made the elf snap. I cannot do that I am afraid. Your heart was fried, burnt to a crisp back in Kesselheim. There was no point saving it. We had to give you an artificial heart so that you can live. Samantha tries to reason. To live? How can I live when my heart is now of stone? Made not by the charitable hands of a caring mother goddess but by what? Some honey mouth drug who mocks the very gift of life and put a price on it for selfish gain? Never. Aliathra defied. It's no use. She's gone mad. Abedia whispered in the background. Blame the comet prophecies made by those pompous cocks at the college. Iris mentions, you seem to hate them. What did they ever do to you? Ken asked. I rather not talk about it but I can say Devika weren't the first people to try and burn my house down. Iris shot down, paying no heed to hear squad mates ramblings. Lieutenant Rose continues to press forward with her reasoning skills, but even then, She's starting to feel doubt that this scenario will end badly. Miss Aliathra, please listen to me. We gave you that heart for free. No pay, no deals. Governor White even personally paid for the heart transplant from his own pocket. I mean, 
purse. Yeah. To save you, Samantha reasoned, to save me for corruption. You are here to claim me, but no, you will not take me so easily. I will take as many of you with me back to the seven hells from whence you came just like your demon Lord White. By now he should be vanquished from the hands of the Empire's greatest assassins in Sainagrad we have sent to Tyrian. Whence he is banished, you will scatter like dust in the wind. Aliathra boasted. Her very flowing and well-groomed hair was now loosening up to a jumbled mess of stray hair falling across her face in a complimentary display of her psychotic state. Wait. Hang the fuck a minute. Vanquished and sending assassins to Tyrian. Don't tell me that. Crocker's clenched his fist angered at the realization of Aliathra's confession. I was the one who found out your demon lord's identity for the Grey Order to kill so your otherworldly invasion will be stopped and with you banished from Gleesia. It seems that by risking myself being corrupted when I came to New Albany and cast it off to the void in Kessaheim I found your weakness. There is nothing you can do to stop us from banishing you back to hell where you demons belong. Aliathra taunted. Crocker's boiling hot pot of anger from the natives' blatant terrorist attack had the contrasting ingredient of amusement, the type of amusement one would feel when seeing something like a monkey learning how to finger paint for the first time or when one sees a crazed homeless man in the street preach some insane ramblings to the silent scorn of passers-by. He couldn't really figure out what he should be feeling. Checking on to his fellow squad mates, he could see Diaz puffing up his cheeks in a bid to hold his laughter whilst in contrast Cairn's face was of capriciousness in the likes of a university professor shutting down a student's poor choices of logic. Clay, Abidia and Iris at the other hand had their faces frozen in a limbo of not knowing what or how to react to that information. But the common denominator that the squad all shared is just the ridicule how dramatically wrong Aliathra's conclusions were. For Iris, it was ironic for her that a creature of darkness would be more enlightened than an enlightened one like Aliathra. Iris knew from her entire time in service to the youth that they were nothing but living saints to her and the people of Tyrian, providing them multitudes of new things, ideas and concepts that made even the lowliest person to the highest of nobles stand up together. What did the elves and the empire had brought? Levies, wars, death, and taxes. They don't care about their subjects, but the youth do. Of all we have been through Aliantra, you still see us these demons even after we showed you our world, tell me, what demonic thing that we have done to make us like them? Samantha asked her, you fight without honor, your presence alone unease the winds, you terrify all those who stand against you, you even dare bring golems like Vansant over there, look at him head to toe in metal with no signs of life yet he calls himself alive. How very funny and witty. For a clear demon to boats to a devotee of Nenith, Aliathra pointed. Oh yeah, right a demon. Me. Of course I am. Diaz scoffed it off before stepping forward. Get back in line soldier, let me handle this. Samantha said. You can't talk for shit with some cray cray lieutenant. I am no stranger to Mexican standoffs. Let me handle her. Diaz reassured her. I can just end it all right here and there. I can paralyze her with one of my spells. Iris whispered. No. You won't. She might hurt you with her holy magics or whatever she got. Ken interrupted her out of concern. Oh. You can be such a knight in shining armor to me Cairn but I can handle this one. Iris stopped him before she prepared a magical spell on her hands. Overhearing the dialogue with her sensitive ears, Aliathra drew her bow further, ready to pierce all or at least most of the demons with her. She was ready to die fighting for she had nowhere else to go but north to the more primal regions of Sainigrad. Say K Snow White. If this self didn't learn jack shit from what kind of shit you gotta see in Kesselheim then I pray to God Almighty you did. Let dot me dot handle dot this. Her spells will hurt you but not us. Diaz emphasized as he stepped forward from Samantha's back as he positioned himself between Samantha and Aliathra's tense drawing stance. You want to fight a demon elfie baby? Well here I am. Fully casted metal demon for your eyes only. Diaz opened his arms wide boisterously. Is this some sort of trick? Aliathra gnashed her teeth at Diaz's display. Trick? More like a deal. 
Us demons like making them a mirite? Diaz proposed with the fakest smile he could muster. What kind? Aliathra, with not much options but death or dishonor listened in when someone like her, a cleric devoted to Nanith and a princess of the virtuous Lytha family would normally shoot down a contract with a demon with much disgust. A duel, me and you, one on one, nobody else. You win by smiting me back to the seven hells and my friends will follow me and you can go free. Lose in the other hand, and you will become my. M. Soul bounded. Ah. Uh, slave. Ah. Uh, peon thrall thing. Girl toy. Maybe. I got a thing for blondes anyways. Diaz challenged. Ha. Huh, I accept. Aliathra nodded. Eagalad Maxima. The elf conjured her arrows into a brilliant light breaming with holy energies that made Iris who was in the back sweating in fear. It was an anathema to a vampire like her, but she still held on to the reassurance of the youth that they do not fear the magic that people like her and Daliathra can call forth. Begone. Aliathra roared as she fired the holy arrow at Diaz. His demeanor focused. Diaz activated his rapid movement boosters and caught the arrow in midair from five meters away. It was an impressive display of Apara Corporation's technological prowess in engineering. The magical arrow crumbled as Diaz clenched the court shaft as it faded to dust from his hands. Was that best you can do? Diaz smugly smiled. He made it visibly clear to the elf that he was in no way shape or form that he was being physically harmed by the magically enhanced arrow. Oh I can do much more. Aliathra answered. She sheathed her bow and raised her hands up to the sky and rallied her faith in the gods. Smite undead, she cried. A beam of light descended from the dark sky that was slowly beginning to make rain fall as the light shone on Diaz illuminating him in a blinding light. The rest of Strider gasps as they covered their eyes. When the light faded away, Diaz still remained standing, but now his legs were loosened with his left leg forward in a tiptoe whilst his right foot was bended over. Then the most ridiculous moment happened, Diaz began to thrust his hips and dance, playfully kicking and turning around whilst seductively thrusting his hip to the beat. It kind of reminded Samantha of the famous pop star Michael Jackson, albeit, Vincent. Despite his physical augmentations to his legs does a rather crude moonwalk in comparison to the old music videos she had seen of the proclaimed king of pop. She was more like a Galadriel, the elven queen, from that Lord of the Rings movie scene. Tilda Diaz began to sing in a mocking tone directed at Aliathra. It got to say the least upon everyone else in that forest beyond any reasonable thought of the realms of confusion. She said her name was Aliathra and she reminds me of Billie Jean, cause she always calls a scene, and I say I am the one apostrophe. Tilda Diaz continued to sing. What are you doing? What the hell are you doing? Samantha asked, her pulse rising at Diaz's cavalier action. The art of confusion my dear. Diaz smiled back before turning back to the elf. We now dance on this floor this round, cause this elf doesn't know what's coming abound. Tilda he sang and danced to the steps of Billie Jean. Retaining her focus, Aliathra decided to conjure another spell. I exorcise you, Aliathra said as a rune of light erupted from Diaz's feet as he continued to dance and sing without feeling any sort of discomfort or concern. And my fellow demons always reminded me what to do, be ready to steal ungrateful girls' hearts. Tilda Diaz mocked Aliathra's predicament yet again. The elf, now tearing up at his breaking words, was now at the brink of a total mana exhaustion as her magical energies were being vented out by her holy spells which were some of the most consuming spells one can cast from the restoration school. But she had one card left on her hand, a spell she saves for the most desperate of measures. Face my greatest spell, Radiant Drain. Aliathra gathered her last of her reserves and cast it at Diaz. Diaz felt a gripping force grab him but it felt like seamless smoke to him as he spun around to Aliathra. Despair filled the elf as she pulled out her knife in a last ditch attempt to defend herself. Stand back. I will kill you with my bare hands. Aliathra cried. Tears fell from her eyes. But Diaz was too quick on his rapid movement boosters. He dashed towards Aliathra whilst still in his absent world of music and quickly disarmed her but not before cradling her forward like lover in the end of a long tango. 
Aliathra, known as Billie Jean knows I am the one and oh I won. Diaz mockingly declared his victory. Defeated, exhausted and mentally broken beyond belief and sanity, Aliathra loosened her muscles. Do it quickly. Have all of your dozens of fellow demons have their way with me now. Aliathra yielded. Dozens of us? But it's just the seven of us. Diaz broke out of his playful tune to be caught in himself a moment of confusion. There you are demon scum. A feminine voice erupted from the forest as dozens of slay agent militia men at arms and elven sapphire liad agents surrounded strider group, hand over the girl and dot by the gods. The demons are in league with the vampires too. A woman with brunette hair pointed her magical staff at them. That's not happening. Samantha answered. Iris, what are those people over there? Look like elves to me but they look special. Clay pointed. They are the Eth Island sapphire liad. A group of spies, agents and mages who perform subterfuge in the name of King Islanidal Ether of the Eth Island Elves. They must be here for us I am sure. They always have their knife ears everywhere. Iris explained. From what faint energy she had left, Aliathra saw to her horror and relief that her old friend Lindis was standing strongly and proudly before her right now. If circumstances were different. She would have retreated on her back but then she remembered why Lindis was there. For her head. Hand over the elf, that disgusting creature over there and surrender yourselves by the name of both the Slay Aegean Empire and the Ethuel Nantant. Lindis demanded. Oh that's not very nice. It's just an Australian. Diaz comedically tried to remove the tension but to no avail as the Sephide Liad agents aim their weapons at Strider. Fine. I give up. Diaz raised his hands in surrender. Suckers. Diaz quick draw Ruina from his pockets and snapshot to slay each and militia man. Weapons hot. Samantha ordered. Strider group drew their weapons and fired back at the interlopers as they fumbled for cover in the Cambervale forest. Protect the asset at all costs. Crocker yelled. I got four tangos on a three o'clock. Can't get a shot. Clay yelled. Got it. Got it. Firing. A bead I acknowledged. Samantha dove down to the floor as she crawled frantically to a tree stump as arrows, bolts and magical missiles whizzed past her. Command this is Strider Group. We got the package but we are currently engaged by natives who are trying to retrieve the package for themselves. Samantha radioed in. Affirmative Lieutenant. Get your team to extraction now. Colonel Polonsky ordered. You got to make it quick. The storm is going to make it impossible to fly around safely at this weather and I am about to reach bingo fuel. You got three minutes to get to the extraction point. Relaying it to you know. Captain Carplian radioed in. Samantha checked her squad who were now all looking towards her for orders. Their eyes stared at her soul now counting on her to get them out of this hairy situation. Diaz was safely tucking away Aliathra behind a tree whilst the rest of her squad were pinned down or laying their head low on what meager grass that could culver their heads. Throw smoke and suppressing fire. Samantha ordered. Get ready to run Iris. Ken told the vampire witch as he pulled out a smoke grenade and unpinned the canister before throwing it at the direction where there was the most amount of opposition firing away at them. Suppressing Crocker roared as he unleashed a hailstorm of bullets from his machine gun. Go! Clay yelled as Strider Group emerged from cover and bailed out of there. Lindis meanwhile was undeterred by the strange magics of the otherworlders. Despite seeing firsthand her men being cut down by the demon's weapons, her resolve remained intact. Stoically, she ordered everyone to give chase. The smoke grenade that erupted in front of her did well in slowing them down as even she stumbled once on the confusing air that the other world has casted upon her. Strider group ran through the forest to the edge where a clearing large enough for Captain Carpley and Superos Pre can extract them. Firing back further impede their pursuers. Angered that failure, a number one concept that a Cephid Liad is not known for. Lindis Reddit ordered her mages to impede their prey back using the forest terrain to their advantage. Cast thunder wave on the trees. Don't let them escape, Lindis ordered. The mages refocused their staffs and aimed at the trees closest to stride a group and fired away a thunderous force that disrupted the physical equilibrium of the material world so greatly that the trees began to detach themselves like a head decapitated from an axis blade, falling down chaotically at the squad. They know that if they don't stop them now, 
the giant iron dragon in the sky will fly them out of there beyond their reach. One such tree the mages shot down in particular and of a very thick build, fell upon Diaz who was dragging Aliathro by the arm. No, shit. Diaz cried as the tree fell on Aliathro pinning her legs and crashing the elf to the ground. Ah, Aliathro screamed as her legs were crushed by the heavy weight of the fallen tree trunk. Diaz tried to lift up the tree but he wasn't strong enough alone to free the elf as she desperately tried to claw her way free. Guys, help. Diaz yelled. The rest of Strider group turned around. A few dozen meters away from the sanctuary of Carpley and Super Osprey ramp to run back to their comrade and the priority asset. Crocker and Ken helped Diaz lift up the log whilst Clay reached out to Aliathra's arms readying to pull her up. Meanwhile, Samantha, Abidia and Iris Cover held their ground against the approaching tide of antagonistic natives, with Samantha being able to land a rifle bullet in her perspective. A clear headshot to the brunette-haired leader of the Cephid Liad at her right eye. She saw her hit the floor clutching her wound and with some reassurance that that elven spy agent of whatever stays that way. She's out. Let's go. Crocker tapped Samantha on the shoulder. Clay was now carrying the wounded elf who on accounts to Diaz and Crocker, were observed that her legs were absolutely crushed with some bones sticking out and torn muscle dangling aimlessly in the wind. She needed first aid quick. Hurry, I need go now. Carpley and radioed in. Strider painstakingly in all of their present roster plus their canine companion who assisted them in that mission boarded the Super Osprey just as it was about to take off. One of the Slay Asian militia soldiers tried to grab on the ramp as it closes but his fingers were crushed and severed by the hydraulic presses of the ramp as he fell 50 feet to his death leaving their pursuers left into the dust and now brewed up storm that on schedule barraged them with rain and gale winds. Extraction successful. Isaac spoke through the canine drone speaker. It. That. Dog. Kantar. Aliathra eyes stared at the robot dot before she began to shook violently as her body was laid to the medical stretcher that the Super Osprey had in case of injury. Subject is going into shock. First aid must be applied immediately. The dog turned to the elf. Damn it we are losing her. Get me disinfectant, splints and a bandage now. Crocker roared. One of the door gunners of Carpley and Super Osprey nodded and ran towards the first aid kit and grabbed what Crocker ordered before quickly running back with them. Crocker frantically applied the medical items on Aliathra's legs whilst Samantha, with her flashlight checked her eyes out to make sure she was staying conscious. Hey! Don't go out on us. We can fix you. Samantha reassured the elf as Aliathra began to fade out from blood loss. Damage report. Subject's injuries are too extreme to be treated with casting bandages. Unidentified substance detected in the subject's wounds. Calculating antibiotic success rate. 1.0047%. The canine announced in Isaac's voice. What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Crocker demanded the canine for something that could give the elf a chance for survival. Highest chance of subject's recovery. Amputation. Isaac said coldly. No way. Abidia said. Haven't she suffered enough under those knives of yours? Iris objected. We have no choice. Abidia. Get your knife out. Crocker. Hold her legs still. Samantha ordered. God forgive me. God forgive us all. Abidar pulled his knife out. Large bowie knife that he uses to skin animals that he hunts but never had it tasted the blood and flesh of a human. Or humanoid in the case of Aliathra, being. He rested the sharp edge of the knife Aliathra's right leg readying himself for the painful scene as Samantha placed the splint of wood on the elf's mouth. As sedatives were handed out to her and Crocker in order to save the elf's life. Here goes, Abidia reluctantly said as he began to saw through the marred legs of the only hope for peace between the youth and Gleezia. Dash. Aliathra violently rose from the bed she laid on only to be yanked down by a bindings that pinned her hands on the bed's edge. She tried to writhe her way out but to her horror she felt an airy sensation on her legs or the sensation of nothingness. She tried to bend her knees but her body didn't respond appropriately to the command. You filthy demons, is this your idea of torture? Tying me down on this bed? Aliathra screamed. 
Her room was white and unremarkable save for a door with a small window that had light shone past it. The truth is between you and me, I am no fan of torture. Never was and I didn't even have a say in having you like this. A voice answered. Show yourself, the elf demanded. The door creaked open as a lone figure walked out of it. It was the familiar soft motherly or in some accounts big sisterly and kind face of Dr. Lee Hainwell. Hello again nearly Aethra. The doctor said, no. You're just in some sort of disguise. You can't be real. Nothing is real. I can't be real. Aliathra teared up. Her mental defenses of rationality were all demolished. The humiliation from Diaz. The ostracization from her fellow elves and allies and the fact that Lindis will most likely inform her family that she has been devoured by the seven hells and her image has been made form by one of the demons who now walks the northern parts of the Cambervale Valley. No, it's me again. I wish I can come here and give you a pat to the head but the major told me you are dangerous. The Korean descended woman explained. I am no longer a danger anymore. My mana all run out and now you took my soul here. In the seven hells, I, I was expecting screaming. A symphony. A vagony. But, there's only silence. Aliathra said. Oh dear, oh my, your poor girl. The doctor couldn't help her mandated restraint anymore. Against her orders not to physically handle the elf she walked up to her at her bed and gently caress her messy blonde hair. The doctor's strokes held a fostering sensation to Aliathra that relieved her stress and tension. Doctor, I told you are not to physically interact with the prisoner, a booming voice echoed. Out of the open, it was none other than Major Relias Holyfield walking inside the room. He was in a standard military undershirt and pants as he begrudgingly folded his arms together at the unplanned scene before him. After Strider Group brought back to base Alekulus Aliathra, the Major had a fitful of disciplinarian shouts at the squad before he was calmed down by the collected reasonings of Colonel Polonsky, after a quick bite from Iris' special blood memory trick and was given the full context of the elf's complete and uncensored background he and Dr. Lee Hainanol devised a carefully well thought off plan to secure her loyalty but thanks to the good doctor's religious dogmatism to the Hippocratic Oath. The plan went off the rails, and he was so looking forward showing the elf as use missiles intimidating powers. Major, please this requires a soft-handed approach. Besides, we are dealing with royalty after all. Hainal told him back. You. No. I. Aliathra began to panic as she tried to shake her hips out to free her from her restraints. The Lathar bloodline was a carefully plotted out eugenics bloodline between some of the greatest minds and the most potent of magical users the world had ever seen. Political marriages between the family were all screened for any impurities and anomalies of family lines to create the best possible offspring for every generation. If the demons have her, they could exploit her God-given bloodline for their own nefarious ends. No, don't. Turn me. Into. One of you, Aliathra screamed. Now look at what you done major. Calm down please Miss Letha we are only here to. The doctor attempted to restrain her but the elf shook violently. You corrupted me. Through my heart. I am turning into a demon now. She cried. So. You're a demon now huh Miss Letha? So that means you're evil? Well then. Holyfield now thought out of a new improvised plan. He went to the bed and untied the bindings on the elf's arms. Immediately after her restraints were removed, Aelie threw attempts to claw the major but he swiftly backs away before he could scratch her. In desperate anger for the very battle of her soul, she climbs out of the bed ready to fight him with her bare fist and not give the dark-skinned man the satisfaction of a helpless cattle for the demon to have his way with. But as her body left the boundaries of the bed, she fell down carelessly to the cold white floor. Why? Can't I stand you? you, you? Aliathra questioned only to turn around her body to see that in her horror that her legs were absent with only the traces of bloodied bandages that filled the void of where her legs were supposed to be. What did you do to me? Aliathra crawled towards the major but due to her disabled state. Holyfield can just outpace the elf by walking alone. Seeing that giving chase to the man was futile, 
The elf lay her face on the floor and placed her hands on her eyes as she began to sob. Holyfield now got the elf where he wanted her, broken and now looking for a ray of hope, a way out, just looking for some way to not end up like this forever, plus taking into account the elves' exorbitant lifespans. But as he approached the elf, he noticed the pale and worrisome face of Dr. Lee Hainanel who stared at the Major with her arm and eyes. They hang between the thread of hope of a humane ending and the despondent possibility of a cruel conclusion to this ordeal. They know that this elf is their only hope for a chance of peace. And it now felt to him how the peace it was achieved. In his entire long career, the Major was infamous for his cruelty his callousness in the face of repression and hardened heart but to see the results of his display of intimidation first hand in a whole different angle of an alien being who shared no political, economic or social links to the myriad strifes the youth juggle, and consequently he also too, every day made him stop. He recalled his colleague in this assignment, Colonel Polonsky, imploring him that he has to learn when to deviate from his usual methods for the sake of the integrity of the colony's survival which was his mandate through and through and he swore an honor to the death. Polonsky. You are right on this one. Holyfield murmured as a CCTV camera which so happens to be observing the room connected to Colonel Polonsky's command terminal was having a live view of the event being transpired at that moment. Elias picked up his tablet and saw a video of a demonstration of the Zeus missiles he was planning to threaten use on Eliathra's nation of Alphalnora if she doesn't comply. He pressed the trash can icon next to the video deleting off the face of the tablet's data storage. Instead, he switched to another video instead, one he keeps for sentimental purposes. He played it and sat down on the floor showing the video near Eliathra's cradled and tangled head. Surprise! The voice of a holy field roared causing the elf to recoil at the sudden spike of volume that erupted on her ears. She saw the video and noticed that there were people moving on it. All were screaming as their eyes fixated on the strange vision that she was presented. She shuddered as the elf heard the people scream but as she was about to cower again with her still attached arms another voice echoed from the magic mirror. Oh baby, I missed you so much, a rather hoarse feminine voice said. That sentence confused the elf, people screaming shouldn't be saying I miss you. She turned her eyes back into the screen of the magic mirror and saw that arms were erupted upon the edges of the screen as it began to warmly embrace the various dark skinned figures who were all gathered up in what she can describe as a very warm filled hearth. You are back, I can't believe you are here honey. A tall and curvy woman with dreadlocks approached the screen and was embraced by the arms near the edges of the screen. What is with the GoPro cousin? Another man of an obese build and similar skin tone approached the man. I'ma keep all of this when I get back to work. I pulled a lot of favors just so I can see you guys for Christmas today. And only today, Holyfield's voice said. Eliathra concluded that the man recording this memory was Holyfield himself who she saw was softly smiling at the memories being displayed before them. You're only here for one day dad? A small boy in the video approached Holyfield. Just for my family. All of you. Holyfield said. So, Eliathra of House Lytha, you have family, right? A brother. An older sister and your parents? Holyfield turned to her. Yes. I would do everything to be with them again. I feel so alone. What sin did I do to deserve this? My heart, my legs, my mind? Eliathra asked. Nothing, my dear. You didn't do anything wrong. Or at least not in the worst of senses, Dr. Lee Hainanol said. What happened? Do you? have to power to turn me back? Purify my soul? Eliathra begged. A ray of hope sparked within her. This choice is up to you Miss Eliathra. I will ask you first a question. Were you involved in any way to the attack in Tyrian? The one using the poison? Holyfield asked. The demon bane flower? Yes. I was told there were casualties. I, you, Want me to cure it? Eliathra asked. Yes. You see several of the people afflicted with the poison are deeply involved in a peace and friendship agreement. 
We only want to be left in peace and live together with you Gleasons at no cost to anything unless you want it to be. Land for gold, land for technology, land for security. We the United Federation of Earth can do so many things for you. All you have to say is, yes, just, please, make me whole again. I want peace. It is all we elves ever really want. Aliathra gave in. That's what I like to hear. Doctor, proceed with the surgery. The Major turned to Hainuel. Surgery? Am I going to be getting my heart back? Aliathra asked. Oh no. I just want you to be up on your feet by the time you leave this room. You have a lot of work ahead of you if you want to purify your soul. Holyfield stood up as he brushed off his clothes as he made a gesture to leave. But I have no legs. Aliathra stated the obvious. Exactly. Here, Holyfield said as a team of doctors rushed inside the room carrying a toolkit filled with surgery items and machinery. You will get a new pair of legs my dear. We were quite lucky to get these prosthetic legs of your exact skin color. Although, your feet won't be exactly the same anymore. Dr. Lee Hainanel presented Aliathra's new pair of legs as the elf princess was carried gently back to her now being hastily sterilized bed in preparation for her surgery. They were indeed the same exact skin color of her porcelain white skin but what betrayed its artificial nature was the foot. It was made by obsidian metal that was curved with a hook and split on the end like a lizard's tongue, made from a diamond and titanium alloy. The good news at least for you is that you don't have to worry about remembering to clip your toenails or have crazy boys ask for your feet pics online. Yeesh, Dr. Lee Hainanel explained, will I be okay with being with you demon people? Aliathra asked the doctor. Her childlike instincts retreated to the doctor for shelter. No, we are not dead. Yes, you will be safe with us. Now, inhale and sleep. This will take a while to get these legs of your attached, the kind doctor reassured as she placed a transparent mask over the elf's nose and mouth. The anesthesia was administered as the drugs entered into the elf's body. Her last conscious thoughts were divided between the fate of her soul will be like after she wakes up and what is happening to her family back home. Chapter 25 Operation Bakumatsu Part 1 Under direct supervision by an escort of youth marines and Dr. Lee Hainwell, Aliathra worked tirelessly to remedy the poison that was afflicted by the dozens of people who were ailing by the demon's bane flower. She didn't say a word for the entirety of her time in the medical ward despite many of the people who were no suddenly relieved off of their sickness felt their strength return to them. The curing process as they could describe was that the elf would conjure a magical green bubble on her hands and holding the bubble close to the patient where the patient will involuntarily start to feel the motion to reach out. The disgusting refuse would be magnetically collected by the bubble before one of the escorting soldiers accompanying Aliathra would properly dispose of it at an infectious waste labeled waste bin. Rinse and repeat. The demon's bin was ungracefully purged out of the bodies of the afflicted one by one. Each patient took about five minutes to be properly cured off of the poison. The good doctor couldn't tell if Aliathra was still undergoing some post-traumatic silence from her previous ordeals. She read the report and she couldn't help but want to just give the poor girl a hug. It was a shame in her eyes to see such a beautiful woman, blonde waving hair and blue eyes could tonically save the afflicted people from the poison attack without so much as a word from her. She was like a robot as if the metallic heart and her new ski legged like prosthetic legs that she is having some trouble standing upright without the sign of wobbling, but then again for the latter, it was normal for first timers. Among the recently cured were the first two individuals who were rescued from their brush of mortality, Governor Jeremy White and Prince Clovich Tyrian being attended by their own retinue of bodyguards. I have never seen a priestess of Nenya before, and I never knew they were so beautiful, Prince Clovich commented as Aliathra made her rounds on the hospital beds. I don't know, she isn't very friendly looking. I mean she isn't even blinking. White gave his piece on the elves' uncanny demeanor. Elves, if what I was tutored is correct, are either working with close relations with Emperor Alden as diplomats or as Grey Order members. They are very proud of themselves. Clovich explained. Let me guess. They're rich. 
Lots of magic, and are really old when they all look pretty young? The governor answered with a question. Indeed. But to tell you the truth, I do not know how will they react to you. It seems that the elf has seemed to be quite afraid. She must have gone through so many of your nights, seen your great black flying ships and your means of magic. It is all still new to me but, I am enjoying what you bring to us. For Tyrian Clovich humbly thanked, the governor let out an amused smile. It was like the smile a farmer made when his labor bore fruit. This reminded me you know prince, of a story. This happened a long time ago. There was a kingdom that used to be isolated from the world but then another nation who was hungering for fame, power, and hegemony sailed his black ship to the isolated nation's harbor. The king of that isolated nation was scared and he tried to fire his arrow at the black ship but it only angered the pride of the black ship's home country. He returned with several more of these black ships and demanded that if he doesn't apologize and open his doors to black ship's nation, the black ships would enact revenge for its slighted ego, the king of that isolated nation. Despite protests from his attendants, chose dishonor over death for he had not the power to defy their will. White began to tell this story. This happened to you? Your world? Clovich leaned to his right to hear Jeremy's words closely and clearer. Happened in a place in my world. Japan is the name of the isolated kingdom and the nation that opened her doors to the world was called the United States. Americans, at the time, the Americans as we, for I am a descendant of were finding their place in the sun, we were prideful and a strong people. The story goes when the Americans came to Japan, they showed the king of Japan about the outside world, we taught them the ideas of great smiths who have the skill of one thousand blacksmiths working tireless day and night. Great machines that ran faster than the fastest of horses and finally a realm of possibilities that whetted the king and his nation's appetite for more. The king who we call Meiji went to work sending out his best servants to all the four corners of my home world to learn more of these strange new powers and how to harness them for themselves. And if there's one thing I know about kings is that they always seek more. Jeremy continued the story. He knew he was editing some of the finer historic details of Japan's Meiji restoration period since he drew mentally in his head parallels between the historical Japanese emperor who modernized his archipelago country into one of the most advanced nations on earth within a fraction of the time it would take for everyone else in the world to develop into such an extent. This King Meiji. He did it so he can be at equal with his peers, he must be very wise ruler to accomplish what you said and I, Clovich began to lower his once rather authoritative voice to a more modest toned pitch. You humble me, governor, you may not be of noble blood nor you have the luxury of thousands of years of wisdom but you speak like you have both. This King Meiji, I want to achieve what he did. I, I wish to build up Tyrian like how Meiji had built his. Clovich admitted, are you telling me you want us to be able to help uplift you? White asked. Uplift? Clovich twitched his eyebrow. As in teaching you how we build our buildings, power our machines and all the things that you see here that makes it all possible to be able to see what you see all here, in New Albany. White explained. The Gleesian prince nodded yes, affirming the governor's assumptions. Yet behind White's faked surprise face, there was a fulfilled ulterior accomplishment that rang sweetly inside him. Peace was still indeed possible despite what had transpired earlier, but then the governor remembered what had transpired earlier. But, aren't you a vassal? For the Splaegians? I don't think they would let this go that you suddenly gaining so much of our power that, your master might feel, threatened to say the least. The governor tried to temper the prince's eagerness with some grounded real politic. My cousins might say otherwise, you see. After some time that Tyrian was subjugated by the Slaegians, my ancestor, Aragon sealed the conquest of the entire land I rule now by marrying a tribal princess from the conquered people. Aragon came from a very sunny region in the empire called Suville. It is a duchy ruled by a man who shares my blood by the name of the Bald the Eighth. His entire duchy is one of the empire's largest wheat fields in their entire nation. 
He had told me through letters that there were times and places where droughts would happen or pirate attacks as reported by the sailors from Suville's ports. Clovich informed, something we can help with, White asked. My cousin wrote to me that he was getting pirate attacks, famines, and monster raids lately to name a few. How close are you to your cousin? Well last time I saw my cousin in person was when he was attending Arya's birthday a year ago and he gifted her a dress from one of the finest tailors from Suville. There was also this one time he asked me to send some food stocks over to him due to drought and this other time he wanted to rent out this group of orc rider mercenaries that would take jobs for me around Tyrion, but then again, according to the records we were both amicable with one another. I see. Well, is there any other people that can help vouch for us that you trust? The governor pressed. Well the mercenaries and their kinsmen I mentioned earlier can be a start. Then there is Luther Amirian's old dwarf and friends back from his homelands at the clan hold by the mountains up north and then there is. But keep this between you and me and don't tell Iris about this but also some more of the vampires by the abandoned looking fortress near Cambervale. But they don't like being near the dumb sheep according to her. Maybe you can see to it? I heard that the vampires are just as skilled in magic as Aris and the Orsish mercenaries can be very useful to you. Plus Luna's friends are said to hold influence in the dwarven holdings. Clovich said. Oh, I will most definitely see to all of it. White nodded. But little did the prince knew is that his conversation was bugged thanks to some rather simple subterfuge of a spy pen on one of Governor White's bodyguards. Dash at the same time in another room, Dash, that is a lot of leads to follow through. Holyfield commented. Indeed, it is. Well, it looks like we got some squads to dispatch out and see through these. Where do you think we should send Strider GR? Polonsky was cut off by his hardlining counterpart. Just because I went soft with the elf doesn't mean I will do so again. That was an exception. A rare case of me showing mercy Colonel. We still have the slay agents to worry about. Holyfield says. What are we going to do? Polonsky asked. Remember when the governor talked about the Meiji restoration? You know how all that shit started right Colonel? Holyfield asked. American merchant ship sails too close to the Japanese coast and gets fired at. America in response sends a ship to ask for an apology and to force open the door of the country to the rest of the world and gives a year for a response. Then, the Major interrupted him. You see where this is going now? Send in the ships I tell you. Holyfield coldly says, we might as well play in right into the hands of those who think we are the bad guys Major. Your actions during that excavation site were barely covered up in their perspective. Then there's the whole incident by that tunnel and don't get me started on what happened after that chemical attack. It was too harsh even by your standards. Random door-to-door -door searches, strip searching, even arresting Mr. Flynn from the Grey Order building under the assumption that he may have something to do with several of those guilds members participating in the half attacks without so much as a knock. He is still crying about it right now and he won't stop until you pay for his door that you so unceremoniously broke to splinters. Polonsky argued, they aren't earthlings colonel. We are in a hostile world and I still have second thoughts on who could we even remotely place our few cents of trust on. Clovich is still yet to truly prove himself to me at least despite the governor's coercions and the empire is in suspect suspicious about us being some sort of mythological invasion of demons. It's only a matter of time before the whole continent is in the tune of the whole demon narrative against us. So, Colonel. What do we suppose we should do instead? Holyfield asked. Gain legitimacy, Polonsky answered. I am sorry, what did you say? Make the natives accept us, our sovereignty and our supremacy, Polonsky added in his answer. I can think of three ways, through rational legitimacy where we act in the good interests of the natives that they see us as people to be friends with and not as enemies ergo demons. The second method is through some charismatic legitimacy by strengthening our image through wealth, technology, and power. Finally, the third method which is possibly the least palatable for us but is also guaranteed to produce the least amount of friction amongst the natives is the traditional legitimacy. This means cultural integration in our part with the natives, Polonsky explained. 
There was a tone down on the colonel's pitch when he was mentioning the charismatic method of the obtainment of legitimacy. You know there's a lot of things I find unpleasant with them, right? Holyfield raised his hand. First, slavery exists in one form or another and I hate to have unk at my ass again. Second is the whole polytheistic pantheon that a good chunk of us don't believe in and God bless me on that. Lastly, we don't know much of jack shit of this whole planet outside of these Tyriani people. Which is why we send out the studies and observations men we got. If we can produce supporters like Iris, Mr. Flynn, Lulia Amirian, and Prince Clovich on our side then we can use how the good old books call it, social network theory to get more connections that we can exploit. You heard what the prince said. We got ourselves at least four leads, his cousin in Souville, Iris other vampires. I can't believe I just said that. The dwarves up north that are friends with Luna Amirian and lastly a group of orcs that Clovich hires as mercenaries. Once we are done, we can expand our alliances from there until we reach a critical mass that not even the Empire could break, Polonsky said. The Major paused in to absorb it. In a way, he can agree with the social networking methods as proposed by his soft-handed colleague but he still doubts that good work of mouth alone can sway any threats the colony has to the elements and factors surrounding its existence. What about your charismatic approach? You sound a bit quieter than usual talking about it. Is there something you don't tell? It involves inviting more of those megacorps here. Trust me on this one but I would rather handle one bratty megacorpo whining at me than even a number more than one can. Reason, why I said that it could be an option, is that it's the most convenient as we just need to do some nods and yes yeses and they will act for us in our stead. The problem is, well, you see in the news of corpos killing each other gangland style right? Prime Minister Bowsky been trying to put a limit to those megacorpos for the past five years. Our deals with the Paro Corp was just an alliance of convenience at best, a deal with the devil at worst. I would rather have them throwing their money all over the place than anyone else, Polonsky explained. Then why not just give a Paro Corp more exclusive shit or whatever those suits call it? Holyfield asked. The other corpos will soon find out that Aparo is going to get his hands on a whole damn planet and I, knowing them will see it as a move for power and they might do some crazy shit to undermine him or worse, set up shop under our noses in some place we can't reach. Prime Minister Bowsky's party barely got house majority but with the elections coming up for the seats and a lot of lobbyists and senators pissed off about it. It will only be a matter of time before those special interests groups take some seats back, but the pros in this plan is that we will at least on paper have access to more resources, infrastructure and personnel at the costs of control and the risks of some corpo wars happening with the natives caught in the middle. I see, and your last one, rational legitimacy, it's going to be the exact opposite is it? Holyfield asked his colleague again. Polonsky. In all his mental gymnastics, fortitude and quantum-like calculations was a man who thinks hard before he does his next act. The colonel sighed as he took a deep breath. Rational is the most controlling of the three but is also the most difficult to maintain. We use every connection we got within the government and military to maintain key holds of power in Gleesia. We use our resources to secure alliances, resources and other sorts of things to get the natives on our side. Additionally if it comes down to it, we can just like you like it, hardline with the natives by pointing our guns at them if they try to fight against us but that's a last resort that I would rather not take at all and in your best interests never come down to it, Polonsky gulped. I may be a harsh man but I am not a tyrant. Holyfield defended himself on his colourful histories of his brutalising policies. Gunboat diplomacy is beside the point. For I would rather have the Slay Asian Empire and pretty much everybody in Gleesia see that the United Federation of Earth are peaceful settlers and not as trigger happy rednecks who want everyone off their property. The problem is that we are essentially trying to get the government to bend over backward for us. I exhausted all my favours just to get you and your marines with the Aurora right here already, 
plus, that is beside the fact that we will have to micromanage the entire planet by ourselves and one fuck up can have us dragged in cuffs back to earth for a hearing on live TV and I am very camera shy. Without a good reason to send more personnel, resources and materials we are stuck between a rock on a hard place. We need something that will get us the government to place their bets on us for we are stretched thin with what we have right now. Polonsky said. What about the unbinilium crystals? Shouldn't Dr. Malona be researching them right now? Holyfield asked. Polonsky's eyes widened. He had almost forgotten about their big man of science and his ongoing research on the newly discovered element that the colony has discovered. His attention was admittedly overly invested on the aftermath of the Arhaf incident. Dispatch. Please contact Dr. David Malone. Tell him I want a status report on him immediately. Polonsky radioed. Affirmative Colonel. Patching you through. The communication officer nodded. Dash 30 minutes later dash. Doctor? You wish to see me and Iris? Samantha said as she entered the science laboratory alongside the vampire witch. The two were requested and only they were allowed access to the restrictive facility deep underground in the heart of New Albany. It was right under the New Albany spaceport, but access was blocked off to keep personnel as many experiments and other engineering projects were being conducted. A large amount of the staff and resources within the facility are dedicated to the study of all things Gleesian from biological research on the flora and fauna, physics and chemistry studies on Gleesia's many unvanillium crystals, and some social experiments. Observations conducted on an Orwellian scale via CCTVs that were planted throughout Tyrian clandestinely. The science facility is still however under a transition of settlement as the recent partnership between the New Albany government employed scientists and Apara Corporation's scientific equipment and specialist personnel is still trying to make themselves at home in the facility. Box stacks, veils, and the sounds of engineering installations filled Samantha and Iris ears as they made their way to Dr. Malona's personal laboratory. Ah, Samantha. You are here, Dr. Malona greeted, and my lady Kadahagan too. Just the two women to see this fine day. Bobby B. Ongchen, a Paro Corps company representative and Diaz's old friend from his agent days also greeted alongside him. He was personally overseeing the entire installation of the donated equipment that Aparo generously gave to the new Albany scientists. A storage container for the unbinilium crystals. A nuclear isotope reactor was the fully operational parts of the facility as Samantha observed. There was a rush from Dr. Malona to research the properties of element 120 and Aparo's energy division provided a reactor to test some feasibility studies on what other practical uses that the youth with their advanced technology can exploit, create and adapt to. This science facility. This makes even the magic college in Herring Point look crude in comparison. Iris commented marveling at the science labs. Wait until this place is at full operation Miss Kudahagan. Once we got everything rolling, we will create wonders. I tell you, wonders. Byung-Chin enthusiastically exclaimed. Which reminds me about why you two are here. Melona wiggled his finger. This may sound a lot to ask from you. But we need your help. What kind of help? Samantha asked. Science requires investments, people, material, equipment, and money. Despite me and the equipment here, or will be here, my science teams are essentially diving into unknown territory and no offense to Iris but even she won't be enough help for us in our studies. Melona said. Are you calling me inadequate? I am one of the best enchanters in all of Gleesia. Iris haughtily protested. I am not saying that, but you are only one woman who specialized in one field that I am interested in studying. Enchanting as I can understand it is like electroplating Miss Kudahagan. You zap some energies into some object to make it get some new properties and elements am I correct? Melona asked. Of course. Wait. Is electroplating just your way of enchanting objects? Iris questioned. Yeah Para Corporation does electroplating when we manufacture the cybernetics you see Diaz and Aliath are wearing now to make them wear proof, corrosive protection and lubricity of their components to make them move like any other body part would move for example. 
The thing is Miss Cadahagan is that you can do it with non-metals like leather, cloth, and even wood. But Dr. Malona is stuck at a dead end. Is that so? How come? Where are you lost it sir? Iris turned to the scientist. As I said, I and my team are essentially diving in blind and we are going to need more than just us doing trial and error and it's economically inefficient, that's we are using too much of resources to get something done and I rather we spend it on opening up more fields rather than just trying to prove a theory one too many times, Malona explained, just cut to the chase and spare me the nerd talk. What do you want us to do? Samantha demanded. I will need more knowledge stock on studies about Gleesian magic and the Mana crystals. I am talking about anything useful for research such as literary works, scientific stuffs, and if possible, people as in specialists who know their way around the studies we got like Iris when it comes to any field of study that we are trying to dive into. So like alchemists, runesmiths and mages? Iris asked. Correct Miss Kudahagan. Get me all of those and I can improve you and the rest of the New Albany in their infrastructure, weapon systems, and tactics. Right now, I know that from you Miss Kudahagan that you can enchant objects at will as seen when you enchant a grenade launcher to shoot those 40mm grenades that discharge with special elemental effects. I want you to have this courtesy of a para corporation for your use. Byung-Chin gave an MGL grenade launcher to Iris. Latest model from our subsidiary Milka Weaponries. Shoots 40mm grenades at an effective range of 700 meters, which is 20% longer shooting distance than the current model of MGL got that's and just between you and me. Byung-Chin leaned over excitedly at the vampire witch with a playful wink. You're the first person to get your hands on this, it's yet to be deployed to any other youth military personnel but Don Aparo sees potential in you so he arranged you to be the first person to try it. Byung Chin said, why thank you sir Byung Chin, she politely bowed. Just call me Bobby, and consider that you're second magic staff. Byung Chin said, well the armory people were still skittish about giving you something from the arsenal but since that's a personal item rather than something borrowed off of the armory, I guess you are now officially the Striders Grenadier Iris. Samantha said, I can think of so many things about to do with this thing. Kane taught me. Iris smiled. There is something you will need to do for Aparo and the science team in return however Miss Quidahagan. You will have to teach some of Aparo core top electroplating engineers and business executives about the ins and out of magical enchantments that you practice. Byung Chin said, in exchange, I will. Iris nodded, well that's all settled. So Strider Group, you help me, and I will help you. Get me more crystals, scrolls and people. Together we will all be made stronger. Paro Terra, Melona saluted. Paro Terra. Dash meanwhile inside the new Albany military hospital, Dash, the sweet relief of silence, after so long was given to the poor elven princess Aliathra. After going through the rounds and rounds of curing the victims of the attack she was finally given the luxury of privacy and a moment of safety, albeit presumed. But at what cost? Her heart was quite literally no longer in the right place. Despite seeing face to face the grateful folks who were struck with the demon bane poison to be magically cured by but she felt for an odd reason, empty. She was forced to comply in pain of being left naked and afraid in the outside world and risk having her head taken off by the Sephid Liad. Yet she still feels and thinks like Aliathra Letha. She can remember the memories of her family during happier times together, her days in the academy, all the healing spells she knows by heart and lastly her ranger training, was taking away such a vital part of her being as a devoted of Nenith. Her own beating heart disqualifies her from being one with the goddess of all life. Why was she not smitten by her for being allowed to be torn asunder and repaired in a parodied image of her holy design? Suddenly a knock from her hospital cell door disturbed her train of thoughts. Who's there? Gigi go away. Aliathra asked meekly. I, am, an agent of. A, hey, what's her name again? Okay got it, I am an angel of Nenith. Open this door. I am here to rescue Dot A, one of Nenith own, a voice awkwardly said. You are just another trick, an illusion. Aliathra shot down as she tossed the pillow on her bed to the door. Okay, commence operation break Peter out of jail blind, 
a second but familiar voice said. Aliathra's room cell door opened with a noticeable mechanical creak from the locking mechanism as two figures entered her room. One of them was none other than Vincent Diaz himself whom she befriended earlier but not holds him at contempt since he is working for the people who are slowly corrupting her body with metal pipes. The other figure in the other hand a balding human with a set of spectacles of a wide plane and silvery rims on his head but carried a scholarly aura despite his clothes being all black except for a white tab on his neck worn like a color. He was also wearing a necklace that had a simple metal cross resting on his chest with the vertical line being much longer than the horizontal one. The balding scholar was smiling softly whilst Diaz showed a sense of buoyant anticipation as if he was hoping for something to happen, happening to her. Do what you want to me. I don't want to live anymore. After aiding you, Aliathra obeyed them to release her from all the guilt she helped with the attack that she helped orchestrated effectively blunted. There was now nothing short of war against the metal demons from the sky, their leader, their lord. Governor White is in all likelihood planning their counterattack as she lay there in a fetal position. She saw what the demons can do. Their inhuman strength, uncanny technology and alien morals and she shuddered for the future. Do not say that sweetie. Come on. We are all friends here. Diaz said. No, you aren't my friend. You just want to get inside my mind. You already took my heart and now you got me to heal your demon friends. Aliathra scoffed. If I know one thing about them is that they are anything but a demon. The balding man who claimed Nenith sent him said. Please angel, kill me now so I may return to her embrace. Aliathra cried. You are not dying nor you are in any danger here. The bald one said. He took off his glasses and squatted down to the elf's level. You are young, idealistic, wanting to change the world. Bring peace, unity, and prosperity. I respect that in fact that is my creed. The man said. What is your creed? Aliathra asked. She peeked over to the man. Her tears staining her vision barely getting to see him. To create a world to come princess Aliathra of house. Left dot left. Ah. What did Iris say was it called again? The baldman turned to Diaz. Letha. Aliathra said her family name. Yes, there are people like me who want to see the world to come. We share the same goal you and I. We both want one thing that's so important in our lives. What is that? Aliathra asked. Peace. The bald man said bluntly. You tried to fight us when we showed you that we came in peace yet you tried to do nothing more but attack us. Look at what it cost you. Aliathra reflected on that words as she was reminded of what happened to her. Her heart was replaced. Her legs were destroyed and her prestigious reputation as the darling princess of the Lethe family was now in shatters. There was nothing more to lose anymore but her life. But even then, it wouldn't matter anyway if the war against these other worlders is to happen. Come on Ali, sweetie, baby, I know we can be a bit. Weird at times but war with everyone right now is just bad. Bad for business, bad for play and bad for my nice jacket here. And I thought you liked electronic music, Diaz said. Hey, you are not helping my son, the balding man said. Oh, sorry further but still. Please lady, listen to reason here right now if you know what is best for you. We can do so much together if you just stop, Diaz said. He, you are. Farmy, Aliathra stuttered at the realization of Diaz's and the balding man's dialogue. Was Diaz some sort of demigod? An Asimar as the children of divine heritage goes? Oh no, he is not my actual son. It's just that I am very well respected in the New Albany community. I am a Salesian you see, the balding man said. A Salesian? Aliathra twitched at the foreign word. Was it some sort of organization? A title given to certain other worlders. I work. Well before going here on a mission. I used to work at schools in impoverished places. Orphanages and community colleges. I mean I didn't get this secondary education degree just to play therapy with an elf. I can't believe I just said that. The bald man said. Further bishop. Prime directive shit. You know because a hum. Diaz coughed. Oh right. Aliathra yes. You are a curious one isn't you am I right? 
you sneaking on the ship getting to Kesselheim, analyzing us. In fact, that's good. I like it when people ask questions. It adds value. Further Bishop optimistically said. Adds value? Aliathra asked. You stop and think, hypothesize then conclude. You are a spy after all but don't worry. I know a thing or two from the great Sun Tzu himself on how to deal with people like you. Diaz said. Damnation my son. Don't give her the wrong idea. Bishop reprimanded Vinny. What? Turn her into a double agent? Make her work for our interests? Diaz said. Work. For you? Why? Why? Aliathra despaired. Now look at what you have done. Bishop pointed out. Miss Lytha please do not get the wrong idea about Diaz. He's just raised wrong as we say lesions like to describe. And also you. Bishop said. Raised? Wrong? But I graduated from one of Eth Island greatest universities and survived ranger training. How was I raised wrong? Aliathra gnashed. Because you used your knowledge to make more problems. The attack, the things you saw and do? As I said child, look at what happened now. What is brewing and many people will die and it is all your fault. You thought you are saving the world but instead you doomed it with your own fear. You fear is the greatest enemy. You feared the prophecies by that Jeltagar comet and tried to blind us off a new home but instead, you only made sure we are here right now in this room with you. Bishop spoke. You know, Aliathra exclaimed as she was reminded about the excursion with the illusion mages months ago when they hid Tyrion from the eye which was a strange amalgamation of black and flesh and metal when it was salvaged. She remembered passing off the strange contraptions carcass to the mages college in Herring Point for study with the demonologists and the monster archivists. In your rush to hide from us you only made us want to find you more. I mean, hiding Tyrion from us with probably Azaris says. Illusion magic was actually pretty clever am I right father? Diaz smiled. Thank God you said something I agreed on. Bishop said alleviating their conflicting ways of thinking. The only reason he was with him on this bid to fully convince Aliathra that her best interests right now is with working with the youth instead of against them was that Vincent was the closest person the elf connected herself with during her moments with Strider Group. After the emergency surgery on the Super Osprey which involved the amputation of Aliathra's legs. Lieutenant Rose gave permission to Specialist Iris Kadahagan to bite her vampiric teeth on the elf and dig into her memories using her special abilities to use the blood of whatever living thing she bit to see the moments in their memories. By the vampire's account, Aliathra's past few weeks were downloaded into Iris' head for her to fully understand the picture. They discovered her royal heritage, her mission, her dealings with the Slay Aegeans and both her and the youth humans laughed at just how ridiculously misinformed the Gleasons were. Until they, the youth remembered that fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate and when one side sees something they hate, they lash out. With the math that the one hating on her was an entire civilization of people, it was not going to end well for either party involved. Colonel Polonsky, after reviewing the testaments and the evidence given to him by Inspector Reed, Lieutenant Rose, and what Governor White could subversively collect beforehand. An all-out war with a full-blown empire will be a political, PR, and logistical nightmare. They need to reverse this misunderstanding or millions of lives will be needlessly lost for what was essentially the biggest misunderstanding since the pre-Hiroshima and Nagasaki diplomatic dialogue during the Second World War. So. You won't try to wipe us out and enslave us? Aliathra asked. I would rather go to hell right now than to live with the fact that I am an accessory to what you describe that the Federation will not, never ever do. Bishop said. Then. Then my people still have hope. Aliathra jumped out of the ground. Her reinvigorated faith and blind prayers were indeed answered by whatever deity that heard it. Not so fast. Bishop stopped her. Our mercy has a cost. What you did was very, reprehensible to say the least. Diaz said, not many people would forgive you for what you helped did in our half. The attack that you help orchestrate with that poison is by our laws could get you at locked in jail for a long time regardless on the fact that the attack managed to kill one native, and down 16 people. Both UF, 
I mean sky people and local tyranny alike. We barely managed to stop anyone dying when after that poor old woman rattled to death and I was there, Bishop said. But, Demonspin is the most powerful poison known in Gleesia. How could you? Aliathra left for words on the resilience and tenacity the other world has endured, and to also hear that they also fought to keep the afflicted natives alive too as she noticed as several of the afflicted that were taken to the hospital were indeed from Tyrian. It's science baby. You'll be surprised at what you can do when you are angry and focused enough. Diaz chuckled. Anyhow, Miss Lytha, you have a family right? Even though that perhaps you may likely fall out with them when they hear that you are of metal heart which is entirely just bullcrap I say. I mean you are still you right? Bishop reeled in Aliathra. They are getting her to open up and he will be damned if he let this opportunity slip. With Aliathra as a new consultant for the youth in their affairs in Gleesia, they can most likely better understand the ins and out of the native politics in the planet for the Federation's interests. But, I, haven't done any good. I sinned. I hurt people. Innocent people. Aliathra repented. She now realized that she was wrong and now she stood there. An elf. One of the most superior beings with their age, wisdom bodies and intuitiveness to be humiliated by two human men. She stood there, head down ashamed that she was wrong by every account of the spelling of that one word of the phrase, an elf is wrong. Then she felt a hand lay firmly with a fatherly grip on her shoulder. It was Bishop again. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. As Isaiah was told, I believe you can make this right, for all of us, Bishop said. Aliathra closed her eyes, she swallowed her pride again. She remembered her mission, to protect the people of Gleesia from war and now her mission was reinterpreted into a new and radically different light. She was going to save Gleesia, from themselves. Where do I begin? Aliathra asked. Tell explain to us everything you know, Bishop said, and after that, we can go get some pizza and hot chocolate after all of this if it makes you feel better. Make it a NY special with chilies for the pizza and make the chocolate extra thick, Bishop said. I see you are a man of tastes. For a priest, Diaz smiled amused. I don't confine myself to an abbey and tweet the Bible like some podcaster. I am an actor after all or I would be a horrible Salesian. Bishop smiled. It was a smile of a mission accomplished and the CCTV cameras that were bugged in Aliathra's room saw every second. It was now time to fully uncover the truth and set everyone free from the shackles of fear and misunderstanding before it turns into an unquenchable inferno. Dash. UAV arriving at the target location in 60 seconds, Isaac said in his robotic AI voice. Major are you sure we are going to go ahead with this? plan of yours? Sounds risky to me. Admiral Iachimanish Izaki, the commander of Task Force Aurora, Colonel Holyfield's assigned amphibious assault carrier. He is in command of the said carrier, the Aurora, and her escort of destroyers. Not only was he in command of some of the finest ships the youth had ever created with their own two hands but he is also in charge of about 72 aircraft of various roles from UAVs fighters, multi-role, and bombers. When he first heard of Holyfield's radical plan of a show of force at the Slaagian Empire's capital of Herring Point, the 51-year-old of Japanese descent from a long line of naval fathers did not know to be amused or to be mildly concerned of him going full circle with a Japanese trying to open up a port to a hostile country and he knew that moment in history as it was repeated in his heritage. A little bit of recon and scouting doesn't hurt anyone, besides it's just a drone so no real risks here, Holyfield said. So, what are we supposed to look be looking for there? The Admiral asked. They're not just going to let us talk after a simple shouting that I can tell you. We need to grab their attention. Something that will make them shit their pants if it's gone. Military assets, infrastructure. Perhaps even the royal palace herself if it is to be, Holyfield said. Does the council back at Earth know this? Nishizaki asked. Half, Holyfield bluntly replied. Half, what do you mean by half? 
The Admiral's A's widened. You know about the press embargo a moment after the R half attack correct? Those wigs back home is going to have a field day if they knew most of what is happening here in Benham 3. We could risk the pulling out of our funding. Bureaucratic blockings and at worst a full withdrawal if the wrong people, Wig or Corpo gets a word of this or, or at least. Not until we can entrench our presence here from our still fragile position, Holyfield said. So? What does Earth know? The Admiral asked, that there was an attack injuring several of our soldiers and some of the friendly natives by insurgents. Next is me and Colonel Polonsky are getting the situation under control. Lastly a request for additional resources. However, that's the most concerning part of what they know. Holyfield said. Let me guess. The Whigs are going to file in a PMC unit to jump here? The Admiral asked. One is concerning. Dozens of them? I might want to just throw in my retirement papers. Even if those PMCs are those associated with the Para Corporation it's still going to be a shit show. The Admiral scoffed. His disdain for the mega corporation and their tight control and monopolies on strategic resources that make the United Federation move was showing. Giving them, an inch of Gleesian land and they will gladly take a mile in the name of profit. His experience in dealing with those profit-driven groups who made several of his campaigns throughout the colonies such as Slog was a key motivator on his voting for Chairman Bowskin taking the leadership of the council in a bid to regulate, stifle and hopefully put a stop to the corporation's meddling in humanity's many affairs. A para corporation is already one mouth enough to feed, we must embrace that possibility. One way or the other, most of my colleagues are stretched out in many hotspot systems, but they lack something we have, initiative and I will move mountains to get every inch of it. Holyfield said, attention, UAV has arrived at the coordinates, Isaac announced. Give me a feed Isaac, Holyfield ordered. His command room's holographic screen opened as the blinking red dot of live recording footage shone ominously on the left corner of the screen. From beneath the clouds, the Major and Admiral to could see traces of civilizations from farming fields to cobble roads. As the UAV continued to fly onwards, they were met with a wall. A great sized wall followed by multitudes of dozens of brick housing that took shelter within. This should be it according to RS Logs, Holyfield commented. The camera feed flew past the houses as it progressed from one to two floored homes of simple materials to more opulent and grandstanding ones of the type of homes a well-off household could afford to dress with. The further inwards the city the UAV glided, the more distinct the features of the buildings were. Herring Point is a coastal city, right? With a peninsula? Meaning the walls are the only place people would enter from land. That means there's a port. A bay area perhaps. The admiral mentioned. Good thinking. Isaac run to the edge of the city. I want to look there. Holyfield said. Command received. Affirmative. Isaac acknowledged. It wasn't long before the sea of houses became an actual blue sea as the UAV discreetly overwatches the Herring Point's ports. That's a lot of ships. Most likely trading ships. Rules of war say they shouldn't be blown up. The Admiral pointed out. There's got to be a naval base. Wait. Those ships over there, Holyfield said as his eyes glanced over an unusually large boat in more distinct painting at his twelve o'clock. The UAV flew forward as the camera examined the ship that Holyfield directed. It had the red and black colorings of the Stla Legion Empire's national colors that he knew from his experience with the Legion Airs. It had three masts with the left to the right masts order of size between the largest to the smallest. It was anchored off with an entourage of smaller built ships but of the same colors. Looks far too ornate to be a simple trading ship, Nish Isaac he stated. Isaac we have some targets. Now let's see the rest of the city, Holyfield said. He will save those naval ships for later once the plan is ready. The UAV soon flew away from the ocean as it made its approach towards a peculiar set of buildings that sat atop a rising slope and counted the major counted three. What made them stood out compared to every other opulent structure that littered the inner parts of Herring Point was the level of complexity and real estate spacing those structures had in comparison. The first building was at the bottom of the slope and it is the largest in terms of width. 
It had multiple courtyards within the confines of its walls plus a giant tower in the middle of the complex. It had an air of respect and prestige that aired at those who observed it. I think that's the magic college that Iris talks about, Holyfield said. The next building was several dozens of meters away from the college and it hosted a large dome with fortifications that surrounded that blocked off access and further upward from the slope. The building was of a more practical and straightforward design but had many slaves and empire heraldries signifying an aura of watchful sovereignty and authority throughout the city. Some sort of military fort or government office maybe? Either way, it must be important if a second wall had to be built. Nishizaki commented, the last building on the slope is by Holyfield's accounts the most lavishly built home in the entirety of their reconnaissance of the imperial capital. Its designs were of a uniquely sleek and opulent stature, more form than function as if the occupants of that residence spared no expense in flaunting how much worldly objects he can decorate the exterior of his home. I bet that's the imperial palace. Log that in Isaac, Holyfield said with a determined huff. I am going to make my pitch for my plan back to Wigat Earth and get their permission, which I know they will. Admiral. In the spirit of your nation's history and the ghost of Admiral Perry. Take your fleet to Herring Point. Holyfield turned to the Admiral. I know a very appropriate code name for my next operation major. Nishizaki smiled. Operation Bakumatsu. Save the Ching Chong when it's orange chicken dinner night at the mess hall. Holyfield snarked. It means the end of the Dokugawa Shogunate and the beginning of the Meiji Restoration. Nishizaki corrected. Oh, the more you know. Officer, get me a private line with Earth at the double. Holyfield yelled. Chapter 26. Operation Bakumatsu Part 2 Samantha had to be split with her squadmate Iris Kadahagan or now more formally, Specialist Kadahagan when they have recently summoned their presence at the police headquarter of New Albany. They were looking forward to having time to themselves for some rest and relaxation and to also discuss what their plans are for tackling Dr. Malona's research-related requests. Polonsky? We're here, Samantha saluted with a natural gesture of her hands whilst Tyrus, still new to the whole military discipline meekly and quickly followed. Good, each of you got two different tasks that you are only able to complete, Polonsky said. Lieutenant, I am assigning Alia Thrillertha to your unit and I need you to brief her on the rules she has to follow, Polonsky informed Samantha. Why, I'm already happy with Iris already. Why would I need another one? Samantha asked. Why let her in? I can handle things quite well with my magics. Iris enviously slighted. According to both of your profiles, or at least what Isaac says about the elf, is that you miss Kadahagan and the Miss Leth. Their abilities are complementary of each other, Polonsky explained. Complementary? But she is just a snooty elf princess. Iris scoffed at the idea. Well, your snooty elf has displayed and boasted abilities from fields of magic that you couldn't do, restoration, illusion, and alteration. Additionally, she seems to share a well-educated knowledge of the politics and anthropology of everything here in Gleesia, and it's only best she will be assigned to you. Besides Lieutenant, you needed a combat lifesaver in your squad since the beginning of your tour. Samantha had to admit that the colonel was correct, but can we trust the elf? The lieutenant asked. She has nowhere to go but her loyalty to her homeland is still without a doubt somewhere still inside her. Her interests is to her fellow elves' well-being. It's just that her perspective of everything. Of us has changed. You need to be there for her, Polonsky said. Be there for what? Be there to give her a hand. Explain, comfort, discipline. She may not be like Iris, but she has great potential to be able to help us get out of this mess. Polonsky answered, and speaking about that, Iris, you are needed at the basement. Inspector Reed been trying to crack the crow we have captured but she wouldn't budge. I need you to perform that. M. Bite thing with the memory reading you can do. Polonsky ordered the vampire. Oh, that sounds actually fun. She smiled coyly. It was essentially a free meal for the vampire witch. Farewell Red. I am going to have what you earthlings call snack time. She bid goodbye as she eagerly skirted to the basement. 
So where is Aliathra? Samantha asked. Conference room, upstairs. Not closed interrogation room this time. We are trying to show some goodwill for her by not treating her as a prisoner. Even though she technically is one, Polonsky said. You are essentially her political officer. Just like how you have to treat Diaz. Roger that, Samantha said. She was rather disturbed by the fact that the elf woman was to be treated like a penal soldier since most of the time, penal soldiers were treated as expendable assets in times of battle. The poor elf suffered a lot but if she wants to uplift herself from this predicament, she has to pay with her mind, body, and soul. Samantha might give the elf some leniency in comparison to her suspicions with Vincent Diaz despite his connections with a Paramega Corporation bankrolling a huge piece of New Albanese equipment, bankrolls, and labor. Climbing upstairs directly leads to the conference room which was situated atop and overlooking the main office space of the police headquarters. Samantha can see the glimpse of Aliathra who sat quietly at the chair closest to the projector screen flowing yellow hair with an elegant braid crowning her head's perimeter. She was staring blankly at the empty white projector screen silently before her ears twitched to the sound of Sam's ascending footsteps. Greetings. Princess Samantha introduced herself. I don't think I will be called that anymore. Aliathra said sadly. Don't be too harsh on yourself. You didn't know, but they still do not. My family, my country, my people. I know for a certain that they know that I am now no longer pure of heart. The elf teared up. Define pure of heart? Samantha asked. To be good and kind to Nanith's children without guilt, shame nor stain. That was I was told, Aliathra said, which is to be good for the sake of being good. Samantha philosophizes. Indeed. But. Now. My heart is tainted. By the flesh of iron. I am not pure. She sulked. If a sick man ran to you and begs you to heal him would you do it even if he has no way of paying for your work? Samantha threw at the elf. You. Yes, I would. That Nenith teaches charity. I have seen many on my travels or on the accounts of my teachers of many colonies and ghettos filled with many of afflicted. Aliathra said, if say, a large man was seen beating a child, would you intervene even if the large man can easily overpower you? Samantha said, as the scrolls say children are a heritage from the All Mother offspring a reward from her. Whoever shows grace to Nanith's creations receives her grace back. The elf recited. One more Miss Lytha. You found out. That one day that something you thought was the truth turns out to be wrong. Would you try to correct those who thought of otherwise? Samantha asked. That third question struck the elf the hardest. She had no response for about a minute. She sulked down her hands on her temples as she gnashed her teeth silently before she dared speak again. Where did I go wrong? Am I wrong? I should be evil. I. How can I be? Pure? My heart is not. I am everything that the temple hates. I have the flesh of demons. Aliathra wailed. Samantha emphatically placed her hand on the elf back and caressed it softly to comfort her. You are not evil Aliathra, you are just confused. You said that you would protect the child and help the sick man for free. That is not evil at all, Samantha said. How can I face my parents? They would be horrified if they see me alongside the likes of you. Why are you doing this? Spying on us? Samantha asked. I wanted to make my parents proud. I am the youngest in my family. My sister. My brother. They all did something that made them the stars in my parents' eyes. I haven't done anything to get that. But now, I will never do. Aliathra cried. Then there's nowhere to go but up now isn't it? You can still help us and if any of your elves try to kill you, we will be there. But you need to cooperate. Samantha said. The elf still brooded her face down on her hands on the conference table. Irresponsive to Samantha's words. From the lieutenant's studies on stress-related afflictions, Aliathra is suffering through a state of denial. Rose placed her hand on the elf's back and caressed it gently before the lieutenant took a deep breath and let go her authoritative pitch to a more emphatic one. I know you are still depressed about what happened to your body but look at the bright side, at least you are still alive, Samantha said assuredly. 
I don't know whether I should accept this fate or not. I am now a monster that everyone in Sanegad and Aphelnora will want to eradicate off the face of Gleesia. Now, I have no choice but to betray my home and conspire with the youth just to keep on living. I feel conflicted about my own being now. Aliathra responded with her voice distorted by the reverberations of sound waves bouncing off unnaturally from her moping position. Why you are still keeping that stupid mindset Aliathra? Samantha frowned. She was starting to get sick of hearing those demonic accusations laid on her into those on behalf of the youth. You are still you, even with those cybernetic parts. You ought to know by now that those artificial body parts cannot corrupt you because it doesn't have any magic to begin with by your logic. So, your soul is still pure in a sense. That means you can still do your duty as a priestess of N, whatever her name is no offense to you. You always use your magical talents and kindness to relieve people from their suffering. Healing people is one of the most noble professions back where I come from. My mother. Her name is Godleave, she is a nurse. Served in the same ship where she met father. She always visits everyone who came into the infirm, hospice. A. Place where you send people to if they are sick. Samantha awkwardly coughed when she began to talk about her mother. Her more soft-handed approach got the elf to rise up from her ashamed posture as she can now see her as Eurotian eyes. I think about this a lot and I feel there is some truth behind it. I still feel that these unnatural limbs are wrong. Aliathra said. Can I ask? Can restoration magic makes people like Arya? who was born crippled be cured to walk like normal humans do. Samantha asked. Restoration magic has its limit as it cannot fix people who are born as disabled or injuries that are too severe to recover like loss of limbs or crippling damages. The fundamental of restoration magic is that it restores living beings and only living beings to their original form. However, if the body of a being is not born whole or receiving injuries that are not making them whole again, no amount of restoration magic cannot restore it since the life force of an unwhole body parts cannot exist to restore. That is why I was so horrified by Diaz. He is neither alive, dead nor undead as we would call it yet I know that there's some life in him but it's so wildly different that it might not be even be called life anymore. Aliathro explained. You just prove my point that our metal body parts are superior to restoration magic since it can cover the weakness of restoration magic by fixing natural born disabled people or people who become crippled due to serious injuries. Hang on. I think I can show you something to prove it to you, Samantha said. She grabbed her smartphone and logged into YouTube. On the search bar, she tapped in Paralympic Runner and entered. She scrolled down and looked for a brief but impactful video to show until she found something she was looking for. Take a look. Samantha turned her smartphone to the elf. The video played of a man on his forelimbs but his left foot which was of a similar prosthetic design of bent steel in a caricature of a humanoid food but with the formed steel of cold metal. His opposite side limb on the other hand, or foot, was a natural, flesh and blood five-toed foot. A loud gun fired that Aliathra found similar to the metal staffs the other worlders wield. Upon the gun's discharge, the Paralympian sprang from the tips of his feet off the ground and ran. The elf could feel every lithe step the agile man took as he flew through the field like a proud stallion free on his feet. As you can see, this man when he was still a young boy got into an accident that made him lose one of his legs. Samantha demonstrated. And so he got these new metal ones that you built. With tools and mineral rocks. Aliathra asked. Samantha nodded. A A. The elf stuttered. You can say. I am here to hear you. Samantha smiled. Amats. Aliathra was about to announce her approving astonishment when the doors behind the conference room. Make way. Make way, Diaz said followed by Bobby Biongchin and several of the Aparo Corporation staff. Vincent was holding a laptop whilst another Aparo employee was holding a modem as if they were frantically trying to get the best signal possible. Make way? For what? Samantha asked. Money dear girl. We got some PMCs on the line and the metanet is shit downstairs. It's transstellar right hell you. Biongchin said. The metanet? 
The official term for the second breed of the Internet refers to the now interplanetary worldwide medium of communication that sprang from Earth and rose and grew to culturally distinct clusters of nodes, circles and even their own regional slang across the entire youth net. Normally the word metnet is used as a formal term but behind the privacy of closed doors, everyone still calls it the Internet. Mercenaries? They are aligned with Aparo Corporation, right? Samantha questioned. Yep, either subsidiaries or people who often align with us so no worries. I got an armored company, rifle corps and even an entire cavalry battalion of both motorized and actual horses. I talk later after contracts are signed. Oh, hey sweetie you cool with us now? Diaz said to Samantha before his lustful eye turned to the elf. Cool with you? Aliathra asked confused with the proposition. He means are we friends now? Allies? Not master and slave. More of friends who so happens to be you. We are the teachers and you are the student yeah? Samantha explained. I see. I do declare yes. Of course. Aliathra reshaped her posture to a stance worthy of a princess. That's what I like to hear. You still like that electronic music by the way? Diaz gave small talk as he set up the laptop onto an awaiting socket yet his eyes were firmly at his commanding officer and the elf. Private Diaz. Miss Lutha. Samantha began to reintroduce the elf to Diaz. Aliathra. The elf paused her. I would prefer to be called Aliathra. She insisted. Aliathra, this is Private Diaz. He is our appointment. First man in and last one to get out. She said with a slight malicious tone on being the last one out. Yes. C.O. I am compelled to agree. So Ailey, if I call you that yeah, if you want to relax, we can listen to electronic together in my car sometime. I'll bring chips and beer. Or wine. Whatever, Diaz said. Vinny, hurry up. My laptop is low battery before you yanked it off, Bobby incited. If it means giving my goodwill, then I shall. Aliathra bowed down. Damn girl. Last woman who bowed down to me was this Japanese dancer who tried to stab me. Diaz snarked. It's called a geisha, Diaz. And that one was meant for me. Language by the way. At least until we go out for some whiskey later. Bianchin scolded. Oh fine. Diaz said as he turned his eyes to the power outlet to plug in the charger of Bobby's laptop. I see you later you too. Oh and Abed told me we should do something for the funds as a team soon. You ask him when you can. Diaz informed. Come Aliathra. Sorry for Diaz. He can be very roguish due to his upbringing. Come with me to the barracks. I would like you to meet your team now and then after the detour of New Albany. You will be working with us and for a very and hopefully long time. Samantha guided. The elf took the red-haired woman's hand and took her first step to her new odyssey and to as the princess hoped. A brighter future. Dash meanwhile below the New Albany police headquarters, Dash. A neary silence was the only ambience that greeted Iris as she heads downstairs to the basement. From what she was told about the place from the few hushed whispers in isolated water cooler conversations, anti-Geneva convention. Abandon all hope, ye who enters there, where no Gleesian can leave. It was a torture chamber of the lethal kind. She was escorted downstairs where Inspector Reed, a familiar face that Iris had her own moments of acquainting herself with was there to greet you. Miss Cadahagan. A pleasure. Reed nodded quietly, his voice felt only in the slightest whisper. Inspector. Iris greeted back. What brings me here? The vampire asked. It's that crow we captured. We had tried everything to make her talk but she refused to speak of anything. Accomplices, safe houses, who her master was. Reed explained as he guided Iris to a woman in a chair. She was naked except down to her underwear. Her body was scarred, bruised, and every sign of the word abused. It was jarring for the vampire to see such raw viscera up close and uncensored. She wasn't the type of person to dissect animals or people, since the former was just a source of food and no more for her and the latter. Is that Iris finds humanoid dissection to be disgusting, rather letting the more stronger stomach folk do all of the cutting for her. A lone light that shone iridescently like providence fell on her battered skin. What was strange about the torture room was its cleanliness, 
The floor was pearlescent white and the walls were of a reflective silver shine from its steel walls. But the room, as she could feel in her ears felt different as if sound coming from within never finds its way out. This left a terrifying realization on her mind that the those who were tortured could scream as loud as if they could but nobody will ever hear their pleas. Ah! The anomalous one is here. A man in a suit who sat across the room of the captured crow said. His hands were covered in a contrasting formula of his white rubber gloves with the crimson stain of blood that wetted Iris' appetite slightly due to its freshness. Who might you be sir? Iris asked the man. My name is not important, but everyone calls me, their confessor, the man said in a serious tone. Damn it, Gary stop being so cynical on our new friend please, Reed said. You know I am still pissed off that my vacation was cut short because... Oh, we need someone to interrogate some human aliens in some far-off place that the state has classified. Oh, Gary the confessor mocked the rough and screeching voice of his superior. He stood up from his chair and pushed aside an assortment of bloodied instruments that Iris took a glance over before the shadows engulfed them completely. She saw a wet-looking white to pinkish colored towel, an electric car battery and a syringe. Not the normal collection of torture tools as Iris remembered she had to make one day an enchanted torturous tool set with the properties to apply a delayed healing effect after contact with skin. The vampire was told to never talk about what she did that day to anyone afterwards for 100 ducats for the service and an extra 100 for her silence. This woman here was captured by your squad mate Sergeant Lewis Crocker correct? Gary asked. Iris quietly nodded positively, refuse to give up anything of intelligent value to us as my colleague Inspector Reed said. The confessor continued, and then, Reed told me about, you, a woman who can read people's minds by, and I was laughing on this one, biting them. So, I made a bet with Reed, if I cannot get this woman to break in three days. He would have to call you in and I have to pay for my husband's famous marbled mango cake for Reed's next familial care package, shipping included. Gary said, I presume you, Iris let out a few words. Yes, I lost unfortunately. She was tough. I hate torturing women but then again. What I read on the file she did was just pure evil. Gary interrupted with jolt of cringe. Gary moved out of the way as he picked up the sunken face of the barely alive crow and made it face the vampire who stood right in front of her. Wake up, wake up, Gary shook her. The woman opened her eyes in a blur. Freda. She cursed herself on getting captured and all the attempts to take her own life had failed. She tried biting her tongue, letting the cold water she was forcefully made to sip on drown her and the crackles of heat consume her but she always seemed to get back up from the grave as if the demons who took her refused to let her expire so she can endure every waking moment of hell. The demons know what they want and that's her secrets and she refused to give it to them. But when her eyes refocused. Ada gasped in horror. It was a vampire. The demons had brought in the services of one of Gleesia's most reclusive and frightening people into their fray. The legends say that the vampires are newer species of humans who were altered to gain enhanced physical and arcane abilities at the cost of allergenic reaction to sunlight, the appetite for blood and the usage of blood in their magical spell castings. One of the abilities that they can do was absorbing the memories of what they consume the flesh and bodily fluids of, if that monster bit her, the secrets of the crow organization will be compromised. The crow tried to wiggle away but her weakened state and Gary's burdening grip put her in place as he next was exposed for the vampire. Do what you do best Miss Kudahagan, Gary invited. The thirst within her was given the permission as the desire of blood overwhelmed Iris. Her fangs retracted out of her canines as she lunged for the crow's neck. Her teeth pierced in as she siphoned Ada's, who was still under the glamour. On the likes of her grandmaster meter, blood greedily. All the crow could do was yelp as her consciousness fades from the blood loss. As soon as the blood poured into her, Iris' eyes began to shot up as a barrage of memories flowed into her so quickly that the vampire was left in a daze over her skull running over itself on the information overload. She could see faces, people, words, knowledge, etchings and other stocks that was injected into Iris' brain but couldn't decipher immediately. 
She needed some time to think. As her head reattained its bearings, Iris suddenly felt a cold metal of a gun's barrel on her forehead. You were enjoying yourself aren't you there vampire? Gary cocked his pistol. Gary, what are you doing she is our, Reed protested. How do we know she is not lying like some gypsy fortune teller? Gary said. What are you talking about? Reed asked. I am saying is why do I have to believe this woman can just read memories? Tell me what you saw. I have questions. Gary said. Reed, do what the intelligence agent says. Reed gulped fearing the repercussions if he intervened. Who was behind the attacks? Gary asked. The Empire of Slaeja. Iris tried to rummage through the new memories she absorbed. Why did the Empire attack the governor? Gary asked again. Because. They. Are scared of him. Iris deciphered another memory. She was essentially cramming stressfully all of the nodes of the crow's head. Scared why? Gary pushed. Of. Your. Power. Iris responded. Her cramming soon began to take a physical toll on her. Her heart beat rapidly and her eyes began to go bloodshot in color. She was pushing herself on pain of a bullet. Million dollar question. How should I believe you on all of that? Answer me. Gary demanded. She is wearing a glamour. The crow is using an illusion. Iris announced. What do you mean it's an illusion? She's solid flesh and. What the hell? Reed tried to point out the absurdity only to turn around back to the prisoner to see that she has been physically changed. From a black haired short bob cut woman to a brunette with curls all of a sudden. That. This magic isn't it? Gary asked. For you? Yes, it is. Reed said. Gary turned away his pistol from Iris and immediately discharged one bullet at the unconscious crow giving her finally the sweet release of death that Ada wanted. We all have what we need right? The prisoner is of no more use to the state. Gary said. Come Iris, I will give you something to shake that ache of yours. Reed apologized. I will catch up with you. I need to make a call first before I dispose of the cadaver. Gary coldly told his colleagues as he picked up his phone and dialed for Major Holyfield, the man who brought him to New Albany within a short notice. Dash about several kilometers upwards in the clouds above the Slaeijan Empire. Yes, I see. So it is them. Tell them that they will be made an example of today, Holyfield said as he ended his call with the Bureau of Interior Agent Garth the Confessor de Sardet. Gary to his colleagues such as his old classmate Inspector Reed, he was brought over with him rather reluctantly from his husband's seventh anniversary vacation under a very alarming notice but Agent de Sardet didn't turn the name the Confessor for being a good boy who regrets his transgression. He had a way of making stubborn people talk. His call to him as he flew the skies of Gleesia confirmed his suspicions after the crow squealed. The Slaeijan Empire was behind the attack. He found it abhorring that they would dare do such a cowardly attack on civilians and their own subjects too over an obvious ploy for peace. But alas, their efforts were too disruptive that the law of Newton's motion action say that they're due for an equally disruptive reaction. If it were up to him. He would call in a show of force with a barrage of missiles to flatten the city but it would look horrible on his record if he ever explicitly gave such a sociopathic order. Instead he needs to show a resemblance of mercy, a chance for the primitive natives that they could redeem themselves. Major, we have arrived at our destination. Admiral Nishizaki said. Give me a camera feed Rainbow 1's view on the city. The Major ordered. His commander's interface immediately uplinked to the camera feed of the airstrike team's camera giving him a high-definition view of the Slaeijan capital of Herring Point in the flesh and stone. The capital was a remarkable city when seen in first glance, like a mixture of some Baroque and Delvin construction that made the port city a crossroads between the human and Delvin worlds. The cityscape was harmonious like Amal's TV display. But the low draws of the Aurora's engines would soon break that peaceful scene. Unicorn and Pegasus Squadron begin mission. Take out all of the designated targets and wait for further instructions. Together, Holyfield radioed. He knew his men were some of the best drilled and well-planned pilots in all of youth space. Perfection of execution was what got the airmen of the Aurora to be the stories of legends to other pilots everywhere. Affirmative Den Father Beginning Mission Rainbow Squadron's lead airman Unicorn once said, 
His team is in charge of bombardments. Their mans for this sortie is the heavy lifting close air support plane the A-25 Dragoon again for its devastating carriage of ordinances such as its minigun and guided penetration bombs. Everything needed for a quick, precise yet devastating strike. Pegasus 1 looking for a fight. The Pegasus leader said. Her squadron is in charge of protecting Unicorn Squadron from any interceptors that the Slay agents might have as a countermeasure against flying opponents, however primitive it may be. Plus, they are also been equipped to provide saturation fire against any surface-to-air targets with their rocket batteries attached to their nimble multi-role planes the V-96 Locust. Firing. Rainbow once said as he shot down and instantly sank one of the Slay Aegean Navy's patrol boats as it was indicated by the drone's reports. They are after military targets and military targets only. Anything else and the squad will have to enjoy reading the Geneva Convention while inside a jail cell. Dash meanwhile at the Imperial Palace, Dash. That is unfortunate to hear. Emperor Alden said. He leaned over his studies chair so his body was ready to absorb all of the day's information. The Cephid Liad agents and the shaken but still active meat of the Grand Master of the Crows informed the Emperor of their findings. What he conveyed was both intrigue and displeasure. From the Crow, he had learned several key first-hand indicators of the other world's physical appearances. Human-like in their own shape but almost never leave out of their metal skin that protected them from almost any blows and that's if you could get anywhere close to them in the first place since they carried staffs that shoot invisible thunder that pierced their bodies with the puncture of an arrow with the heat of a miniature fireball. They seduce all those who hear with words of progress, prosperity, wellness and all sorts of adjectives that sounded too good to be true. They have the power to summon fire from heaven, build metal hills within a blink of an eye and all they ask is one thing, sign a contract of friendship. It was all too similar to the old legends of the demonic invasions of ancient times. Allbone making a deal with the demons for power in exchange for boons that would rise him up to the top. This in turn made him go on a crusade of conquest around the Xenograd continent forcing others to kneel or be annihilated. Then Nuldin's ancestor, called Dell of the Vigory clan rose up and rebelled against him. The rest of the legend was played off by the jubilation of King Kuldel every year which the imperial capital is still recovering from the massive consumption and spontaneous decay of such a felicitous festivity. Next was the news from the elven Cephid Liad agents led by Lindus. Her organization although publicly they are just the diplomatic wing of the Ethylon and what is known behind the closed doors of every political establishment as it was also a front for espionage. There was an agreement his great-grandfather had made with the elves that states about a limited yet proportionate exchange of intelligence between themselves. Yet there were some whispers amongst his own spies that the elves speak in half-truths or only speak the truth if they just want the Slay agents to do some of their own dirty work for them. From what Lindis told him, the elven princess, Aliathrolatha was missing after she came made the most advances in the progress of examining the other worlders. Talks of her having to commune with the demons fell on his ears softly but like kisses of fire it made him even more fearful of what these other worlders were capable of. For Alden's own investigations, he had sent word to many of his spies to relay messages to the legionnaire fortresses closest to Tyrian but only a handful of those he had assigned the task to return to tell the story of the legion fortress simply disappearing. Did the demons have something to do with this? My heart was not in the jubilation because of these. These demons in Tyrian. I cannot believe that Prince Klovich would just happily kneel down to these barbarians and fall into their miracles. Absurd to think they can all do that, Alden said. If I may my lord, the missing princess, Aliathra was last. Seen in Cambervale Valley as it was ready to return to further scout the other worlders. Her reports were most troubling if what she says is true of metal beasts and their magics then we must be ready to counteract with these demons with our holy weapons and spells. Grand Master Owen advised that might work but not to the same degree as you would expect Grand Master, Lindis informed. I saw the princess attempt to cast several holy spells beforehand on a group of demons but to no avail. 
it is to my hypothesis that they may have created some sort of resistance to their own anathema. She is only one elf. Besides, restoration spells were meant to be used in groups, Owen argued. But the princess is, was, excellency in healing magic that she is said to have two powers of four healers in one person. Lindus shot back. Her response was more of a chauvinistic shot on the elves' superior magical bodies and how their bodies were as their gods dictated to be intelligently designed for all manners of the arcane. We will need to publicly alert the legions immediately my lord, Meta suggested. We will need a tremendous amount of hands to put down the demons while only so few thousand of them are there right now. And risk a public panic. We are still at war with the Dawson tribes at the north and our navy is still battling it out with the Tavais in the southern oceans. Owen warned mentioning the other existing problems that was well under the Slay Agent's geopolitical context. The Dawson are a stubborn and proud people of man-beast fusions ranging from the wolf-like Voliudi, the feline Kotioli Udi and the northerner cousins to the Horngths. The imposing Baikali Udi or fondly nicknamed by the legionnaires stationed their bull people. The Tavais or more commonly known as the Sea Elves were cousins of the Alphalnora Elves who broke off a long time ago before the Elven continent was torn asunder in two. They are amphibians in nature capable of both livings within and outside the bounds of the ocean. Many of them would often go down the roads of piracy and raid shipping lanes that the majority of the Empire's navy protects as the trade galleons go to and from the great port city of Suviel one of the most important economic hubs in the empire outside of Herring Point herself. Your hands are stretched and can go no further right now any attempt to disrupt this equilibrium could cause significant consequences. Subtlety is still, Mita was about to explain to the emperor the importance of censoring the troubling developments when suddenly a loud crack of the door erupted the solemnity of the imperial study room. My lord I have a message, a servant said. Esclau. How dare you barge in at this hour while I have a guest? Alden reprimanded. Forgive me Imperadr, but you informed us that to not disturb you unless the news is about Tyrion, the servant apologized. Well, I have all the people involved here with me. This message is from the Prince of Tyrion himself. The messenger informed. The Emperor grabbed the scroll from the messenger and dismissed him. He was still somewhat insulted by the servant's sudden disruption of this discreet meeting but to hear of news from Prince Clovich himself. His own vassal was abrupt. He suspects a trick could be in play since this letter was given at a suspicious time or maybe it was a coincidence since Tyrion was quite a distance from Herring Point at two opposite ends of the Empire, to begin with. But a letter from the Prince might shed some light on this saga. Meta can you examine this? The Emperor handed over the scroll to the Crow Grand Master. After a brief moment of external and internal examination which involved a break of social protocol that letters be read first by the intended recipient before anyone else to search for signs of a forgery. This one is authentic Emperor. No signs of a forgery and this is indeed Clovich's childish handwriting. Meta said. The Prince of Tyrian was known by other nobles to have the writing skills of a child since his pen strokes lacked any form of grace and had the boxes and wormy curves that a beginner, mostly a child would have had the calligraphic skill of. The Emperor grabbed back the scroll from the crow and began to silently scan the document. My Emperor, I have the most wonderful news to share to you. These other worlders who came to my lands a few months ago showed me things I thought were only impossible. As I write this, they have helped me make my crops grow, dealt with those pestilent bandits and enforced peace through their own brand of wisdom which I am now currently studying for myself so I can improve my statecraft being the crossroads of the Empire and the Eastern Suzerainties. They will soon help transform me and my kingdom into their own vision of what the Empire can be and I write this to you my lord to visit Tyrian when you have the leisure after dealing with those Dosni tribesmen up north. It is too late for him. He is dabbling in the dark arts. He is slowly being transformed. Owen panicked remembering the prophecy he saw. We need to rally the legions immediately and call forth there. Petrick Dorf tried to wrest a sense of urgency only for his booming voice to be blanketed over by another booming sound. What was that? Carlyle Silverdane asked. My lord, 
The capital is under attack by a swarm of dragons. An imperial guardsman barged into the room to warn the emperor. Under attack by who? Alden asked. The thought of any army suddenly marching their way past dozens of forts, settlements, and patrols without detection or suspicion was preposterous due to the sheer size of the legion and the empire. I do not know but we must hurry to the cellar, the guardsman warned. We must hurry. Protect the emperor, Petra cried. The party soon made haste downstairs in the imperial palace. The study was at the top part of the palace and was the most vulnerable from a dragon attack. Thankfully the dragons have yet to fly towards the palace so they might still have some time before it's too late. The servants, the guards, and any government staff raced to the cellar as the stairs, hallways, and rooms became a flurry of stomping feet from the windows overlooking Herring Point's harbour. The emperor to his horror could see the dragon attacking Herring Point. It was a large creature with flapless wings that shadowed over the waters and coastal structures of the imperial capital like a giant's titanic height over the average man. The dragon was followed by two smaller dragons and what looks like from the distance sprites of even smaller dragons that spat fire to ground burning all in its path. Smoke, fire and splinters of debris coated the bay and the harbour district as the loud thunderous roars of the chaos the dragons emitted. For Grandmaster Rowan, he feared the worse of great fire devouring his city as he stood there frozen in place as he comes to the thought of the vision he saw before his sight was ungracefully taken away from him. Grandmaster, we need to hurry. Carlyle pulled his hand but the old man shook the mage's hand away. He remained speechless as the otherworldly dragons passed by the palace. Their wings a sharp roar that shook the bones of all those who heard its wings. The prophecy is now unwinding in reality just as he feared it. The end days as he foresaw as the demons have returned to now enact their revenge against the people of Gleesia. Yet death never came. The dragons simply passed by without any heed to the obvious target of the Imperial Palace, or the Mage's College or the Imperial Dome. Were the demons playing with them? Taunting them to fight? Grandmaster Rowan. Let the Griffin Knights fight these demons. They have been deployed as we speak. Hurry to the cellar. The Imperial Guardsman ordered. Above Herring Point's clouds, the Griffin Knights, all proudly three hundred hundred of them flew off immediately from their stables in a scramble to intercept the dragons. They had their fair share of experience and knowledge of tactics to eliminate such a beast which is through overwhelming numbers and hit and run with repeated lunges with their lance before the dragons could react to a swift counter. But the griffins realized too late as soon as they ascended to the skies that they were known open and by the standards of their youth. A slow-moving target. Fox 2 Pegasus 4 said as he fired an air-to-air missile at the Griffin Riders. The missile darted across the vast distance between them as it shot down one of the riders easily in an explosion that also managed to kill from the resulting fireball three other riders. The Pegasus squadron easily made short work of the Griffin Riders until the unit was disintegrated in a matter of one minute. If the gunfire didn't kill them first, the large drop would to the sea would or failing that, the sea itself. As the people of Herring Point despaired at their defense's disintegration and the lack of preparations for a siege. Suddenly, the bombardment stops. The chaos that ensued from Unicorn Squadron only extended to the Arsenal District and the port areas of the harbor. People of the Empire of Slaeja, a booming voice echoed that came from the largest dragon. A cloud of steel glides above your city. We are the United Federation of Earth. I am tasked for the protection of the colony of New Albany, the otherworldly city that you dared to attack unprovoked. We know that it was you who tried to assassinate Governor Jeremy White and Prince Clovich Rianne with your barbaric poison gas attack. This is your only warning. Seize hostilities and allow open diplomatic talks, military access and economic trades or we will destroy every city in your backwards empire to dust. You have only one month to agree to our demands, the voice said. It was in a fluent but alien accentuated vigory. Such arrogance, Linda spared her teeth. It looks like subtlety is no longer an option for the Empire no more. Now all of Gleesia will know that the youth are here, and they just made their most poignant debut on the world's geopolitical stage. We cannot allow these other worlders to just vandalize our great city. The Imperial Guardsman protested. Look, 
It looks like the dragon is leaving. One of the palace servants pointed out as the large cloud in the sky turned its tail and flew away from the city, as if satisfied of the damage it had caused. The attack was meant to intimidate, not yet to devour. Lords and ladies, knights and squires, rally the magi, the grey order and the houses. We need heroes to save us. These could be the end days that Jeltagar's comet has spoken of. Emperor Alden called forth. Chapter 27, A Land of Passion and Sun, We Got New Orders, Samantha declared as she walked into her squad who made themselves at home at their land cruiser's vehicle bay. Crocker was performing preventive maintenance with his old but reliable exoskeleton suit. Diaz was observing the latest social media posts, Abedia cleaning Leah and April obsessively, again. Clay eating a shoddily constructed grilled cheese sandwich and then finally Ken, with Iris was sitting together with the vampire reading a book and the Nigerian pointing her some important facts and details, but as soon as Samantha's voice was heard, Strider group stood up from their spots some practically dropping any item they had on hand. And of course, Diaz was the slowest to straighten up as Samantha passed through. We will be deployed to Suville, a coastal city west of Tyrian. This is a study and observations assignment. Our objectives are to explore any possible diplomatic, economical or scientific leads that we may encounter there. We will be among the first of us to venture there. Expect sunny weather and cool nights so bring some shades and sunblock. Samantha said. Iris, we will need you to be there with us. You sure you're okay with a lot of sun? Clay asked the vampire witch. Just pack me some extra sunblock if we have to go out during the day. I am quite fond of the ones for the sensitive skin. Iris informed. Normally vampires explode into dust when they see the sun. How come you just need some sunblock off the women's skincare section and you're good to go? Abidaya asked. Well you see everyone, vampires in Gleesia and the way you depict vampires in your culture are very different. Iris answered. Explain. Samantha asked with an intrigued lean on her posture. My great-grandfather, King Martin was prodigious alchemist at his time. He forged several recipes of many potions, tonics, oils and other concoctions that can help alter the essences of people. Make them stronger, faster, resistant to poison and even changing their hair color. He was hoping to make such effects permanent before the Empire conquered Tyrion, the vampire explained. Are you saying Martin was trying to chemically alter the genes of people? Because that sounds just like what you're saying, Ken asked. That is what you call it? Then yes he is trying to change people. Genes. I don't recall pants being involved since most people in the Cambervale Valley work skirts. No. No, that's J-E-A-N-S for the pants. I meant G-E-N-E-S. Those words are homophones. Words that sound alike but different spelling and meaning altogether. English can be confusing sometimes. So yeah, genes with a G. Are those little string rope things I showed you on a picture of DNA strand some time ago? They make a person have uniqueness, like your eyes, hair color and how tall you can be etc. Ken explained. I see. Back to King Martin, before the Slay agents conquered what will become the Empire one day, he made his children drink a concoction that he had made in his lab. He called it Filter of Immortal Power. The potion was said to give a non-magical person the ability to be able to cast magic not only for him but for his offspring too. The effect of this potion is what you see in me today, with all of my vampire traits and flaws. Iris said. So, let me get this straight some product of a chemically induced eugenics program. As in King Martin wanted to make his children magically empowered. Ken pressed further to confirm. Indeed. There were some effects to our genes that made us like vampires such as our affinity with using blood to substitute for mana crystals, our said occasional appetite for blood and our sensitivity to sunlight which dampens my ability to cast magic. Although this potion you call sunblock gives me immunity to lay soul's gaze, the word of speech we call for the sun shining. Also being in the sun without having sunblock on gives me the most unsettling malady of ricketiness. Iris said. Maybe it's the UV rays. I don't know. 
I will call Dr. Malona about that later when he interviews with King Martin. He is quite impressed with your grandfather's achievements, Samantha said. That would be most welcome, Iris said. She picked up her digital tablet, which was actually just Cairns whom she borrowed it from, and turned back to what she was reading. What are you reading? Samantha asked the vampire. It is a compi, lay. A. Iris stuttered at the unfamiliar word. Compilation of Roald Dahl's best works, Cairns said. I am helping her understand English and this was something I did back in first grade was to read some Roald Dahl books. He answered. Wait until she gets to the crocodile. Not me, the crocodile in the book. Crocker chuckled remembering how that novel ended. I am at the chocolate factory right now. Iris answered. Oh, Wonka is doing great these days despite not really changing anything for the past hundred years. I could just kill for some nerds and Wonka bars. Diaz commented. Halt. There is a Wonka candy company. Does that mean Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is a biography? Iris asked in a facade of surprise. A moment of pause followed before Clay burst out in laughter, followed by Samantha and then Diaz and then everyone else. Remind me to buy you some nerds one day Iris, Ken said. What is so hilarious right now? Aliathra suddenly interrupted. The laughter ceased as Strider Group turned to the elf who appeared before them in her standard elven range armor but the clothing underneath her leathery exterior was replaced from her tainted range raiment for a long-sleeved and breathable, via a special fabric that allows the skin to be cooled easily, anti-perspiration shirt in green-leafed camouflage. The shirt is often worn in light temperate climates but it is also a popular item sold off of military surplus stores around the youth space. Oh, I was about to get here but Miss Lethe will be accompanying us on our journey to Souville. Samantha informed her squad. As a what? Clay asked. A political flora and fauna and as a cultural sensitivity expert Samantha explained and I can use my my restoration magics to heal any injuries or maladies you may obtain during your travels Aliathra added how can we trust her Ken asked she has no choice other than us Samantha said we need her to help us give some context to the political intrigues of Gleezio and Iris is with no offense to her is only just an arcane expert for us a brief beat in pause played out as the squad slowly accepted that the fearful and wary elf maiden is now going to be part of the youth from this point onward well she is taking the back of the cruiser Crocker said shame I was looking forward to having her back in my car again. I was even working on a recon package, off-road wheels and a minigun. It would give me a break from looking at my phone for the road, if it means Clay would stop staring at my phone all day. Diaz joked flirtatiously. You know, I want my fix of glamour girls too. Clay argued. His voice leaked with testosterone with those words. The pointed one looks like one I tell ya. Diaz chuckled. You two privates, please, refrain from any devious or amorous advances from Miss Lethe from this point on. Additionally, your car stays in New Albany Penal Soldier, Samantha reminded him. Diaz kept his mouth shut but in Samantha's eyes, she can see that he may try to do so again behind her back. What about the leads? What kind of leads are we going to check out there? Abidia raised his hand. Well. Prince Klovich's cousin is a start. Governor White has sent some delegates to formally introduce themselves to Duke the Bald VIII. Robert Bianchin and Luya Amirian will be some of the delegates. Speaking about Luya, he told me about a business partner that buys some of the Tyrian wine he sells to his establishment with close ties with the Grey Order and the local community so it would be a good place to start for a grassroots campaign. Samantha said. Suville? The Pearl of the Dragatoy Ice Coast? I know. Someone there. Aliathra said. Who? Samantha turned. She wasn't much obligated to tell the elf where the team is going rather on orders from Colonel Polonsky was to just ensure that the elf princess turned consultant in custody to do what she was told. A. Diplomat who was a former sea captain. Has done several things for my family before. He has a. How do I say? The uncanny ability to acquire hard to obtain items, she said. A smuggler? Diaz asked. Yes. Aliathra nodded. 
He can get you magical items from Alpha Nora that normally would have been forbidden to get outside of my homelands. Sounds interesting. We'll write that down for later. Samantha said. Get your gear and be ready to move out tomorrow. Dash. Meanwhile somewhere in a busy street corner in New Albany. Dash. Hold still. And cheese. The photographer said as Prince Clovich's eye was bombarded with a bright flash of light. He was in the photography studio in New Albany today to take a photo of a piece of parchment papers called a passport. The prince was told that he needed to have this document so he can travel to Earth, the capital of the United Federation so he can be officially received by the General Assembly in a location called Geneva. As he was told by Governor White, he will be in front of many high-ranking officials of the other world as government and he needs to make a good impression if he wants to further secure his friendship with the youth. In addition, he had also requested Governor White to arrange special educational tours round Earth so that he and a select group of some of his court's most brilliant of scholars to record so that he can use the knowledge for his own use. He wanted to see the great steel farms that gives birth to the youth's flying boats feel the magic of their energy trees and see firsthand the other innovative mysteries that made the youth such a godlike force compared to everyone else in Gleesia. If they could cure his sister, who was now at that moment beginning to skip merrily like a child for the first time in her life, again then surely, they're capable of other divine feats. Leaving out of the studio, he was then overrun by several of the other worlders who carried the same magic device that he observed observing him back in the photo studio called a camera. According to White it was a recording device that inscribes visual moments or as he explained it memories of the eye. Do you have any comments on the recent expansion of military activities conducted by the youth in your realm? How do you feel now that your sister, Princess Aria has been cured? Do you think the youth does the better jobs in dealing with banditry, threats or security issues in your kingdom than the Grey Order or even your own troops? Do you ever feel intimidated by the youth with all their far advanced weaponry? What do you expect on your trip to Earth? He was bombarded by their interrogatives that he almost had a knee-jerk reaction to draw his sword, but the youth personnel attached to his retinue dismissed the crowd of questioners. All questions shall be answered at the official press conference. One of his Earth human attaches told them. The retinue moved away from the crowd as they made their way to their car which will take them to the new Albany spaceport. From there, he will wait another day as his ship is prepared to make the journey from Gleesia all the way to the youth capital. From what he was told by his sister, the whole world looked so small from so high. He couldn't wait to see that first hand. Dash. The next day, Dash. Strider Group's land cruiser was on the road again, passing by the farms of the Cambervale Valley of the Principality. The Mrap tactical vehicle with its heavy cargo of Strider Group's many necessities and equipment from two weeks worth of rations, Crocker's exosuit and several other ordinances that were lodged tightly on the car's exterior. It wasn't as agile as it was back in the desert tomb attack a long time ago but it didn't matter for Ken who was on driving duty. The cruiser was however just one of six other Mraps that escorted a three supply trucks filled with Lunar Amirian's merchandise ranging from exotic goods from the eastern suzerainties, Tyrian berry wine and woodworks from Vercourt. It was a fairly standard shipment that Lunar sends through biannually. Normally he would just delegate them to one of his employees but he wanted to personally introduce the youth to the Duke of Suville himself. Robert Biongchin who lobbied his way into an economic attaché for the expedition was also part of this convoy on his own rap. From what the lieutenant could understand, the corpo is definitely going to be scouting for something, somewhere or someone. She just doesn't know what that big piece of money bags is looking for. Not even Diaz knows when she asked him since he only just get orders from Bobby and is allowed to get any loose valuables as a bonus. Abi Dyer was not on his usual cheery self, just stood there quietly as his hands clasped together with his fingers twitching in anxiety, or maybe it's just a feeling of withdrawal, perhaps, in Samantha's own intuition it's being away from his family again for another extended amount of time is starting to put a dent on his psyche now, 
yet the long-bearded sniper needed those benefits a soldier would entail for his family. Iris again was still reading her e-books again. Still at Roald Dahl no doubt. Then there was Eliathra, her eyes gliding back and forth on everyone around her. The elf's fingers twitched every minute as mounted up. Pressure surged in her. It was not healthy as Samantha comes to foresee. Eliathra? Is what's up? Samantha asked, trying to make the elf's obligatory assignment less nerve-wracking. What SSSS app? The elf turned in befuddlement. I mean, how are you? You were very quiet before we left. Is there something bothering you? Samantha asked. No, it is nothing. I am just feeling. How can I say this? Estranged. Aliathra answered. Estranged? How? Samantha pressed. It's one thing to know who your party is, it is another to see them with my own two eyes, and in such a tight space, I you are all, this is all, all new to me. The elf confessed. Oh, I ain't that scary. Crocker broke his silence, you have the strength of a bear and the face of a sailor, I feel intimidated by your presence. She said to the half Maori, I can be fun too every now and then. Don't be. I am here to protect everyone here including the lieutenant. Lewis reassured her. Aliathra then turned to Diaz. And you, you still terrify me in a way you live. She pointed out, almost with an accusing finger. I am alive and every sense of the word. I feel, I cry, I sleep. I still want to know what it feels like to fly. Damn it, I wish we can ride a Pegasus one day. Do Pegasi exist in Gleesia? Diaz asked. The heraldry of Suviel is a Pegasi on one half and the other a son. Aliathra said. Interesting, would go great on the record. Samantha smiled slightly. Oh, that reminds me. She grabbed from her bag a small cylindrical object that Samantha held like a container. She took of its lid and with a soft velvet-like cloth began to wipe the glass surface of the device. To Aliathra's own memory. It looked like one of the demon eyes that she recalled seeing months ago after that illusion spell she helped casted, albeit, after careful study of those eyes that she concluded that they were no more but new type of recording device or medium of recording, a camera as they call it. What do you know about Suville? Anything interesting? Samantha asked. Suville is veritably split into two distinct boroughs. Old Suville and New Suville. The old borough consists of two to single story stone houses which were, in ancient times carved in from the rocks in cubic shape with sometimes an orange painted dome over it. But you can easily tell them apart since their walls are almost always white in color. Sounds like Mykon knows actually if I am getting this right. Samantha commented. There is such a place in your world? Aliath returned with intrigue. Yeah, other houses in the old borough have painless windows. Cool during hot weather and warm during cold weather? Samantha asked. Indeed. The harbor, the fisherman wharfs and the commoner district are all located at the old borough. Suville used to be a fishing village before the empire turned it into the trading hub that it is today. Aliathra said. What about the new Suville? Samantha asked about the latter borough. In contrast to the uniformity of the old borough. The new Suville is much more, impressive, distinct and more colorful. There lies the nobility, the college and the shops that makes Suville rich. The buildings there are more distinct from each other and taller too. Still the houses are built from the same stone as the old borough for the same reasons for the inhabitants. Aliathra said. How rich is Suville? Samantha asked curiously. Outside of the taxes they keep for themselves. The city and the surrounding province have a rich wine and arts culture. Many painters, aspiring cooks and even carvers go to the Kulgayo Sophisticadig Selfacrift. That is the college that they go to perfect their skills and learn new techniques. I always wanted to see the galleries that is always open to the public. Aliathra said. Sounds like a lot of fun. We should go there and see them in action while we are there. Samantha smiled. What about problems? Something that troubles the place a lot. Even the richest of cities aren't immune to a bit of shit every now and then. Crocker asked. There were cases of farms being set on fire which can cause the price of food to go up quite often. However nobody knows why the fires happen. 
Then there's the pirate attacks that happen or the results of said coming up to the harbor. Aliathra said with a slight cringe. There are also the fights that happen between several menstrual groups, but that's another story. Nothing too crazy I say. Crocker recalled from his experience. Their conversation continued on for about the next two hours. Aliathra as soon as Strider group loosened up had her suspicions died down. Abidaya talked about his family and how he wanted his daughter April to see Aliathra again since she was a huge fan of princesses albeit the little one doesn't know the full truth that the elf is indeed or given the context was a princess since the girl just assumed any exceptional beautiful woman outside of her mother and maybe her school teacher to be a princess. Kane talked about how Strider group, although mostly, it was his efforts and patience, that they managed to convince Iris Kadahag and the vampire witch to be a valuable partner and consultant in their colonization of the planet and even told her stories of times Iris enchanted several of the youth's weapons to even more devastating effect. Clay who was the newest member of the squad before Aliathra joined in has an interest with cooking ever since his teenage years working as a preparation cook as a part-time job before enlisting into the army yet for some reason. Slicing onions was the one thing he vehemently despises doing in an otherwise preferred hobby. Yet for all of their small talk one thing that Strider Group said that tickled the elf's ear was their reasons for being in Gleesia in the first place. Opportunity. The opportunity to rise, begin anew and climb. They all wanted to better themselves. Even Iris said that to her outspokenly. Samantha wants to prove her abilities as a team leader. Abidaya wanted a better life for his family in an untapped land of possibilities. Diaz wanted to build something that would stand the test of time. Crocker wanted to wipe away the horrors of his past by going somewhere quiet yet he still struggles to fight his inner monsters away. Ken is seeking a promotion and a career for himself as a combat engineer. Clay wanted to see some adventure to write about to his family and friends back home. Iris wants to further improve her magic, alchemical and enchantment capabilities and see that the youth could take her to places she could never dream of. Strider no longer felt like a group of intimidating outsiders but now living people with dreams, aspirations, desires and fears. So. What about you Miss Luther? What do you want? Samantha asked her. The elf looked into herself. She remembered that albeit her parents were a loving, caring and protective pair who ruled the Earth Island elves sternly. She felt an invisible leash on her neck. Behave a certain way, speak a specific word, formalities and more formalities and the expectations of all the nobles of the court expect from your typical elven maiden. All concepts from the great elven philosopher Soed, a writer who came up with thousands of philosophical and sociological writings that the elves follow in every step. Elves are gerontocratic, the elders are the most revered for their experience and wisdom collected throughout the years. Women are expected to be the guardians of their homes taking care of the day-to-day -day housekeeping and ultimately the defender of one's valuables stored within. They were also expected to behave immaculately with chaperone meetings with those of the opposite gender, reservations upon the males and to be the torch of reason to balance the man's fiery heart. Yet she was still so naive to the ways of the world despite so its expressions to promote a stable and time-standing society. She never really knew how to react to men outside of her brother and her father as education back in Alpha Noro is gender segregated. The only time in her youthful years where she could interact with a male was when she is in a chaperone soiree. Slow and graceful dances, proper courtship and talks were to be expected. Only when an elven maiden has finally chosen her guru that the more restrictive measures were lifted and the more passionate stages of courtship could begin. This was done for more three millennia in Alpha Nora and still prevalent even after the elven split. Aliathra still has yet to find her gua. None of the noblemen and boys back at her home. All of their attempts in her eyes were just social climbers looking to get their blood into the royal line even though the real prize was her sister Ithiel who is the heir to the Astilbian throne. Secretly between her and her sisters, they would read several human books behind their parents and servants backs of tales of gallant and daring heroes who with their wit might and guile triumph against the odds and swept the maiden of their interested affections of her feet and ride off to the sunset, 
roguish yet honest when he needs to be. She and her sister fawn over someone like the heroes in their stories, weirdly enough but uncomfortably close to her. Diaz fits several of the criteria, witty, guile, mighty in the sense of his battle prowess but the only thing that he seems interested the most is not the prize of the delicateness of a woman's hand but more on the next great thrill, the next great payout or his next conquest. A hedonist who thrives in conflict, still charming but not the perfect vision she had, but then again, perfection is not the same for everyone, yet, Alphil Nora despite its rigidness still had its redeeming factors. The zenith of scholarly knowledge of all of Gleesia is the envy of the world, the lush and untamed wild lands filled with nature's fertile bounty and the most brilliant architecture in the world. Yet even then, it wasn't enough for her curiosity of the outside world to get the better of her. Reading the books and foreign hearsay from traders and other minstrels about the hills of the Slaegian heartlands, the titan-sized mountains the dwarves called their home and finally the great oceans of other far-off locales she never heard about. I wish to see more. See more of the world. Aliathra answered, well we are called Strider Group after all, it means we take long steps everywhere we go. Samantha smiled, yeah, we already took you to a place you never thought was possible already. Diaz smiled. Just then. The land cruiser stopped suddenly with an abrupt stop with an equally unbalancing of everyone's posture. Thankfully the seat belts saved them from flinging themselves all over the wrap. What is happening? Samantha asked Kane. We just stopped. Hang on, Kane said as he zoomed his eyes over several new figures that emerged from his view. A patrol of horsemen, a mix of armor varieties they wore. Most of them were wearing a light adornment of leather pauldrons and vests whilst one man in particular wore a full complement of armor. Then Kane's eyes caught one of the armored one's shield. It was the half Pegasi and half Sun Herald Resuviel proudly flies as their standard. What was also distinct of the knightly one was that the colors of his clothes flamboyantly golden for his metal protections with a puffy gold and red doublet underneath his armor. For his top wear, the knight sported on a beak helmet otherwise known as a bassinet and on top of his helmet, a rainbow-like bouquet of colorful feathers. He stood there like a work of art in contrast to the plain green camouflage of the cargo trucks and the bulky yet heavy load-bearing wraps. Samantha quietly grabbed her rifle in preparation for any danger but she kept her restraint as she was only allowed to fire her weapon if she was attacked upon. She opened the hatch that leads to the machine gun pintle of the land cruiser and slowly rose up. Just as she did, the lieutenant Solia Amirian emerged from one of the other mraps in the convoy and hurriedly greeted the knightly figure. Luya, do you know them? Samantha asked from her position. They are just a border patrol. Relax let me do the talking. They all know me. The dwarf reassured her. She observed that the dwarf presented him with papers to the Suveli knight who examined them. It was a routine border patrol with a side of customs declaration. After some talking with the knight, the Suveli leader returned the important looking papers to Luya and then gestured to the rest of the convoy to follow him. We will need to meet with the Duke Thibault first in his castle at this hour first before we deliver my merchandise to my clients, he wants to talk to you very eagerly. Luera said, hang on, I thought it was merchandise first, then meet the Duke. Bianchin protested over the radio. Thibault can be a very demanding one based on my experience, it's rude to turn down or be late for his summons. Luya insisted that the convoy adjust their plans. He is right Byongchen, we are not in a position to negotiate at this moment. Samantha said, you make a point. All right we will follow them to the Duke. Lead the way. Now, where the hell did I place my diplomacy perfume? Byongchen said before he hung up his radio. Luya nodded to the Knight of Suviel as he got back into his car. The patrol watched the strange foreigners in their horseless carriages closely as the Knight of Suviel galloped to the front of the convoy to lead them to his liege lord. Yet Samantha at the meantime stayed at the machine gun pintle of her land cruiser. She quickly reached back in to assemble her professional camera, 
she hid an instinct that she will be given the scenic route of their journey throughout Suville. As a studies and observations group, one of Strider's key functions is reconnaissance which is just in her eyes a fancy term for a photography tour. She had always a knack in handling the camera as she used to be part of the photography club in her high school back in Quebec. Canada. She volunteered to be Strider's photographer due to her being the only person in her squad who can do more with a camera than click a button and shoot. Her mandate as given by Colonel Polonsky is to take photos of the daily lives of the natives, local flora and fauna and other interesting locations. They are planning to create a more visually appealing encyclopedia of all the important information of Gleesia to be sold publicly courtesy of the Youth's Bureau of Education and their connections with book publishing corporations. This slightly disappointed Samantha as she wanted to keep some of the photos for herself to hang on her wall like the beautiful sun bathing the warm green hills of Souville that she immediately shot for the books with her camera. She had only taken a few official pictures of Gleesia before but not on official recon missions such as Iris Old Home, Tyrian City Streets, the Tomb of the Desert and some important landmarks surrounding New Albany that she just took for fun but had to turn over as the camera and the content in its SD card were government property. She did try to appeal for at least accreditation for her work but so far now answer from high command as all photos were either classified or just said youth military corps. File photo. Despite not being the true owner of such remarkable sites digital immortalization, Samantha still enjoyed the thrill of finding that right moment to shoot her camera. The green empty hills soon became farmlands of wheat, vine and fruit with farmers planting and harvesting their crops. Focusing and rapidly clicking her camera she took over 20 photos of the Suvelli farmlands. She smiled with a slight giggle as the photos she took and will most likely take within the immediate future might be mistaken for photos of Italy's Toscana region unless otherwise stated that yes, this is the new alien planet that teemed with sentient life and functioning civilization. But then, Samantha realized after that, the philosophical, religious, sociological, economical and astronomical implications of elves, dwarves, dragons, magic and most outrageous of all, other humans living in a fantasy world like planet, people might dismiss at first of such preposterous revelations as some sort of cover up or propaganda campaign to push in more money to the dying youth colonial expansion programs which had undergone several scandals involving corporate favoritism and embezzlement. She fears that Prince Klovich and his entourage may be dismissed as cosplayers when they make their appearance at Geneva soon. Can you hear me, all of you? Sure. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Souville, the land of passion and sun, Luya Amirian announced on the radio. The farmlands disappeared from view as Samantha felt the cooling winds of sea breeze, woodworks and boat family-sized dry docks for small fishing and sailing vessels alongside Myconian-like stone-carved homes that the Suvelli commoners live, with their distinct paintings to set the apart from the Greek lookalikes and to show some individuality Samantha took aim and captured these homes from the distance of home wrap. Thankfully the car and the convoy were moving as fast as the steps of the knight's horse. She noticed as she took multiple shots of the houses that the paintings were all individually unique to set the inhabitants apart from each other's but judging by the painting's fresh looking frescoes, it looked like a more recent thing, perhaps the arts college work. Some natives stared at the mysterious strangers who came to their land. Some even feel intimidated by the roar of them raps engines which according to some sensitivity studies conducted by Dr. Malona and Dr. Hainanel reminds them of beasts and monsters. Samantha, wanting to at least do what she could to diffuse first impression tensions waved a friendly hello and a gentle smile. But she didn't have time to see the results if that one act of cordiality made any changes to their arrival. Speaking about their arrival. Samantha noticed that the streets were getting progressively smaller the deeper they are into the duchy, from open dirt roads to stone roads wide enough for only people walking on foot or horses being pushed up, the convoy soon felt constricted, especially the cargo trucks containing Luna's merchandise for this trip. The night guy just halted, 
He says we can place our steeds at the stable before we move further into Suville up to the inner city parts. The merchandise will stay here. Luna knows the stable master and he can arrange porters to take his stuff out. Come on. The Duke awaits. Bobby Bianchin radioed. I will need to put this on. Aliath return over her hood covering her face. Disembark Strider Group. Samantha ordered. The back of their wrap opened up as the squad emerged from their vehicle. Immediately afterwards the squad could hear the startled screeches and gasps of passers-by. Seeing the metal beasts spew forth people from its depth got people to recoil. One rather well-dressed woman fainted to the back of her maid servants. All right. Viking and Apache will come with us to the Duke. Jada, you guard the trucks until the porters come. Samantha called out. Every other Yufsog unit nodded and followed. Alongside Bianchin's personal retinue of PMCs and Mirian's trusty bodyguards, the mission pushed forward towards the deeper borough of Suville. The streets were narrow but more paved with bricks. Additionally, and quite amusingly, the paved bricked road had some worn out paint traces of flowers ranging from red, blue and yellow from what the lieutenant could discern. There were small rotundas, colored homes in contrast to the mostly white commoner houses, patios, flights of stairs, inclined rises and aesthetically pleasing trees that gave the affluent new Suville Italian-like and laid-back feel. Another aesthetic distinction was the vibrant art scene ranging from statues embedded as fountains, memorials or artistic bawdiness, which was more of the latter, whilst paintings that decorate every street corner as they walk were of a cornucopia of food, wine and naked cherub-like figures serving bottles of wine to naked people below like mana from the heavens. It was hard for the likes of Diaz, Aliathra, Ken and Bobby to not get distracted by the beautiful scenery as they walked. Especially Aliathra who ogled at the feminine statues whose faces and postures displayed the carefree illustration. Even the people, who dressed in clothes belonging to the Renaissance era completed the Mediterranean look of whole borough, that just made them. Their shiny metal gear and vests stand out like if a group of airsoft players accidentally stumbled into a Renaissance fair. Suville had a distinct ambience sound of a mix of children skipping playfully on the streets. Nobles traveling under the sun with their velvet umbrellas, craftsmen rushing on their businesses and minstrels playing their latest creations for a few scraps of gold coins on their feet. Compared to Tyrian however, Suville was reserved in population for every one Suville person she saw. There would have been three Tyriani. Samantha was relieved at quite the tone down of pace. The crowds at Tyrian were tense and a human jungle of danger that lurked in every corner. In addition to the practical aspects, Samantha took this opportunity with her state-issued camera to take some photos of all the places and people she is seeing for it was inevitable for the natives, civilian, commoner, noble and guards alike to take notice. What knightly order or mercenary group are you? You don't look like any I have seen, commented a guard. By the gods you look so tall, handsome even. How about I show you a good time brave sir? Enticed a bordily dressed courtesan. You are unusually tall for a dwarf. And unusually. Dark. Died. For any of them. A passerby said. Wine? Way bread? Sissish. Hungry after a long day? A merchant peasant peddled his latest produce from his farm. Is that? Green paired with brown? That will do no good here in Norva Suvelli. Buy some of my finest gobs. I am sure we can find something that much as you. A peddler marketed himself. He was quietly ignored. All eyes were at them indeed. All words spoken were about these strange new visitors to their idyllic little bubble. All ears of the natives fell on whatever rumors that they heard about from whom had heard second to first handed information about these other worlders. I hear that one of them can slay an ogre with his bare hands. The rose-dressed one in the grey-haired one in the velvet doublet are said to possess the great magical power called Kapu Ritchik. Their mages seem to be tireless too. They can shoot so many spells within a few hours without passing out. Samantha paid heed to those murmurs. They were neutral sounding but potentially sliding down to the fearful stages of opinion. Fear can be a double-sided sword as she knows. It can keep a person submissive or it could make another angry towards hatefulness which will only lead to violence. They need to make a positive impression to allay such fears. 
she heard of the chatter by the marines back in New Albany of some sort of mission taking place herring point with the Aurora and from the way they whispered nervously to each other, it had to involve violence of some shape or form, it will be inevitable that news flow down from the imperial capital, look up, there it is, Lulia announced, Samantha's eyes met shadows as she looked over what towered above her, a great majestic castle of fairy tale like proportions, or the gate that leads to it at least greeted her. At least five towers that scraped the sky, a garden filled with a painter's palette of flowers and flamboyantly dressed servants and guards patrol the grounds. A loud trumpet followed, blaring out as their feet stepped on the castle's courtyard. The guards shifted then locked their feet and weapons in salute while the servants bowed down towards Lulia and the rest of the diplomatic mission. Master Lulia Amirian of the South Castle Mercantile Company has arrived, the trumpet blower declared, Welcome again Sir Amirian to Castellastro Somi, as you can all see, my name is quite known in these parts. Come on onwards, we have a duke to meet, Amirian said. The delicate exterior of the castle was perhaps the most remarkable architecture that Samantha captured on her camera. She remarks that the guards that patrol the premise focused more on status symbolization rather than practicality. Equipped with a sword or a halberd with their colorful doublet that displayed Suville's coat of arms, nothing more than toy soldiers who were only good at marching and the occasional pest infestation. By their green faces they looked like they'd never been into an actual fight in their lives. The knights on the other hand that apparently leads them looked more experienced and battle-ready in demeanor thanks to their armor and more assorted weapons. The youth made their way into the door of the castle proper and followed the knight and several servants who now attached themselves and followed their every move. They were light-footed as to not heavily trod the marble floor of the castle which had an exquisite interior filled with paintings, statues and other decorative that were proudly reflected upon by the nearing noon sun. Another great door stopped them. This time, Lulia silently gestured Bobby to tense up and be ready to make a graceful entrance. Oh, here we go. Time to dress to impress. Diaz smiled as he picked up from out of his hands his splashy biker jacket with glittering roses as its print pattern. What are you doing soldier get back to your... Samantha said but was interrupted by more trumpet blaring. May I present you mess to Lulia Amirian of the South Castle Mercantile Company and Roberto Bianchin of the United Federation of Earth. An announcer declared with a glaring mispronunciation of the youth's name. Diaz was already covering his chest rig with his jacket whilst the rest of the soldiers in the mission holstered their guns. They marched down to the Duke's throne room under the sight of dozens upon dozens of what appears to be nobles and foreign dignitaries residing in Souville. People in all shapes and colors, races, eyes and heights were in attendance. Some dressed like one of the Suvelian nobility in their oversized doublets and puffy dresses that the men and women wore, the rest wore their native nation's indigenous garments filled with furs, leather and strange feathers, they whispered to each other, very much about these strangers who walked into their little gathering, probably commenting about their appearance, demeanors and uncanny resemblance to other humans. The lieutenant couldn't tell since these whispers were inaudible to her ears or were masked by the gentle music that played by the door to give this gathering a sense of elitist bliss. Welcome Mirian one of my favorite merchants, Duke the Bolt said on his throne. He was short man with long curled hair and a gut produced from overindulgence. His demeanor judging from his giddy movements was ecstatic, like a child awaiting something exciting to happen and hello again. You are still the same as I last saw you, was it? Four? Maybe five years ago? Miriam answered. Five, I think. I was bedridden with the most atrocious of fevers at the time. Please, tell me, may you introduce yourselves to your friends? I heard great and wondrous things about them from my cousin the Prince of Tyrian, the Bolt said. Certainly may introduce you to Roberto Bianchin, leader of this adventurous delegation to your fine realm. Marian introduced the youth to the Duke. Your Majesty, it is with my utmost and warming pleasure to be here today. I am Roberto Bianchin and I represent the youth mission to your city. We wish to discuss trade, peace and other promising and mutually beneficial deals with you and my 
my master's back in New Albany. Bianchin bowed, the Duke happily observed the aliens, his eyes marveled at Crocker's armor, the exotic skin tones of Ken and Clay and Diaz is outworldly but enviable to the eyes of all of the guests, his jacket, but then his eyes turned to Aliathra, who was still under her hood. Thibault's face turned red, slighted at his disrespect that the elven princess in accidental exile gave. Do you know it is rude to wear a hood under my presence let alone in a party? Thibault scolded, reacting quickly, Diaz and Bianchin stepped in. Oh, I guide. Sorry my lord. She is very shy. You see, Bianchin said trying to maintain his diplomatic tone. Diaz on the other hand whispered to Aliath Resleaf shaped ears. Play along, we can't afford to risk exposing you. Diaz whispered, before the elf could react. Diaz unceremoniously pulled down Eliathra's hood revealing her astonishing elven braided hair. The crowd in the room gasped in amazement at the sight of the elf like an angel descending from heaven to grace them all. They know she was an Alphanran elf thanks to her clean and civilized demeanor compared to the sea elves more rugged and tattooed covered faces who normally mind you dear reader are supposed to be segregated at the wharfs and rarely climb up to the uptown borough of Nuva Suvali. Such a beauty like you shouldn't be covered in that hideous garment so oh no. The bolt approached Taliathra. A. Hey, sorry Duke but. I guide. She is very shy and not very used to social interactions. Please can he continue on? Diaz tried to diffuse. Oh. By the gods in heaven. I got ahead. Yes. Pardon me and I apologize for my abruptness. I always get seduced easily by such lovely faces. I do say. Yours is perhaps one of the most striking in this gathering here, the bald complimented. The crowd murmured again by the Duke's statement. Some of the ladies who are dolled up in makeup, jewelry and the finest of clothes silently expressed disdain. The nobility's efforts to outshine their peers in the latest fashion and beauty trends stolen by a visitor who was not even trying to stand out in front of everyone's eyes. Samantha could only conclude that this Duke the Bald the Eighth is a very decadent individual. If that gust and raiment of his and his airheadedness on diverting his attention from a monumental first encounter with a pretty face, then the lieutenant might as well set her military college notebooks on fire. We will discuss those terms in my officer chambers after I introduce you to my court's best and brightest. My ministers and some of my closest confidants would love to meet you Sir Bionchin, the Duke said. Oh, please you can call me Bobby if you want. I will be your new friend after this anyways, Bionchin said. Team, let me and my bodyguards alone with the Duke for now. Go enjoy the party for now. The delegates journeyed off with the Duke who with a bashful smile, introduced his closest friends and ministers to them. Handshakes salutations and fanciful introductions were exchanged successfully. Bobby's charm marketed like any slick corpo would with the nobles who were smitten by his princely-like demeanor and elegant tone. In almost the same way, Strider Group and the rest of the youth soldiers were approached by the other attendees of the party. Questions bombarded them such as, where is this kingdom called United Federation? What is the name of your knightly order? What do you think of our fine realm of Suville? Some of the more machismo attendants were smitten by Iris, Lieutenant Rose and Daliathra and were observed attempting to make fawning solicitations from the three women, but were shot down thanks to Iris's physical but subtle attribute of stronger grip. Me and these other ladies are not interested, she said, and their pursuant courtiers retreated away. Thank you. Iris, Samantha asked, with gratitude for me too. Aliathra nodded. I prefer to enjoy my wine in peace. Shall I recommend the piquant granvas? It's something only noblemen drink and I saw a manservant pass out some goblets filled with them. Iris returned the favor. The women of Strider Group took some of the sparkling white wine that Iris had pointed out and after a moment for the rest of Strider Group grabbed a goblet of wine. Except Crocker who just had a goblet of water to maintain some professionalism and Clay who was more of a liquor man took a spirit, they were allowed to only have one round of alcohol in party to avoid offending their host who had arranged such lavishness for their arrival. 
and no more. Samantha raised her glass to the air and cheered her friends. Santi and Chin Chin. That means cheers back in Quebec or my house at least. Samantha proclaimed. Cheers. Strider Group said. Ben Ostra. Iris said in Vigory. Dewey. Aliathra meekly said. It was just an effort to fit in but the sense of camaraderie between the other worlders and Iris was evident. Samantha noticed and cheered the young elf up. Don't worry about anything. Just do what you're told and you will be safe with us. She reassured her. But Aliathra still held fears that her family and the other Ethylon elves might still come to rescue or avenge her supposed corruption. Dash. Earlier the day at a bat at Herring Point. Dash. Despite the chaos, the despair and confusion upon the wake of what the people Herring Point could only describe as their oath of the demons. The Slaeagen Empire's military nobility and other such support structures that kept their civilization stable were working at clockwork rotation. Postmen, messengers and scribes worked tirelessly to send forth letters to as many of their prefects, vassals, allies about the terrible news of the capital suffering from a brazen attack by otherworldly barbarians who dared challenge them. Religious officials, arcanist and the monsterologists debated reviewed and studied for any connections of these sky people to any other phenomenon or occurrences in Gleesia but to no avail. Legionary generals and high-ranked Grey Order members rallied the populace at first to rebuild what was damaged by the attack but then ultimately recruit more into their numbers for an inevitable clash with the united Fae Ashen, and amongst the Grey Order and Legionnaires in the Sanctums. A plan is being concocted in a hope to save themselves from what some believe to be the second coming of the demons. We need to make the covenant with the Great Crystal Heart. Emperor Alden said, The Great Crystal Heart was deemed the holiest of relics in Sanigrad. Legend speaks that this wheel-sized crystal had bestowed its blessings to Kuldol of the Slae tribe in order to beat back the initial demonic invasion. According to the scriptures, the heart gave a piece of its flesh to Kuldel which bestowed him awesome magical enhancements such as enhanced health, resilience, agility and strength. His duel against the Allbone was the greatest example for it was said that they fought for a full week without pause. Additionally, the blessings the heart gives also to share a protoist affinity with all aspects of magics but not to the same extent in one branch against someone who studied specifically that branch all their life. The heart right now is underground in a secured vault deep inside the great cathedral of Herring Point where it remained inert unless it is activated again. You are asking us to perform an immensely dangerous ritual. Owen warned, the ritual of Recrudes, the means to reawaken the heart crystal from its dormant state requires it to expend a large amount of mana inside its specially sealed sanctum in most likely dangerously fatal amounts. But the risks compared to the takeaway was immense. It is said that the heart when hearing its prayers and being surrounded by the dancing sprites of its energy flowing around it can give not only blessings but foresighting visions of welcoming guidance that Kuldel had said to hear when he bade the heart to ask him how to defeat Dolbone and rescue his betrothed. No sacrifice will be too great for our survival. Alden shouted, I will burn through my entire treasury just to get you the mana potions and crystals you need to complete the ritual. We just need you to gather all of the best mages that the Empire has. I will also see to it I can get any mages from our own colleges to assist you. Lindus said, Any help from you is most comforting to hear. We will also have to be ready to receive the blessing on any chosen heroes that the heart will select so gather your best troops and guildsmen to the cathedral and wait for the heart's blessing, but if the chosen one is outside of the capital, have your knights ready to set out and follow where the crystal shall guide us. Carly added, Gods protect us all. I fear the fires of the goddess of death lick my feet. First our city and now perhaps my own colleagues and students. Owen sulked down. He knew that he will also have to participate in the ritual as the master of ceremony. The possibility of death, failure or even more maddening visions afflict his psyche. He might not survive or perhaps see one of his colleague or students that he had befriended, worked with and tutored perish. But if it is for the future of the Empire and the whole world at stake then he must be ready to pay the price whether he wants to or not. Very well. Petra. 
tell Priout Cadliza Hewitt and also the Grey Order to come to the cathedral at noon after three days from now. Gather the best that you can and also horsemen in reserve in case we must ride immediately. Owen sighed. Sir Hewitt Kaza, the Priout Cadliza or Grand Commander of the Slay Agent Legion would be at the time coordinating the rescue and rebuilding effort of all the damaged areas of the Imperial capital. A valiant man with a tendency for audacious acts of heroics but also an eye for talent to be assigned into some of the most decorated and battle-hardened regiments of the Imperial Legion. It would be natural for a soul like him to be escorted by nothing more but the finest men to ever had the dutiful honor of carrying the Empire's banner across all of the known corners of the world. Your will be done your excellency. Everyone except Emperor Alden said. Owen, Petra, Carlyle and Linda bowed as they went out of the Emperor's underground chambers that he uses for emergencies such as the unlikely event of a siege or a coup d'etat. It was not as opulent as he otherwise intact palace above him but his advisers recommend to wait out underground with the rest of his court until the reconstruction of the herring point is completed. Servant, may I see the map of the Principality of Tyrian itself? I want to review some battle plans. Alden whispered as soon as the rest of the council dismissed themselves. As you wish my lord, the man's servant said. Dash the next day in Souville. Dash. The mornings at Camp Gilly Leaf was reinvigorating and picturesque for Samantha. The sun gilding the golden and olive lands that make up Suville was worthy of a shot of Samantha's camera. Afterwards she went to her military laptop that have now been connected to the Metanet just now and uploaded all the photos that she had received to High Command and the intelligence agencies. The grounds were in fact the structural wooden remains of an old fort that was abandoned a century ago and after an hour of cloaking the perimeter with camouflage invisible to the naked eye of any activity unless you can get close enough to break through the forest colored veils, and a headshot from a sniping sentry. The Duke assured the youth and Luna Amirian that the fort was situated in a place that no one in Suville would ever venture to yet still has a road that connects to the outside world. Nice shots lieutenant, I nearly forgot these were official recon photos. Responded in text by Colonel Polonsky. More will come soon Colonel. I am actually enjoying this. Samantha replied. Good to hear, got any interesting leads? Specifically, something that Dr. Malona can use about the native's magics? He has been asking for them now. Polonsky asked. We have one from Meliathra of all other sources. Some sort of seafarer who ships items from Ulfil Nora of arcane content. We'll investigate soon but Byongchin says we need to get more acquainted with the locals first. Samantha explained. Very well, Godspeed. Polonsky out. The lieutenant closed the lid of the laptop and stored back her camera as she turned around to see the rest of the youth soldiers are either finishing up or just completed their breakfast and their morning hygienic activities. Crocker, after configuring his exosuit for the day waved at his superior. Sergeant, Byongchin came up with a lot of leads last night. I was assigned with one. Samantha informed, can't wait to begin today. Hey, LT? You got a moment? Crocker asked. Sure. Is there a problem? Samantha asked. Oh no, just some small talk while the rest of the boys gets ready. Crocker answered. So, I only know you graduated at the youth military's North America camp, right? Under what course? West Point. I took the defense and strategic studies there. I can analyze, evaluate and then solve problems within a geostellar context. Then there's operational arts, counterinsurgency, persuasive communications, all to properly communicate tactical decisions and actions to the youth's policies, Samantha said. But it was robotic response. In her heart she knew there was a hole in that sentence that she doesn't know the answer to. As for the camera, well I used to be a member of my high school photography club. It was either that or the swim team and sharing the same room with Rebecca. She was Big B. Samantha loosened her tongue off of the uncertainty. And what is the youth's policy to the Gleasons? Crocker asked. It was the million dollar cross examination anomaly to Samantha. What was the youth's policy? To all of this, all of Governor White's actions were essentially him putting on a kind face to the natives and the Colonial Affairs Office was only going through what Jeremy could produce positively. 
They had no real power outside of a few paper pushes to Whigs much higher in the political food chain than them. There was no official policy of diplomatic, economic and sociological interactions with any sentient civilization, pre-stellar or capable of space flight. Just theories, contingencies and some psychological concepts were dating back to when the youth was known as the United Nations before the Third World War. Governor White was juggling both his official mandate of running the colony and the unforeseen duty of being in the front lines of humanities or Earth humanities first contact with other beings who would have guessed that the first aliens they meet are people straight out of a fantasy rebounds per game. There is none officially yet. We are just going with what is the most convenient for the colony's safety right now. Samantha answered. Sooner or later, this planet will be opened up. The Whigs can't keep the rest of the youth from knowing about this planet. Eventually more colonists, corporations and soldiers will come down here. What will happen to the elves, the dwarves, those beast people and all the rest? Will they be naturalized as citizens? Or will we make them strangers in their own homes for our own ends? What say you give? Crocker asked. Samantha took a deep breath. Her second in command is right once again. What will happen next once the youth fully devotes themselves into Gleasia? If it were up to me, I would make sure we never repeat the same mistakes our ancestors have made during the golden age of colonization. Samantha said from her heart, she values utilitarian ethics on emotions and consideration of the other. Interesting choice lieutenant, but others might have different ideas. Crocker nodded. After that second, a loud double clang was heard. It was a bee dyer who had just finished eating a freshly cooked rice pilaf with teriyaki chicken breasts for his breakfast. Let's do this guy. Woo. A bee dyer enthusiastically jumped. Ken again was with Iris talking to her before he and the vampire stood in attention. Diaz was helping Clay pack his spare batteries for his radio while Staley Aethra carefully retightened her tiara like braid worthy for a fair elven maiden such as herself. Strider Group Byung Chin got some interesting leads for us. He delegated them to all of us and we have the privilege of having the least dangerous one. Samantha said. According to Byung-Chin, he has met a merchant by the name Galbert Sagan, the wholesaler of wine barrels in Souville. According to Ludera, the Sagan family wine dispensary and taproom has deep connections with various important people in the duchy from the nobility who he sells for their fancy banquet parties, taverns whom Galbert supplies the more upscale of beverages to and of course exporters. Byung-Chin wants us to talk to him and see what we can make of some his social connections and if we can get ourselves on his web too. Samantha said. Where is his place? Clay asked. Near the ports. His largest buyers are the exporters and not too far away from that is some of the taverns after all. It's a two-storied building with a basement of an unknown size but I am sure that's just where he keeps all of his wine. Samantha answered, the tavai that I talked about is by the ports all of the time too. We can stop by and meet with him. Maybe his latest shipment is one of the items that your scholarly friend back in New Albany requested for. Aliathra added. Dr. Malona is his name Miss Lytha, but you make a good point. I will let Command know about this too but first stop is the wine dispensary. Samantha acknowledged. Now with their orders clear, Strider Group boarded their land cruiser and head off into the golden sunrise. Today was the first day of their mission into Souville. All that the squad can hope, pray and dream about is for their mission to be a success. Chapter 28, Vines Full of Debt it was a bright and youthful morning for the novice adventurer Faith Lengarm Haik. He combed off his hair as he walked out of the inn that he stayed in Herring Point. After leaving his village which was a good two weeks journey to the imperial capital of Herring Point to look for opportunity, adventure, gold and glory, he was the only child of two impoverished landowners. However, before his parents died as he reached the cusps of adulthood the humans in Sainagrad at fifteen. They thought him swordsmanship and moral upbringings of good versus evil actions from his father and mother respectively. He had experience in real world professions when he was given the job in his village to be a deputy for the local prefect. Enforcing the virtues of every lawful good ruling and social expectations with the best of his ability, 
or the worst a small riverside fishing village can offer as a threat to it. He was commended by the prefect for being an exemplar to all aspiring youths who want to get out of their shells and do good in this fantastical world. This exemplar that is named Faith Len Reed and heard all the legends, stories, fables and ballads that he could lay his ears on since he was still illiterate at the present. They were his greatest delights to see heroes like the Empire's founder called Elstla A. E. Jack slaying the evil demon Lord Allbone. The tales of the plucky rogue who stole from disgustingly greedy nobles and gave their ill-gotten gains back to the people, or even the story of the fourth avatar of Thida, the god of virtue, Gerard who is as wise as the river. Whenever he heard the story of a new hero, he would ask the storyteller what became of him but to his disappointment. These heroes' times were such a long time ago that they were obviously long dead. Faith Len was discouraged. He wanted to gaze upon such heroes and to first-hand examine their example, for he had always wanted to be immortalized into memory and record as an exemplar of all that is good, virtuous and lawful in this world. Stained glass, ballads and books depicting him saving the innocent from monsters, winning the hand of beautiful maidens and being a good example of bravery and tenacity to future generations who would look at his histories with awe. That was what Faith Len aspires, to attain the noble recognition denied for him at birth after his father made several mistakes in running his farm under the proverbial financial ground. With only a few gold coins as his inheritance from his parents, his father's sword and a singular leather chest armor as his only means of protection, he set off to Herring Point to join the Grey Order. There were many opportunities for him to earn a living as an adventurer, monster slaying escorts, artifact, relic retrievals, the possibilities were endless. New friends, new horizons, and all the financial, socio-economic securities satisfied for a boy who has so much to give to this world. After getting initiated into the Adventurer's Guild he was already immediately given his assignment, help out the reconstruction, debris removal and rescue effort that were resultant of the recent attack by the demons. Faith Len wanted to personally curse the name of whomever dared strike at the very heart of humanity's achievement in this world. He was both enraged and horrified by the devastation brought on the Slay Aegean Empire's ports for Herring Point was the heart of humanity's development in Sanigrad. If it stops bleeding, the other cities and towns would wither. He tirelessly, selflessly and consistently pulled out the debris of off all the rubble on the demon attack's wake and if he ever heard a cry for help, he would without any hesitation drop what he was doing and rush to whomever needed his aid. Sometimes, he would need to help assist a doctor amputate the legs of an injured person or apply bandages all over an extensively maimed individual. Other times, he would be tasked to help some of the legionnaires pull out a family or a trapped citizen from the rubble. There were concerns from his Grey Order superiors who oversaw the new youths that he might have been pushing himself too hard but Faith Len paid no heed. Doing the right thing was to him like eating a banquet of his favorite meal of spiced, pit-roasted chicken. But today is different. He was told that there will be an important announcement happening in the Great Cathedral. One of the holiest sites in all of Gleesia and a popular place where imperial decrees are said out to the public due to the cathedral being open to all walks of life. Faith Len did heard from his fellow adventurers that the emperor after some time from the attack didn't make any immediate action but fled underground for his own and his own court's safety and he only now is he making any statements. All of the empire would be holding their breath, as Alden will be there address his people yet curiously for such a public event, that a large portion of all the pews on the front half facing the altar in the great cathedral were reserved for knights, legionnaires and grey order guildsmen such as himself, the wings were reserved on one side, the holy men of the clergy and another wing, which is normally where the choir would be stationed is instead occupied by the college of magi. He could see among his Grey Order colleagues a whole diverse cast of adventurers such as fellow fighters, independent clerics, a few bards and rangers over there, some of notable repute others he has just seen with his eyes for the first time. Whoever attacked us will rue the day they were born. One of the knights on the same row as Faith Len declared. Silence. Look, 
His Majesty the Emperor has appeared. And is that another adventurer appointed only to have his mouth left to gape when the Imperial entourage included none other than the Great Crystal Heart itself? Everyone in attendance in the cathedral were stunned with silence, very few of them ever had previously humbled themselves over the sacred artifact. They knew the centuries-long stories of individuals who were deemed heroes by the crystal's blessing. To bring it out here from its sanctum means that the Empire and by default the world is in grave danger, some of the more pious amongst them, knelt down to say a short prayer in the crystal's reverence. My people, I, Emperor Alden shall decree that we are seeing what is the second coming of Allbone, the demon lord of ancient times. Alden announced. The crowds burst incessant whispers. Many of the hot-blooded and patriotic warriors were up at arms and swore vengeance upon such a brazen act of vengeful defilement to their city, Faith Len among them. He remembered the stories of Allbone enslaving people to build up his armies and only empires. Founder, Cordell was able to fend him off by uniting the races against him in the Battle of Marnia's Bluff. He has returned in a new form, descending from the skies with his army and he had the cunning to call himself under a new title. The United Faderish of Earth. Even then, his armies have already spread themselves all over our sovereign lands and even made one of our princely vassals, Prince Clovich of Tyrian, kneel before him. They also come to believe they had also abducted one of the elven princesses and corrupted her into a monster with a cold heart filled with nothing but bloodied steel. Lastly, as you all saw with your own eyes, they had the gall to attack our fair city and demanded we bend the knee to them but we will not, never kneel to the one who had tried for our destruction and enslavement, Alden said. Crowds roared in the tune to his fiery rhetoric. Very few other occasions ever made the grand cathedral reverberate so loudly. In these trying times, we need to see a hero in what will be approaching our darkest days, Alden said as his eyes darted to the crystal heart that sat idly on its velvet cushion. Then the college magi began to raise their staffs and wands to the air and began to chant, concentrate or channel their mana, transferring their energies towards the crystal to wake it from its dormancy. Priests and legionnaires encouraged all of the magical gifted to lend their power as they began to enact the ritual of recruiters. They will pour all of their magic into the crystal so it can awake from its centuries-long slumber. Then through its wisdom it will select the most capable among all to be able to wield its power. Blessings of might, prowess and other untold powers shall be given the responsibility to the chosen one or few since there was a time the crystal had chosen four heroes to be given an equal blessing of its power. There was silence from everyone else as the mages funneled all of that emanated power towards the crystal heart. Minutes became hours and those hours became agonizing attrition for the mages. Some collapsed in exhaustion and those who still stood resolute, their chanting and postures degraded to beseeching murmurs and rickety legs. The ritual channeling lasted until after dark when the city lit up their candles to see through the darkened gaps left by starry and full moonlight of that evening. But just as the church custodians began to ignite the lanterns, the crystal began to beat a quiet but noticeable hum. It's a sign, the blinded Grand Master Owen exclaimed. Then the humming became louder. Those that still remained in the church awoken, the crystal has risen again. The mages, seeing that their progress has been rewarded, redoubled their efforts. They were however running on their own fumes, smelling salts and a few pieces of high calorized beef jerky smuggled inside the cathedral. Then the heart began to shake and its humming began to be louder than rhythmic. The attendants held their breath, as the artifact rose from its cushion a few feet. I have awoken. The crystal heart spoke in many voices of ambiguous accents, gender and tones. The crystal. The gods speak to us. One of the bishops shouted, I know why you awoken from me. You seek my power in these uncertain times. Many of you I saw waver but your faith and contribution are admirable. The crystal said. Oh, sacred heart. We seek a hero in these trying times and a prophecy for all bone has returned. The Emperor said to the artifact, For all of your deeds and feats in Caldell's wake, you are all still children to me. The crystal said, The one who will destroy the greatest enemy of Gleesia at the cost of his own life, 
the one who will exhume the world from its ashes and lastly the one who will bring about the new age afterwards. Three heroes, branded with my mark, the crystal decreed. Oh, sacred heart, who may these heroes be given your blessings? The emperor asked. One of the heroes is among you in this very sanctuary you built upon this rock. The crystal said. The attendants gasped. One of them will be given the honor of the crystal's blessings. Some braced themselves. Others doubted they might not be worthy and the rest were somewhere in between. For Faith Len he had the moral upbringing to see through the enemies of Gleesia, who are the demons who seek its destruction made him spiritually fit to be one of the heroes but he doubted that he has the mental and physical acumen to be one. He just barely started off on his own. The other two are in far away lands. I warn you however, you may not like whom I choose. You may even accuse me of foolishness but my wisdom is greater than the greatest of libraries and the longest of lives. The crystal warned about the other two. Then it began to glow as bright as the morning sun. It emitted forth three separate sprites of lights, floating illustrations of light in three different calligraphic words in the Uri. One says as to scold the word for the scholar. Next was Gweninager the word for shares between modern translations of Bane, anathema or poison. Lastly the next word ran Uprita which were the two words for share and hold respectively. Whenever the crystal sent forth its branding sprites to embed its power to a new chosen hero, the person would have a permanent, scar-like branding on their body, which can vary on location in many cases. This signifies their status as the chosen one. They began to fly off in a dazzling speed yet one of them encircled the cathedral gatherers whilst the other two left off for wherever the other chosen ones are. As the branding sprite left behind to select from the congregation, the attendants held their breath. Some prayed for hope, others for strength but overall, they all prayed for one thing, salvation. Then Faith Len's eyes saw the sprite descend towards him. A-H-H. The novice adventurer cried as he felt a burning sensation on his forehead where the sprite made contact with him. His tears reflexively erupted in pain as he covered his face. He never felt such a tremendous and sharp agony in his quiet yet virtuous life. His feet carried him in a panicked frenzy out of his pew and onto the walkway as all eyes in the cathedral turned to him. The crystal has chosen him. One of them said, Son, are you okay? One of the priests ran towards the young boy. Several members of the congregation gathered together to help the branded chosen one rises up from the floor. There was noticeable green-blue glow on his forehead that Faith Len was hiding behind his hands from view. My child, show us the brand. The priest requested him. Faith Len complied and with great pain revealed the brand he had received. It was Gweninager, the brand for the anathema. It is seemed that you will be the one to destroy the demons. Alden said. Pecha, get this man to the Grey Order headquarters and have him attended to until we can find the other two chosen ones. Magi, trace where those brands went and bring the chosen heroes to me. We need them all gathered here in Herring Point and once we do. We will figure out what our next move against the United Federation. Everyone nodded. The Grey Order seniors carefully picked up the young novice of their guild and carried him away. Whilst everyone whispered, gossiped and heralded, Faith Len in all of his body, mind and spirit felt ignited with a commitment to destroy the demons who threatened their world, at any sacrifice necessary. Dash earlier that day in Suville's old borough, Dash. The smell of wine-soaked wood permeated Sagan family's wine dispensary and taproom. It was a large wooden structure near the ports of Old Suville where the contrast between the resplendent new borough and the simple constructed old borough met albeit by local land laws. The dispensary is within Old Suville and is subject to a tax system that is distinct compared to the new borough. Strider Group was lucky enough to catch the owner, Haruf Sagan owner of the dispensary, and the patriarch of the Segin family name, Gree, Samantha launched her salutation only for her if to twitch violently at her sight. Ah, I already said I, oh, I thought you were one of the Jodent slackies. My apologies, Haruf replied. Greski Joden doesn't hire women to do his chores for him my love, said the Segin matriarch, Eridov who entered in with her red dress as burgundy as the wine she sells. 
We were here in Souville and we heard that the best wine collection is sold in your dispensary von Seguin. Samantha said out her intentions to the Seguin in a haphazard yet genuine attempt to address a man of such title her respects. Alas! I regret to tell you that all of my wine has been reserved for others I am afraid for Dame. Haruf sadly answered. Oh! I am not here to buy wine. I am here to talk about some of your clients. Just some pointers. I mean just some notes about who are some of the most prominent of folks here in Souville. The lieutenant pushed further diplomatic. The Duke, the Balt is one of them although I believe everyone here in Souville knows about him and his luxurious parties for diplomats and foreign merchants lately. Then there's me, who supply most of the taverns and parties here in Souville. I can show you some of the best taverns here in our fair realm. Haruf said. Oh damn. Are we on Recon or are we the Michelin star guide? Crocker commented. Some of the squad laughed lightly on the Sarge's words. That's actually pretty funny. Diaz grinned. Really? Well, I am allergic to prawns I am afraid. Stomach can't handle them for some reason. I blame genetics. Crocker said. You are weak against prawns? Iris asked. A. Allergic. Snow White. It's like your sensitivity to sunlight if it weren't for the sunblock you slap every day. Crocker answered. What about this Gresky Jodent? Samantha asked. Be quiet. Don't let any of his thugs hear you. Haruf suddenly shushed. How come? Samantha asked. I rather not talk about it that much. All I can say is that he is one of my clients. Haruf explained yet concerningly he was beginning to sweat. May we change the subject? Even though all of our current stock has been either reserved or awaiting shipment, I can talk to you about our collection of wines ranging from our reds to our whites in perfect detail. Arido proposed. Mama, are those knights? A small boy emerged from the counter. He had blonde hair but contrasting orange-colored eyes. Oh Philip, what are you doing here? You shouldn't disturb your parents when we are talking with clients. Haruf reprimanded his son. Knights. Well. Yeah. Pretty much if you can say all of that. Abidaya smiled at the kid. Forgive my son everyone but he is a very curious boy. We let him run around freely in the dispensary since he will one day inherit the family business one day. Aridov said. Well, exposure at an early age is quite a start for Dame. Perhaps you can give us directions to these taverns we may, Samantha said but was interrupted when the bell to the dispensary's main door was opened. A frail old man emerged from the door. He walked meekly towards the counter with as much determination as his withering legs and the unofficial third leg that was his cane could muster. Alongside him was a child-sized but green-skinned humanoid followed by his right hand. I have come for my pickup, the man said. Sanjulf, my dear, cutting in Zorda please. Philip, help your mother, Haruf said. How is everything? Haruf then turned to the old man. Nothing much, just me, opt to and a bot. The lonesome hearth has always been the same. Old, rusty and a bit rough, but still standing tall, Sanjilf said with some melancholy. I see. Your order will come up. Oh, these are some of the foreigners that the Baron is entertaining right now. Herif introduced. You are not from around here? I don't recognize that armor. Are you from the Dwarven Mountains? Near the Everwinter Lands? Sanjilf said. No, we come from another. World as you can say. We are here to see the sights, part of a diplomatic mission. We want to see all the sights here. Meet new people, Samantha replied. And taste some food. Diaz chuckled. Well, allow me if I am not being so pushy with you my lady but you can visit my tavern, the Lonesome Hearth Hostel by Cal Point. It is by the ruins of the old lighthouse. If you travel southwest of here and follow the road all the way without turning anywhere else you will see reach it. If you want to take a good view of Souville then Cal Point is where you can go, Sanjilf said. Sounds like a place we can stop by later. We will meet you there soon. Samantha accepted. Really? That's wonderful. I am so happy I will have company, Sanjilf said. Here is your order Tilda. Aridov smiled. She handed the old man and his green-skinned companion a cart wagon full of kegs of wine. Sanjilf lead Aridov to an awaiting wagon that he commandeers before he set off back to his tavern. You notice how happy he is? Haruf said. Yes. My team will check out this Cal point soon, Samantha said. 
I rarely see him smile. Sanjilf rarely gets any visitors apart from the occasional artist from the art college looking to paint a picture of the view from Kal. Haraf commented. Why? Is he actually struggling? Samantha asked. Haraf nodded. Where do I begin? Perhaps that storm. You see, Ibot is. Was his wife, Sanjil for young cook looking to make his own in married into Ibot's family who were the stewards of the old lighthouse. There was a storm on a particularly rainy season. Haraf explained. Go on. I am listening. Samantha said. Her eyes widened and he mind thirsting with curiosity. Ibot's father and brothers were on the lighthouse that day, as if by the god's own will or maybe they displeased Elios, the god of the water somehow. A lightning bolt struck the lighthouse so hard that it collapsed down to the cliffs below. All that remains was its foundation and a few remnants of its walls. The lighthouse was moved inside the wharfs after that tragedy yet Abot and Sanjilf never fully recovered from it. They lost a huge part of their livelihood since Sanjilf was still building the Smiling Siren which was the official name of the Lonesome Hearth. Ibot a few years later died of sadness over her family's loss leaving Sanjilf to be the inheritor of Cal Point which was under Ibot's family titles. Sanjilf wanted to repay her memory by making the Happy Siren Hostel into a great place to see the sunset and enjoy wine, food and song. He took a risky loan from the Jodan Bank to help kick up his little enterprise there. However, rumors abound of Cal Point being haunted by the ghosts. In exchange for clemency, Sanjilf had to lease off some of the land in Cal Point and also pay a special fee that he must pay every tax season unless the bank fully obtains the whole place. I know Sanjilf and he is a fighter but to see him spend the rest of his life wasting away his dreams is heartbreaking. You visiting him made him smile in quite a while I say. That's very sad to hear. Aliathra said. You mentioned Jodent again. Does that family name own the bank where Sanjilf got his loan? Samantha asked her off. Not just the Suville Ducal Bank, but the Jodents control the tax flow around here. The head of the family. And I will only say this once. Is the chief tax collector and many people dislike him? Haruf whispered. Why? Samantha asked following on wine merchant's discreet tone. He is not from here, but someone that Emperor Olden assigned to Duke the Bolt from all the way from Herring Point itself. His family took over the Duchy's bank, then the treasury and then finally the tax collectors. Many merchants despise him since he raised the taxes ever since he took over the Duchy's finances. The Ducal Bank might as well be called the Jodent Bank since he replaced all the workers there with his own ducat drainers. Haruf explained. I don't know. There's not much to do but just pay the taxes I am afraid. Samantha said. It's not that. It's those who cannot pay is the problem. Haruf said. Oh, I see. Samantha understood what the wine merchant was trying to imply. This Gresky Jodent was some sort of ruthless capitalist of sorts who is apparently controlling most if not all of the financial aspects of the Duchy of Souville. She feels personally disgusted by the cronyism and nepotism that must have took to gain such a significant influence but had no authority to say anything about that situation lest she violates diplomatic protocol. Well, my team has more duties to attend to Fonsua. May I know where I can find these taverns that you suggest us visiting? Samantha asked politely. From a strategic perspective, the Cal Point. Despite the scary rumors behind it was the more intriguing part of the information gathered, the taverns are just a means to not cause offense to the dispensary's owner and no more but simple sightseeing and perhaps a plan for a little food trip there when she and the rest of Strider group gets there are an R date coming up soon. Oh, I alone will be here just handling the pickup and other orders. It is my wife and my son whom you will be seeing quite often. She goes around the city making deals and negotiating with clients. My son tags along sometimes so he can play with the nobility's children. Haruf said. Dash 30 minutes later, near the Suvil's shipyard, Dash. Aliathra knocked on the door to a peculiar door deep in the heart of shipyard, Suvil's bloodline and connection to the world outside of Zanigrad. The port was bustling with offshore sailors, merchants and other peddlers that supports such a maritime tradition. 
The scent of the sea and the sound of coast-dwelling birds fill the air. The elf insisted that she does most of the talking with these Tavai or sea elves as she calls them since they tend to be weary against non-elves unless it is their usual sort of foreigners whom they trust to conduct meetings and trades with them. Lamath and Gwaven I Gwenin no Nin, a voice said as a pair of eyes emerged from a peeking hole carved into the door. It sounded like some sort of passphrase. Lamath the Louis Vital Gwen and Canon Aliathra said. The eyes peeked at Strider Group, then back at Aliathra's Ocean Blues. Adelsin, the voice behind the door asked. Mubiaria. Aliathra said reassuringly. The doors began to creak sounds of unlocking as the door gave way and the former elf princess urged Strider Group to come inside. Samantha can faintly hear the soft bell ringing made by the winds coming from intricately woven hanging charms that were placed next to the door. They were a mix between a dream catches and Chinese wind chimes but replaced the pagoda ornament with an acropolis like one instead. What do these do? Clay asked. They are meant to bless visitors and ward off evil spirits. Aliathra answered. The room was quiet and minimalist yet in contrast very aromatic. As Samantha describes the smells it was some sort of mix of an odorous plant, tree or organism of sorts that she cannot be sure of but it had a similar scent to passion fruit but with an earthly scent infused with. She can tell since back home that was the flavor of deodorant spray her mother uses for the Rose family's bathrooms. What little features the room had was a carpet colored in purple with some oceanic iconography woven into the design in light blue. The tables however. Its legs were so short that the only feasible way to make use of it is if one sat down in the ground. Leave dot sandals, a tall bald elf person with blue and purple body paints exposed from his worn leather armor instructed sternly yet in a broken speech. Do what he says. Aliathra told Strider Group. Everyone complied. It took a moment for most of them to remove their shoes since they had to loosen the ties of their respective footwear which they took great effort to bind tightly on their soles to a form-fitting state. Aliathra then promptly lay down on the carpet, wobbling at first due to her prosthetic legs but she managed with some inconvenience, fashion an Indian sit. The rest of Strider followed suit encircling the table that the greeter instructed them to sit. Ladui, feet like Luntidani. The tall Tavai commented on the Aliathra's new legs. Sinani. Aliathra answered back in Elven. What is he saying? Samantha asked her. My legs look like the legs of some sailors. Sometimes wooden, sometimes fashioned over metal. Aliathra said. Oh, I know the history books. About peg legs we call them Aliathra. Not a fun time actually back then. You on the other hand are lucky, Cain said. Vitamin C for immunity. Tilda that's what a drink owned by a paro would advertise. Diaz chuckled. Vitamin? Iris asked. Eat fruits like the ones we eat and you won't grow up with wobbly legs. That and some milk, Cain explained. Princess, it is such a surprise to have you at my humble abode. A voice presented itself. An elf. Dressed in a silk toga came down from a flight of stairs and bowed down towards Aliathra's direction. My friends, this is the merchant, former shipwright and in name only. The Tavai ambassador, Zartrak. Aliathra introduced the Tavai to Strider group. A pleasure. Samantha nodded with a small bow from her sitting position. For hardened soldiers, who carry yourselves some grace on the table. Zartrak commented with a hint of surprise. We have some experience. Zartrak, how do you come to know of Aliathra? Samantha asked. She wants to initiate with some small talk before heading straight down to business. She clapped her hands in an effort to force a smile open on her cheeks. Me and the Lethors have a very fruitful relationship of the business kind. I sail between Suville, my home isles and to Ethylon frequently acquiring exotic goods that pleases the Entente's noble courts. I remember Aliathra when she was still a youthful student when I gave your queen mother then pearl necklace, courtesy of your father's payments, he said with a slight deflective tone. I see, Samantha affirmed. The lieutenant and the rest of Strider knew that this ambassador had a side job of smuggling magical items out of the elven lands and into the other continents. This house here you see, it is a haven for Tavai sailors. We see elves as you foreigners like to call us are often solitary. 
we prefer to be with our own kind. Also, being at the sea at home makes one miss the home isles quite a bit so I made this old warehouse here be as close to home as possible. Zartrek said. Zartrek. They know too. Aliathra tapped the Tavai. No what? I don't know anything. I am just a trader and my embassy is a haven to all Tavais. The ambassador began to sweat and his blood pressure jolted. We know ab. Samantha went to cut to the chase but was cut off by Diaz. Allow me LT. I can speak Black Mart. Diaz said as he stood up from the carpet and walked haughtily to the other side of the room. How rude. You shouldn't stand up from your spot unless I. The host permits you. Zartrek scolded. I am sorry. I was looking for there. Diaz falsely apologizes before he pushed his hand on a spot on the wall. Only for the wall spot to give way as he leans the weight of his arm over it revealing a hidden passage way. Your secret crystal stash. Don't deny it. I am a smuggler too. It's all good. Diaz reassured. Zartrek shrugged his shoulders as he gave up. Starting price. 3000. Zartrek said. Zartrek. That's not your normal price. You often sell mana crystals much lower than that. Aliathra said as she raised her voice in shock. Her ocean blue eyes widened as she turned to the now ashamed ambassador. My deepest and the most sincere apologies my lady. However, I, I, there was a problem a week ago, the Tavai said. A problem? Did something happen? Aliathra asked. The other told Onos. They stepped up their raids and it got many people angry. They stepped up the tariffs for goods being sold from Tavais. The guards have been asking for higher bribes to write off some of the more sensitive of goods away from our shipments. Zartrak explained. So, the mana crystals. You cannot. Let me ask. How do you manage to get your hands on them? I know you frequently do it a lot but what is your source? Samantha asked. A mix of loot from raids and miners wanting to make a clandestine sale to avoid mana crystal taxes. Eth Island is very sensitive about exporting mana crystals to the outside world but I managed to get away with it by buying protection through the royal family by doing some favors for them. Raiding black tree vessels, smuggle in a cephid liad or two, or even taking a few detours to speak Speaking about that Aliathra, your friend Lindis was on one of my ships and she was so eager to meet you again. Shall I inform her? Zatra asked. No, don't I. Whatever comes out of the elven embassies. Do not believe a word, Aliathra said. The elven embassy in Suville is quiet lately. All they do is party and the only work they have been doing is preparing for the gem for. Zatra answered. What is that? Samantha asked. At the end of summer, Suville hosts, courtesy by the Arts College's Amphitheatre and the school's grounds a series of games and competition that people all over Zanagrad and even as far as Alphanora come to play. It is happening about next week. It's where knights, adventurers or any able-bodied person can join to compete for honor, glory and of course cash prizes. But in essence, it's just an event the college hosts every two years to raise money for themselves. They can't just rely on art exhibit and tuition fees all the time you know. The paint I sell to them doesn't come cheap. Even if I ripped off of someone else. Yeah, Zatrak explained. Sounds interesting. Could look into that with Mr. Byongchen later. My boss. I mean, master. Samantha forced herself to say that last word in her sentence. She hated calling such an avaricious man her master. So Zatrak. I believe Mr. Byongchen will handsomely pay for those mana crystals. You just got to keep having a steady supply of them when we make the deal and it should all be good. Diaz charmed. It is not you agreeing to pay off what I lost. It's that other Tavai come to me and complain about the new tariffs unless you are willing to buy fish, dyes and pottery from us too I supposed. Zartrik inquired. I don't think they need those except the mana crystals from you. Aliathra answered. Is there a way we can help you and your people alleviate such pressure? A few I can think of. Certainly, convincing the financial minister Greski Joden to ease off the tariffs is a start. You already declined to buy from us at a premium and then there's getting rid of those other Toldonos so they don't make mine and the Tavais who just want to trade peacefully, look bad. Zartrak said. I think we can arrange the latter. Diaz smiled. Oh, you can? 
Do you have like the powers to rival our water and wind magics? Zatra casked, his hope raised from the depths anguishing economic stagnation. We in Apara Corporation have a much better magic. Diaz threw in the hook. We are rich. Zartrek swallowed the bait hook line and sinker after that. Suffice to say much to Lieutenant Rose's admission. She has secured a supply of unbenilium for Dr. Malona plus secured some contractual employment for a group of very special people. Dash, sometime later at Cowell Point. Dash. After a rough rap ride through the damaged roads southwest of Souville to Cowell Point, Sanjilf was not lying of the great view coming from the raised up cliff where the ruins of a lighthouse used to be. The old man plus from what they just found out upon closer examination was his loyal goblin servant and assistant Cook Octa was grateful for the company. He gave everyone of Stride a group a bag full of dried nuts as a thank you that clay. Crocker and Daly Throw are enjoying right now. So, Sanjulf, I heard the rumors. About your... Samantha began to talk about her insights to Sanjulf but the old man only sighed as if he had explained this many dozen times before. My lighthouse isn't haunted by banshees. They are what is the unpassed ghosts of my in-laws. Sanjulf explained. Let me guess. They died when the lighthouse collapsed. Sanjilf nodded quietly. Damn. I know what it's like. I can understand. My wife's mother passed away. Mylia is still trying to perfect that damn cookie recipe for April lately. Abidar commented. He was observing from his binoculars the scene. He noticed that on the right side of the cliff where they are standing on, facing away from Souville is a large and very picturesque beach if you can be rid of one scrapped remains of a derelict fishing boat alongside the beach itself being littered with an unhealthy amount of driftwood. It is said whenever night falls, the ghosts of my in-laws would rise up from the grave and try to operate the lighthouse again. Two bad ghosts can't make up such a bright light, Sanjilf said sadly. Hey don't be sad. At least we are here. Samantha comforted him. It is not that. My dreams. Seeing my dishes. The inn. Even these two eyes. They're fading just like the wrinkles of my skin. Soon I will die as an unknown note in everyone's memories. A true death as they say. I just wish that lighthouse never collapsed and perhaps I would have seen better days. Sanjilf sulked. I am so sorry. I want to let you know that I am here for you. You need just a little bit of kindness on your life right now. Anyone who made it as far as you deserve some respect. Samantha reassured the old proprietor with gracious gratitude. May your heart make the ground you walk quake with every step. Which reminds me. I wish to make my special dish for all of you. I really want to know what you think of it. Before they passed, my in-law said that they loved it so much that they wish they could eat it every day. Sanjilf said. Maybe just good for one person so we can all share at once. I don't want you to waste too much on entertaining us. You are already doing so much for us already. Samantha thanked for Sanjilf's hospitality heartily. None at all. Even if it's just one taste I still would love to know. I never smiled like this in over twenty years. Sanjil Fick statically jumped up with a youthful eagerness. Oh? What is the dish if I may ask? Crocker asked. Braised prawns in a sweet seagull root and chalambi stew with a side of grapes. Sanjil answered. Oh shit. Crocker cursed. Sanjil took over an hour to cook up his dish for Strider Group. In the meantime, Samantha took photos of the view from Cal Point whilst the rest of Strider Group sat down and took a moment of some rest. Iris explained to the youth soldiers that seagull root is perennial plant with a spicy taste, much like horseradish, as for chalambi, is a local souvelli dish that combines several greens mashed together while infused with a vinaigrette which makes a perfect salad alone or as compounded component for cooking other dishes when Strider Group except for Crocker, came to taste test the dish. They all unanimously praised it. Even the elven royal family would be impressed. Aliathra praised. She had always the finest tastes thanks to her acute elven senses plus the fact her palace chefs were some of the best in Alphil Nora has to offer. I rate this three Michelin stars, Diaz said. In his criminal days he would often psych himself before or award himself after a big job he would have undertaken by eating a chef's recommendation from Kessaheim's many fancy restaurants not too far away from where Aparo HQ was.
I do wish to eat this every day. Reminds me of Mama. Ken smiled. It deeply reminded him of his mother back home who would cook many traditional Nigerian recipes for him and his brothers to chow down. The sun began to set and there was some time left before Strider had to return to Camp Gilly Leaf for the night. She retreated alone back to the Land Cruiser, took off her combat gloves and began to review her pictures that she took for the day. There was the dispensary, a few photos from the Tavai Embassy that Zatruk allowed to have shot and of course Cal Point right then and there. But as she examined, her eyes began to be irritated from some of the lens flares she saw from some poorly shot pictures which she promptly deleted, but again, her eyes felt irritated from overexposed light. Samantha rubbed her eyes again, maybe it was some dust getting into her eyes now, but as soon as she opened her eyes, she could see it brightly coming straight towards her engulfing her view. She raised her hand forward in instinct but it was no use. A great burning pain was inflicted on Samantha's right hand. She winced and knelt down the ground as she saw her hand burn with smoke and a red gashing burn that followed with it. It wasn't in vain to your normal indiscriminate burn as she looked from what pain she has inflicted when her eyes managed to get through the seething smoke. The burn was some former mark, a branding of sorts that Samantha couldn't recognize. It glowed a faint light blue before fading out leaving the brand on her hand a reddish black and scar. It looked like the brand she had received looked like of a faint victory writing in origin due to the way it was constructed being similar to the signs she reads all the time when passing by around Senegrad during her tour. Perhaps Iris or even Aliathra can make sense of this if she shows it to them. LT, LT. Clay's voice cried from behind, it's nothing, it's nothing. I just... Boo. Samantha tries to explain and was about to show the strange brand to the squad radioman but she was again like almost way too many times as she could count in her juggling head, interrupted by someone with much more pressing matters. Not you. I got an emergency call from Apache group. Something bad happened. They got casualties. Clay informed her. Chapter 29, Bullet Storm Strider's land cruiser galloped loudly through the dusk-lit road. Many of the natives swore they would hear the thunder steps of a warhorse as they saw them rap kick up the dust as violently as a nightly cavalry charge. In the vehicle, Samantha was distraught as more context of what had gotten her and the rest of her squad to surge up to their feet. How many? Samantha asked on Clay's radio. Three dead, four injured. It's like those things were waiting for us, Apache Group's leader said. So, let me get this straight. You took a cattle rancher's quest from the local guild about the disappearances of livestock on a hill and your path lead to a... Samantha asked to make sense of it all. A sort of cave, I think. It's big enough for something like a cow to walk in. Could barely stand in it and then the attack happened. I couldn't get a good count on how many as we all had to run out. We managed to kill two of them at the entrance, but I don't know what the hell did my team killed. Maybe Iris can help. Apache lead said. I don't know. I am not normally familiar with animals outside of the Cambervale forest. Iris said. Aliathra, you were trained as an elven ranger, right? Maybe you can identify it. Samantha asked. Very well let me see the cadaver. Aliathra nodded, after a few more moments. The land cruiser arrived at its Apache's location and at the same time a medivac helicopter had arrived to extract the casualties. The squad walked up to the body bags of the deceased Apache group soldiers and paid their respects to the bereaved leader, Tivna. May you guide those departed to the great fields. Aliathra quietly. The monsters we killed are over their lieutenant. I will need to be debriefed but the rest of the medivac group will keep on guard. Apache leading form Samantha. Rose lead her team towards the entrance of the cave that she was told where Apache was before they were attacked. To her own notice, she indeed saw a few bones scattered around the approach of the entrance ranging from sheep cows and even a full-grown horse. The monster who lived in this den must have been very voracious. The den proper looked like it was crudely dug up but the entrance was large enough to fit a man inside one at a time with a very dark and intimate chamber. In addition, from a tactical point of view, it was a perfect setup for an ambush and poor Apache didn't stood a chance. Samantha then saw the two monster corpses that Apache talked about. 
They lay together adjacently, their bodies riddled with bullets. One of them was significantly larger than the other but they shared the same physical appearances of having thick layered plates that covered their bodies. Their heads were of a similar bullet-like shape much akin to sharks whilst their hands were as large as the paws of a bear but designed to be more rugged and hardy for manual work such as constant shoveling of dirt. As Samantha noticed a few specks of soil suck between the nails of the deceased beasts. That's a lot of bullets, Crocker said. It's two of them, Aliathra said. Two bullets? Looked more like a hundred or more of them each, Crocker argued. Not bullet as in those tiny bolts you load into your rapid firing crossbows. These are things are called bullets, Aliathra corrected. Explain, Samantha ordered. These animals, often called land sharks to humans or colbrawn to dwarves are underground diggers who often uses ambush tactics to hunt prey above ground. Although it is not known if they can see quite well in the dark, it is theorized by some druids that they can somehow sense their prey through sound vibrations. They have some really large and powerful teeth for a creature about as big as one of your smaller steel horses that you call a car. Aliathro explained. So, these two? Are they like some sort of bear? Crocker asked. Yes, by the looks of it they must be mated. The larger one is females and the male ones are smaller. Aliathra answered. Why is that? Samantha pressed. Let me see something first. Aliathra proposed. She picked up her ranger knife and began an in incision on the larger female bullet near its abdomen. With a twist of her knife followed by an application of force. The elven blade effortlessly slid across the land shark from left to right releasing its foul contents. It was a gory mixture of blood, guts, carnal remnants, a few bullets and those are babies, aren't they? Diaz asked. Aliathra nodded. Fuck. No wonder they were pissed. My wife was often very cranky when she was pregnant with April. Abidar commented. The male. You see notice these scratch marks and dents? Aliathra pointed to the smaller bullet. Yes, they don't look like they would result from our bullets. I mean guns. Blay, Samantha said while gagging. She doesn't know if it was a reflex from the hominem between bullet the ammunition or bullet the monster that is also secreting a mortifying scent which may be the alternative or combined source for the lieutenant's nausea. A female would secrete a pheromone from its genitals that attracts multiple males to her vicinity. They fight each other until the other couldn't take it and flees. Then the female would mate with the victor to produce these pups here. They look no older than a month in. Aliathra pointed to the discarded land shark fetuses. Talk about an early abortion. And I never can make up a joke about those shits. Yeesh, Diaz said. Are you implying that there are more of them? Samantha asked. The elf ranger cleric princess nodded slightly with a reluctant affirmation. They attack a lot of cattle, horses and now people. I say. We are doing the duchy a favor if we can kill a lot of these things for them. Crocker advised picking up where Apache left off. In my experience we are going to need a lot of firepower and a way to lure as many land sharks out. Abidaya gave his insights. These remains of the female's genitals. I know a recipe that can recreate the pheromones that they release but I will need to go to Suville's local alchemist shop to get them. Iris suggested. Just pour it on the ground and wait for them to pop up? Abidaya asked. No, in my time in the Ranger Academy, it's not enough to just pour some aphrodisiacs on the floor and wait for the bullets to come out. They have learned to read through that. We need to distract them by performing a sort of mating dance that involves dragging your heels on the dirt to this sort of formation. Aliathra gestured her finger around to visual represent to what Samantha can interpret as a figure eight. It has to be flowing and fast but large and bulky to successfully create the ruse. Aliathro explained. That is a tough one. I don't recall anything in our arsenal that can be agile yet bulky, Samantha sheepishly admitted. So, it is to be on the dirt correct? This mating dance alongside this aphrodisiac spell? How were you able to do that back in ranger school? Crocker asked. We telekinetically use the spell mage hand to move two large stones to mimic the movements I have described to you. However, 
success varies as it is hard to mimic precisely how the females do it. My professors theorized the more natural the mating dance the more males will be attracted to it. At best when we drift away those rocks, we would get one bullet and two if the gods favor us. Alas, normally within a given area there can be about 12 to 20 male bullets while half as much as for the females. In addition, we will also need to mimic the mating call of a ready-to-be-bred female which fortunately I know how to recreate perfectly. Ali Aethro explained. Say that again Ali. Diaz asked. His smirk curled from his corpo lips as smug as a sly salesman. Which should I refer to again for your scrutiny? Ali Aethra asked. The rocks. You say you drift them and it is to be very flowy? Like water? Diaz asked. Indeed. The elf confirmed. My muscle car. I can easily call for it to get ready with an off-road build and we can have it over here with my Aparo Corp connections. I am sure Byung-Chin won't mind or maybe he would. I mean, we need to start flexing here in Gleesia now that everyone is about to hear us. Might as well make a show of it. Diaz said. Clay face palmed and rolled with a chuckled. Are you telling me we are going to use motorsports to recreate a mating ritual? The radio man asked. Yep. I suggest you get your cameras ready on that one. I gonna make initial D these land sharks till their heads turn upside down yeah? Diaz smiled. I have no other options that I can think for these land sharks. Very well, Diaz make the call to Mr. Byung-Chin. Samantha said. I also suggest we arm ourselves with some armor-piercing tranquilizer guns too. I swore I saw some in the armory back in Gleesia. We need to slow them down so they don't instantly topple you over. I doubt your muscle car can survive a horny land shark look for some sweet poontang. Abidaya said. That reminds me. Perhaps you can also tell Byung-Chin to arrange some animal containment cells too? Dr. Malona and his scientists would appreciate a live specimen or two of these bullets, Samantha said. Will do lieutenant. Just go get that sexy time juice from that alchemists and we should be all good. Diaz smiled as he picked up his smartphone and began to dial Bobby Byung-Chin's phone number. This would probably be his oddest gambit yet. Dash meanwhile in Herring Point at the senior quarters of the Grey Order HQ. Dash. Faith Len had recovered unexpectedly quickly for someone who had his head punctured with mana. Most often the first time someone was struck with an offensive magic spell take a week or two, the first half to recover physically and the other recover mentally. The memory, the so agonizing first touch of what magic can do to one's body in terms of sabotaging vandalism of the essential order of a person was a cerebral test that the injured must surmount. Thankfully the novice adventurer turned chosen one was back to his active self except for the few elven pain patches made from the dried leaves of the aerolite tree, a popular item in every apothecary store shelf or any elf's immediate person. There were talks about importing the tree to Senegred but negotiations to secure the tree's fruits had went nowhere or were renegotiated to only promises of give more pain patches. The soothing leaves relaxed his muscles as the young boy looked at his head on the mirror. I am chosen, Faith Len asked. He looked at the burn mark on his forehead that left a seared orange burn on him. In his room he was watched over by Carlia, Pecha, Findrum and a couple of the Grey Order Headquarters custodians. The building he was involuntary residing in is the Grey Order Building, also known by its nickname the August Chalet. The guild was founded centuries ago, and Faith Len can still remember vividly what his mother's stories say how the Grey Order was formed in this plot of real estate in the heart of Slaeja. The founder of the Grey Order, an impoverished patrician by the name of Rainier Derindl, whom was sick and tired of city life and had the business insight of working as a mercenary thanks to his skills with a crossbow created the Grey Order a society of adventurers whom are impartial to whomever they chose for their services. They helped revolutionized and formalized how mercenary work and privatized security was conducted in Sanigrad. He built the Adventurers Guild from a motley crew of misfits into one of the most diverse and complex militarized organizations in Gleesia second only to the meritocratic honors of their more standardized legionary cousins, whom was said that several of the first members of the Grey Order were legionnaires who were trying to avoid rotting away in a brig. Indeed, 
You have the brand of Gwenninja the Bane. We need a cure. An antivenom to the poisons that is these demons that come from the east. Petra said, I do need to say I am still inquisitive on what the crystal empowered you exactly. Carlia commented as she looked over Faithlen. The young boy could barely hide his amativeness when he looked at her silver eyes. The mage knew that the boy was enjoying being glossed over by her yet it didn't interrupt her probing. Do you feel any burning feelings within you? Not like burning pain but some sort of warm feeling within your gut, Kalia asked. A bit. I mean I ate breakfast on bed and I was told to not do that as it gives me heartburn. Faith Len answered. I do not know the difference but do you ever know what happens when a person first realizes that they can wield magics? Kalia asked. I never really understood it. I came from a very quiet town and only ever hear it through whispers from my neighbors my lady. You see young one, about one in ten humans in Sainagrad are born with the innate ability to cast mana. It is an ever-present energy that only mages such as myself can harness. I remember in the stories of how Kuldel slew Allbone with magic weapons that he and several others made just to defeat the demons when they first came. Petra explained. He had known Carlia for years but she wasn't the type of person who would mentor newcomers. Petra however was looked up by many neophytes and it entailed. Having been inquired every day by hot bloods for advice, mostly about combat techniques and tactics. His default answer would be to just tell them to remember the training of the in-house weapons trainers inside the August Chalet whilst also being open to new ideas that they may come across during their quests. Well, I don't feel anything inside me except some of that pain from yesterday, he said as he twirled his limbs to loosen the tensions. The room was at that moment filled with stacks upon stacks of books scrolls and other documentations that Carlyle brought over from the College of Magi's library to help study. There were many dissertations, thesis, studies and treatises on mana crystals and Carlyle alongside Petra trying to make sense on what happened to the young boy in their care. Being called the Bane was still an ambiguous branding given to someone. What could it mean? All of this reading is having me gain nothing but strains. Petra, would you like to have some tea? Kalia asked. The faithful nodded. This prompted one of the chalet's custodians to walk out to fulfill the request by the senior Grey Order member. But on the way to the door, the servant tripped from one of the outlaying books detailing the studies of mana crystals and fell, her arms flailing towards a candelabra. A strange instinct suddenly tingled within Faithlen, as if the world suddenly was slowed down. He saw the slowly being the widened faces of Petra. Findrum and Carlyle looking at something behind them. When the boy turned around, he saw the woman falling dangerously towards the candelabra. Look out! Faith Len cried to the servant. He reached out his arms wide but he seems just out of reach as the woman was meters away from its reins. He had only wished he that he could. There will to save her. The lad's hands began to glow blue as magical energies emerged from out of his body and flew towards the woman, as if the woman felt the cold but firm surface of flatland. The custodian opened her eyes to see a magically conjured wall that was made by Faith Len's own designs. I I I can cast magics. Faith Lean jumped up in excitement. Thank you, sir. You saved me. The custodian gave her gratitude. Boy. Did you just? Petra asked. His eyes twinkled like the stars in astonishment. The same description can also be said for Carlia too. Making a firm wall is an illusion spell that takes an intermediary amount of skill between an apprentice and an adept. It takes a few years to be able to perform that properly. Are you sure you are not gifted? The mage questioned. It must be the crystal. It blessed you with the gift where there is none. Petra concluded. I bet I can make a mirror copy of myself. Or cast destruction fireballs next. Or summon an army of skeletons. Maybe even come back from the worst of wounds. Faith Len began to fantasize on the multitudes of possibilities he could conceive in his young head. Yet Petra, Findrum and Carlyle remain inquisitive that there has to be much more than that. Then the faithful stepped forward and placed his hand on Faith Len's shoulder, his height easily towering an extra foot over Faith Len. I wish to see what you can do in the fight, 
Shall we head down to the sparring hall? I wish to test your ability with the blade, Petra said. Faith Len couldn't also believe his ears again. First his discovery of obtaining and blooming the gift being demonstrated for the first time but now he is going to be personally trained by Petra the faithful Rukdorf himself alongside the Grey Order's best trainers for young adventurers such as himself. The country mouse in him felt like he had stepped into one of the heroic epics he recalled bards singing at the tavern back in his hometown of Clairvuyite. He was taken downstairs where the guild members would train in their combat skills techniques. It reeked of sweat, a few hints of blood and tears. The personal trainers for the members were busy keeping the Grey Order adventurers' fitness regime in check applying appropriate discipline and correction when needed. Petra tossed a wooden training sword at Faithlen with a smirk of confidence. A smirk of a challenger as the novice can see from the way is smugly curled. Let's see if that crystal didn't make you too soft. Don't want to get all that magic under your head. A mage is fragile when one closes the distance. I want to see you if you can fend for yourself. Try to go through my parries and let me see your swordsmanship. Petra said as he twisted his right wrist to ready it for a friendly spar. Faith Len knew of Petra's legendary fencing skills. One of the few people known in Gleesia who can simultaneously handle multiple opponents by himself and come out in triumphal roar over their defeated bodies. He knew that his basic understanding of the sword was no match for Petra's years of training and experience but it was an honor nonetheless to be at the same proving ground as him. Here goes. Faith Len said. His first move against Petra would be a chop down from his training sword. Petra's instincts predictably kicked in. It was a predictable and easily readable move that many lesser swordsmen do. Easily countered with a well-practiced technique, an upwards parry to be precise. He grasped his sword with his two hands, twisted his blade up to the sky and to meet contact. He would then after the block has been made make a thrusting kick forward that should get the young lad to the ground. He was a shred of conscience in him that felt bad kicking a boy more than half his age and just fresh into adulthood. Yet he also wants to see if this chosen one has the ability to get back up. Their blades meet. Their wooden bodies made from some of the hardest oaks from Vercourt meeting each other flesh to flesh. Yet to Petra's sudden shock, he felt that the boy's chop of his sword was deceptively much more powerful. As powerful as tidal wave that crashes down in all of its terrifying strength. Petra's blade broke under the sudden weight of Faithland's sword and now the training weapon was left unimpeded as it aimed straight for his head. Ouch. Petra recoiled as he stepped back from grasping his bruised head. Petra, I am so sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Faith Len undone his battle stance and looked at his senior. The faithful looked for blood but thankfully the strike was not hard enough to crack his skull but onlooker commented that now Petra has an erroneous bluish red bruise on his handsome face. It's okay. But boy, you are quite strong too and... What? Petra reassured him only to see that now his training sword was now broken in two between the hilt and the fool's blade. Another. Petra requested one of the instructors. Another blade was thrown at him. He was not going to let that boy get away with landing a blow on the great Petra the faithful Rechtdorf. In guard. Petra cheered as he lunges at Faithlen. Now the boy was in the defensive parrying blocking and dodging Petra's merciless assault. He could barely keep up with Petra's tireless stamina. He soon began to waver as fell to the ground blade in hand. Aha! Petra ecstatically said as he was about to throw in the killing blow and take this round in their friendly spa on the ground and due to his own naivete, Faith Len reflexively raised his hands to protect his head and upper body like a poor surf begging for mercy. But as his hands gestured, another wall this time made of flames erupted to shield him from Petra who was caught off guard by the boy's arcane reflex. The faithful two now fell down to the ground as the crowd began to murmur then jeer. Hey, magic is illegal. One of the instructors said. Traditionally a sword duel is purely a sword duel. No help of any kind or other means of attack except your own two hands and two feet were allowed in the fight. What Faith Len done or in his own mind couldn't believe that he had done was grounds for a disqualification. Oh no, Faith Len. Carly rushed towards the boy sat now distraught with his still smoldering hands being stared down by him. I can cast fire, I can cast fire, 
I can cast fire. The boy leapt off of his feet. Indeed you do. Pecha got back up. Just next time we spar. Don't do that. He informed him. I don't know how I did it. I just did it. Faith Len said. We will need to train you back in the college. Your gift needs to nurture it so you can control it. Last thing I want to see is you burning the whole chalet to the ground. Carlyle said. That's wonderful Lady Silverdane. What happens after that? The demons won't be waiting for us forever. Faith Len asked. We will most likely go on a quest. Likely the greatest of our time. Me and Lindis have uncovered several leads that hopefully might take us to several demon slaying items. One of them is the fabled tomb of Kuldel's lie. A.E. Jack himself. Findrim said. You mean can rifle? Faith Len's eyes widened in excitement. Might. The lead is vague and the rest are much more reliable than an ancient tomb that the stories go should never be tried to find out. Findrim said, according to the legends, after some time after Kul Delsley Allburn, the founder of the Empire simply left off all of his titles, lands, armies and riches to his eldest son and left with his famous sword can rifle. He said that one day, when the world needed him again, they would find him and his mighty blade by following the whispers. Many scholars who read that line debated over the interpretations of that statement for decades. It was a riddle of the ages. Many rumor mongers say that the blade can kill even the mightiest of foes or the most imposing of armors. Able to strike true no matter where it struck nor no matter whatever defenses Kuldel's adversary cowered behind. What about now? Have we done anything that could help us against the demons right now? Faith Len asked. Oh, the elves I heard are in charge of scouting out the other worlders as we speak already. Carlyle said. She picked up the young boy and the Grey Order seniors spirited him away to the magic college where a crash course in magics and arcane channeling will be lectured to the blooming new mage with a fiery temper to match the sun. A fiery temper for great justice. Dash late afternoon at an apothecary stand in Suville. Dash. Aliathra was distracted. She was more inattentive than she was when she hadn't yet been attached to Strider Group. The distraction? One of Suville's many statues. The subject? A playfully floozy woman carrying with her a cornucopia of agricultural bounty. She admired the woman's jovial expression and the curves and smoothness of the female's form. It spoke to her. Something within her. Something that made the elf blush. Aliathra. Samantha tapped her. She turned around with a heart skipping a beat. She turned around to Samantha and Iris who stood behind her. They had noticed her flustering over the statue. So, what are we looking for Iris? Samantha asked. Several aromatic herbs. You said your friend Beyong Chin will be here to help facilitate my purchase. The vampire which answered. She walked towards one of the stands and began to browse the inventories. She was silently observing the herbs, seeds and other exotics being sold, smelling every essence of them. She was looking for a sensory enhancer. Do you know anything about perfumes Samantha? One such perfume I wore back in Eth Island was for parties that my mother would say makes everyone fawn over you. Some of the ingredients used in the perfume can be quite surprising. Aliathra mentioned. Not really. Samantha replied. Just curious. What is your life like back where you live? Samantha asked. Well I normally that question should be said in closed doors but I can say that. Aliathra hesitated for a moment. Can be restrictive? Patterns and protocols? Traditions even? Samantha asked. The elf nodded. How did you know? Aliathra asked. I am no stranger to controlling parents. My father, before he passed, forbade me to leave the house on my own unless I was with either him or my mum. Samantha said. What happened to your father anyway? Iris asked. He died from cancer. Cancer? Iris and Aelia threw a question together. Imagine a pain that slowly creeps up to you. It grows in thorns until the pain it inflicts is so much you couldn't take it anymore. I knew before I graduated West Point that my father's days were numbered and I prayed and prayed that he may live long enough to see me finish, but alas on the very day the ceremony was supposed to happen. I was told by my mother that my father had passed away, Samantha said with quiet tone. I, am so sorry. Iris apologized. My condolences to your radar. Aliathra added. So, I noticed you looking at that statue. No need to say it now but. 
Are you by any chance? Restrained in some way? Samantha asked. The elf nodded again. Oh, the beautiful, headstrong and free-spirited elf is restrained. That's ironic. Iris chuckled. Look, Eliathra, as a woman, if you want to talk about it, then, you can with me. I have been there and I know a thing or two about that. It's okay. Samantha held Eliathra's hand emphatically. Perhaps we can discuss that in less agitating times. Eliathra said. Excuse me, a voice said behind them. It was a bit rough and Samantha couldn't tell from the crowded market noises surrounding her. You here to see the goods? Iris turned around to politely step aside from the booth but she felt on her breast the pointed edge of a magic wand. She would be disgusted at a cowardly attempt to challenge her and she had a few times of being challenged by other hotshot mages but this time she was given pause, for the magic wand was infused with holy magic. The anathema for beings such as the vampire witch as herself, the princess you kidnapped will be coming with me back to Eth Island. The man said, it was an elf male who was discreetly aiming his wand at Iris holding hostage. Samantha wanted to draw her pistol but she couldn't risk their assailant seeing her twitch and risk Iris' life. Even the stall owner was too horrified to react lest the man kills Iris. It was the most delicate of situations. What is it you want? Samantha asked. Only that the princess may be returned and you coming ww. The elf was interrupted by two sudden jolts from his back as his entire body fell limp as if he just had a heart attack at the worst possible time to get one. Amateur Bobby Biongchin said as he subtly grabbed the killed elf from his hands and then quietly guided the dying native to a nearby bench and lay him there his hands covering the entry wounds of the bullets he took from Bobby's silenced pistol. Just in. In the nick of time? Is that the way you say it in your tongue of English? Iris asked. Yeah, Mr. Biongchen? Samantha asked. Just call me Bobby. Miss Rose. But damn. That guy was an amateur. Hey. You. Bobby pointed to the apothecary stand's owner. I am gonna pay you 20 ducats that you never saw this plus the pay I am giving you for what these lovely ladies need, he said. The shop owner nodded not daring to question him. Diaz called me up. He told me that we are gonna need enough of this sexy juice to lure in about 20 or so land sharks. So give me all of that, Biongchin said. You want the ingredients for the animal aphrodisiacs for 20 bullets? Do you have a... The store owner began to question. From Samantha's own judgment it was like he was hearing something so absurd. Even Eliathra and Iris were left agape. Do I look like I give a damn about how much it is? I can pay whatever it is the cost for it. Hell. Give me literally everything. I don't want no angry mole rats with big teeth screwing me or this place over. The Aparo Corpa said. Well if you say it. Like that. The store owner reluctantly agreed as he retreated to his storage to get the needed ingredients. He knew the recipe well and if the man's was willing to risk himself for it then who is he to judge of the stranger's sanity? Why the shock faces? I thought you would all be grateful? Bobby asked the two women. Making an aphrodisiac for twenty bullets is... expensive? I told you. Our magic is that we are rich relax. Be glad that we are friends here. Bobby reminded them. No. It's that the aphrodisiac has to be very potent to be able to attract that many bullets. Iris said, they will act wild to Diaz and his steel horse, and I will be inside it with him making the mating call. Eliathra said in distress, don't worry, I trained Diaz myself. Combat driving, subterfuge, and guns. He embraces danger like a lover. Besides, I showed you first hand with that poor schmuck over there. Bobby pointed back to the deceased elf assailant on the bench that he planted a moment ago. Besides, we got some choppers coming in with gatling guns on their doors for good measure. Wonder if the land sharks like to eat 6,000 rounds per minute. Bet they won't even know what hit him. The corpo added, wait, I know that man. He is one of the Cephid Liad agents that were with Lindus. Eliathra pointed out after an examination of the interloper's face. That's some sort of state sec right? Protect the elves from bad guys with cunning people, right? Biongchin asked. Indeed. They must be here scouting us out. You, earthlings are conspicuous after all. Do you think they know I am with you? No. I can't go back. They will kill me. 
They think I am corrupt. Aliathra despaired. Relax. Nobody will take you away not while I am here. Samantha reassured. If that one is here, then there must be more of them. Aliathra said. They might try to cause trouble for us are you saying? Well. Thanks for the heads up then Miss Luther. I will let the other teams know. Bobby said. Here is your order my lord. The stall owner came back. With an entire cartload of assorted herbs, seeds and ambergris. Okay, yeah. Maybe I do have a limit on what is too much. You sure about this Miss Cadahagan? Bobby asked. I am going to need a bigger file. Iris flatly said. Dash the next day. Dash. Diaz was finishing up the last minute tuning of his Mustang that was just airlifted to Suville a few hours ago. It was almost time to perform the fake mating dance that he was assigned to risk himself to do. He was confident of his abilities but he didn't mind making sure to sharpen his axe before he cut the proverbial land shark tree. Diaz? Here it is. The aphrodisiac, Samantha said as she, Aliathra, Crocker and Obedia carried three heavy cast iron pots filled with the fuming concoction. And then Diaz's nostrils inhaled the aphrodisiac soda. Whoa. What the fuck is that? Diaz said. The aphrodisiac. Aliathra said. Are you telling me the bullets get off on that? Diaz questioned with his voice raised. Please tell me Iris isn't playing some sort of sick joke on me. No, Iris is sleeping in the land cruiser with Kay and keeping her company. She worked all night just to make this. Please do this for her. Iris worked so hard on this. Crocker said. We will be in the air shooting down on the bullets with armor piercing rounds from some door guns while Abidia and a few volunteers slow them down with some tranquilizer shots. We will also need to capture at least one of these things alive if possible. Samantha reminded. I better be allowed to drink some of that Suvelli wine after this. But how the hell am I going to clean this gunk off of my Mustang? Diaz complained. I will also bless your Mustang since I too will be in it when we undertake this feat. Aliathra said. That sounds okay for now. That and you washing my car with me in it while wearing a bikini. After this shit is over. Diaz smirked. A bikini? Aliathra asked. The rest of Strider group paused with a beat. Some of them. Specifically Crocker and Abidia blushed with a vain hope of that happening. Samantha can only face palm. Iris was also confused. I am kidding. Sheesh. I am risking my ass getting squished by angry mole things. Don't I get joking privileges? Motorsport is a calling. A life I tell ya. Bled out things I do for my next paycheck. Diaz complained again as he picked up the first bucket of aphrodisiac and with a slight hesitation poured out its contents on his precious car. He gagged for breath for every time he poured the odorous potion on his Mustang three times. After the last of the chemical was finished, he and Aliathra went inside the car, specifically the passenger seat next to Vincent. Upon him laying his hands on the wheel-shaped trains of his steed, Diaz cracked his knuckles before starting the ignition. Aliathra meanwhile casted a small prayer for Nanith's blessing onto her. Vincent and the Mustang for protection and success, but unlike her previous prayers, she held a few doubts within her. The rest of Strider group except the resting Iris and the babysitting Cairn in the Land Cruiser, boarded their assigned Super Osprey which was coincidentally piloted by Captain Carplian again. Crocker was on the door gun, Clay was on comms managing some recon drones to become the eyes of the operation, Abidia was preparing the tranquilizer gun and lastly the lieutenant is at the co-pilot seat. Diaz drove his car to a nearby field prepared with a large containment cell inside filled with some food that will be remotely triggered to close any specimens that is dumb enough to be caught in it. Ali, okay. So say again how do I do the dance thing again? Vincent asked the elf, like a. How did Samantha said it? Figure eight. Aliathra said. I see. And do it gracefully am I right? Diaz asked again. Indeed. Let me make the mating call. Aliathra nodded. Diaz remotely rolled down the window as Aliathra leaned out and whistled. A shrill sound followed by a sequence of flutes from her whistle can be heard amongst the silence of that sunny day. The sound of a female land shark in heat. Vincent can only have faith on the elf in the hope that the land sharks take the bait. Now, 
Do the dance. Aliathra climbed back down. Okay Ali. Make that call. Diaz said. Start the dance. They are coming. Aliathra said. In earth we call this drifting. Buckle up. Diaz smiled. And away we go. Diaz cheered as he ignited his engines. The Mustang jabbed forward as Aliathra's graceful frame was jolted by the sheer violence of Diaz's ardent horsemanship as the elf could see it. This steed of his was a very spirited creature and its master Vincent was its equal as he grasped the Mustang's wheel-shaped trains tightly as he sharply turned the wheel right shifting the car and thus Aliathra's weight left. It was wild. Uncivilized but a sense of an airy freedom could be felt on the seat of Diaz's steed. It was a sensation of unrestrained emotion being released as Diaz revved the Mustang's engines and his off-road built tires screeched in alto of burning rubber, reverberating dirt and the lamentations of quietly living in peace creatures nearby. Meanwhile, Strider Group was in the air on the Super Osprey observing Diaz from the safety of a higher altitude. Diaz, I got movement coming down on your southeast. 135. I mean, 45. Damn it. Clay relayed. It was an earlier effort from his part that he set up several underground sensors within the vicinity of the entire mating ritual grounds. He had a hard time trying to relay the information methodically due to Diaz's constant turnarounds by his incessant drifting. Yeah yeah, have a bed and crockage their fingers now. Diaz radioed back. I got two more signatures from the same direction. Aliathra, it's working. Samantha said. Here we go. Crocker enthusiastically smiled as he spun the rotary barrels of his minigun. A bee die loaded a tranquilizer dart on its special gun and took aim. He knows that there were a few exposed spots of land sharks that he can easily penetrate despite the high frequency molecular disruption waves his dart is designed to take down high armor targets. Too bad that the more desirable parts to aim were protected by the land shark's impressive armor plates. Remember Diaz, we need to capture some of them alive. Lurum, Samantha reminded. Anything you want. Diaz said as he continued to create more figure eights with his drifting car. Each rotation followed by Aliathra's whistling made the already present bullets much more aroused whilst Samantha detected more of them approaching Diaz. Hey, some of them are doing the work for us. Those dumb cunts, Crocker commented as he sprayed a burst of gatling fire from his door gun due to his restraints. Several of the bull sharks, mad with lust saw that other than themselves, there were other land shark bachelors vying for the female's attention. About two pairs began to fight amongst each other for the right of genetic accordance with this very graceful female who danced so gracefully and emitted a pheromone which was concentrated so greatly that it can drive already bonded males to lose all sense of nuclear fidelity and instead to think with their fallacies. Oh no. I think the potion worked too well. Aliathra realized. This is like that one fucking time I drove against 30 fuzzes and managed to get away with a mountain cliff yeah. Ha ha ha. Yes, this is great. Diaz smiled. The elf was confused on how can this human embrace such grave aspects with nothing more than a playful laugh. It was as if the possibility of death was a toy to him. Not even the followers of the male half of the twin gods of war, Wydle the Spear of Conquest will be this rapturous over such mind-boggling odds. His twin sister Garner the Hearth Aegis in all of her calculating wisdom would see this attempt to be the greatest folly in all of follies. Aliathra can only pray again silently that she can at least get out of this predicament alive. Hey, Diaz's voice broke her out of her dread. He held her hand tightly for a moment with a sense of affection from the way he gripped her pristine hands. We can do this. Together. Diaz smiled before his hand quickly let go to grasp the clutch and shifted gears. The crowd of libidinous monsters and several of their envious wives were gathering up at that one field in droves. They either continued to fight each other or were chasing for the Mustang's non-existent gonads. They didn't pay head of the large out-of-place boxes that were so inconspicuously out of place due to their primal madness taking over their mind and souls. You got four on your tail Vinny. One of them is a girl by the way. Abidaya said. Good. My gift to Dr. Malona. Let him know he fucking owes me some pokes bowls after this shit is over. Diaz said as he sped away. 
his Mustang making a beeline from the container boxes. We are going to crash. Aliathra screamed. Faster baby. Faster. Diaz's inner speed demon took over him raised his voice. The thunder of his car revved to its crescendo as the Mustang aligned perfectly with the box. Aliathra eyes were held captive as she knew that being trapped in an enclosed space with four land sharks will not end well for her and Diaz. Hi, ya. Yeah. Diaz roared as he pulled the e-brakes and began to aggressively turn around his car to the right. His Mustang shifted away from the trap's opening while using the inertia from Diaz's velocity to remain in the same competitive speed despite his steed technically not galloping to Aliathra's shock and blood rushing amazement. As for the bullets they had no time to realize that they had been fooled before all four of them, three males and a female were trapped inside the containment cell which the motion sensor activated magnetic locks coldly sealed itself preventing escape or breach. Whoa. Did you just, Clay said. Can I if to? Yeah. Diaz pumped up his sideboard in celebration. And that's why I was banned from combat cab. He added, for the rest of the land sharks, about seven of them, three women and four more men. It was a massacre. They were hastily disposed of by the Gatling gun and tranquilizer shot tandem of Crocker and Obedia plus the other Aparo helicopters who assisted them. I think we got all of them, Samantha said. Another mission success. But just as she was about to wipe the sweat off of her brow, her radio rang. It was from the Onchin. Hello Miz. I mean Bobby. It's Rose we just got it done, Samantha said. That's great. We are just sitting down here enjoying Vinny's show, Bobby replied. What do you mean we? Samantha asked. Look down at your land cruiser, Bobby said. Following just that. Samantha looked downwards from the chopper to see that not only was Mr. Byongchen was having her load to them from the ground, but also, Duke the Bolt, his retinue of close courtiers and bodyguards, Ken and Iris, and several peasants who were curiously following the commotion that dragged the Duke's attention towards. The Super Osprey landed amongst the bullet-ridden corpses of the land sharks as Strider Group disembarked from their respective groups to greet them. You were wonderful you guys, those damn monsters didn't know what hit him, Bobby smiled cheerily, your performance rivals even the greatest of circuses I have seen from the art college, Duke the Bolt ecstatically jumped like a child, the ruler of Suville fawned over Strider as gossip from what they had witnessed spread, several of the peasants ran out to herald it such an auspicious sight. These are the worlders, took down all at once eleven land sharks. Many of the most valiant of adventuring parties from the Grey Order in comparison could barely handle a budding family of one nimble male and one hot-headed female pregnant with young through the skin of their teeth if the monsters didn't bite their innards off and presented as an offering to the wife of the monster household. But just killing a large number of land sharks of one day wasn't going to impress the Duke in a long-term diplomatic sense as Samantha can challenged through her own intuition. This was just a short-term victory, and the over-encompassing strategic goal was in the rails. The cooperative partnership of Suville today was only a tactical victory, and a scientific one for the voracious scientific knowledge hunger for Dr. Malona. Many more and a few pushes in between will be needed outside of being the friendly new monster exterminators in town for Strider Group and the rest of the youth mission. Chapter 30, Two Storms Are Brewing The Slay Agent Legion's finest generals gathered around the Imperial Palace's war room. War plans were made. Military assets were reviewed and orders were being written to send out by carrier birds, but Emperor Ruldin was still unsure of several key factors to ensure the Empire's survival. First was the commitments of his elven allies, with news of the royal princess Aliathra who was sent to aid them now deemed missing and perhaps dead. Ruldin drew sweat on how his most strategic ally would react to this news. He could rely on the Cephid Liad and the roster of mages clerics, rangers and other sorts of rogues and unconventionally trained people but his only links to them were through the royal family the Lethors. He has yet to see Lindis again since she was beginning to work on something but he has no idea what that something is or how it could have any help. If fighting underhandedly could help, then he shouldn't question the spy woman who rivals the Empire's own native counterpart of Mitu and her crows.
The second consideration is with the dwarves up at the Ustalrock Mountains. He has several very strong trade agreements and other economic guarantees that ensure him that he has both the security and access to the riches of the Ustalrocks such as Scandinite, Mana crystals, luxury jewels, silver and most fabled of them all. Actocolite which was used to make some of the finest weapons in the continent and it is said that it is a mind of its own almost always protecting its user against harm and never losing it as if soul bound to serve its user till relinquishment or death, was in the sense that the knowledge on how to make such a miraculous ingot of Actocolite that's good enough to forge a sword from was said to be lost for centuries as not many dwarves in the Astlrooks knew how or what exactly Actocolite is made or even looks like in its raw form. It was one of the leads that Petcher and his Grey Order said they will investigate to see if they can continue the production of these type of weapons. It was even said that Caldell's sword can rifle was said to be made from this very material. Speaking about that, there was of course his on how gamblers would say, Ace in the sleeve. The Chosen One himself attached under the care of Grey Order specifically Petcher. Faithlen, an upstart boy from a backwater town in the Empire was chosen by the Crystal to be one of its champions. News was spreading but many of the more cynical or practical minded of the Empire held doubts over this young boy. From what Halden has heard, the boy showed some promising aptitude in both magic and swordsmanship. He may have shown competency but experienced he was not. Hopefully. The Grey Order can get him out there and do any notable acts of heroism to fend off the demon invasion. These are all of the tools and his strengths at his disposal. The Empire's best shot to protect themselves from the oncoming apocalypse. Alden didn't want to see his two children grow up in a collapsing world where the demons preyed upon all life. No. He needed to win this one for humanity and for all of Gleesia. If they don't stop them now, then the age of the Iron Fist where people like Albone will make suffer the land suffer under the yoke of his tyranny all over again. He made a promise to his late wife Silent that he would take care of his daughter and son Istris and Arthufa. Now he knows what is at stakes, Alden deliberated thoroughly on who are his adversaries, the demons or other worlders themselves. From what little he had gathered, their power base is somewhere near his vassal of Tyrian. He hates to admit it but he has to consider the citadel at the crossroads between the Empire, the southern tip of the Astlrooks and the exotic lands of the eastern suzerainties, and beyond, to be compromised. From what information he could gather, they have to powers of mighty steel dragons that fire arrows that explode in a brilliant gust of fiery shrapnel or at the loud gusting of their breath attacks that spat daggers faster than the eyes can see. There was no hope for an unfortified house to withstand even the minimalist of its assault from the beasts. He also still remembers the words from that steel cloud as so it called itself when it made its presence known hovering over his city days ago. It immediately left after it said its piece but nobody in Slaeja cannot forget what it said. We know that it is you who tried to assassinate Governor White and Prince Clovich. As Alden could remember the steel cloud bitterly advocated. Rumors amongst the populace whispered behind closed doors over the implications of that. Prince Clovich and the Principality of Tyrian was one of the most prosperous places within the Empire's realm. His family had a significant influence in the core politics of the Slaeagian Empire due to being where all the trade coming east would converge, make sales and travel away from. The Rians were loyal, steadfast and always in tabs with the latest gossips from all over the continent and any attempt on his person or the lands he governs would ripple through all of Zanigrad. There were doubts being sown within the populace outside in the countryside and inner territories if open conflict now is even a viable option due to not experiencing firsthand these other worlders themselves. Many only just recently heard of the news that the capital was attacked through varying degrees of trickle-down word of mouth from the less informed citizens of the empire. Alden parted his lips and let out a deep shuddering sigh feeling the mixture of stress, age and sleeplessness all mixing together in a foul brew. Before him lay numerous problems with the greatest being the arrival of those from the void. These are the worlders, damned beings whom had undone the entirety of the Empire's table of it displayed in all of her expansive glory. 
He was used to juggling around the more practical sides of running the empire such as statecraft, law legislations and economic management but these other worlders almost made him want to swipe away all of the pieces on the board as everything was now deemed irrelevant, his inner torment leaving him oblivious to the back and forth discussion of his advisors and generals, some noticed, some didn't continue their back and forth with others across the table. 325,000 legionnaires all spread out with only less than half of that near Tyrian, one general said, who are also mostly recruits or only experienced in fighting bandits rather than proper armies. We need to move one of our northern legions down south to reinforce now. Another said, the tribes people might see that as an opportunity to take back some of the ground we had taken from them, said Hugid Kasa, the Priot Kadliza or Grand Commander of the Legion argued. It was his valor and the veterans he led that fought tooth and nail for at the north to get the new territories for the empire. The Dawson, the umbrella term for the beast people who live north of them sat upon a rich and untapped reserve of mana crystals and oak that the empire needed for other expansion plans such as their navy to fend off Tavai privateers and to build more cities with. In his experience, they are all despite their many sizes colors and hairs were relentless with each kind different but equally perilous to behold. Using their homeland to their advantage to perform ambushes and sneak attacks, only the strongest and daring of legionnaires can live to see their first years there through. To be made even partially pulled back from his gains made the Cadleys feel like all of his hard campaigning will be all for naught. What use is the North if the Empire will be up in flames from the South? We know how to deal with the beast people well enough that we can eventually take back whatever we let them gain but these other worlders dead attacked our city. The homeland is bleeding. Please Kadliza, the goddess Ghana needs her bravest of sons to protect her domain. One of the younger officers appealed. Those words pierced Hugo to his heart. The junior officers were right. Yet when he said about knowing how the beast people fought in those countless campaigns against them got him to stop and think of another concern. Just how do these other worlders fight? He knew that the Easter suzerainties prefer to use horses or other mounts to outmaneuver their foes. The Dawson will try to outsmart the enemy with intricate knowledge of their home train. The dwarves prefer to outlast their enemies based on his experiences helping out several clans during civil wars and the elves prefer a mix of outfighting their enemies through superior technique and also outshooting their enemies with the aid of their bows and crossbows or magic. From the reports he heard, there was mix of elven and easter suzerainty's patterns in the form of the steel dragons the other worlders have been able to outmaneuver their best griffin riders and whilst being able to output an obscene amount of ranger fire with their breath attacks no reports yet if these united federation have any melee fighters just like the old legends of Albone and his steel demons being supremely armored and heavy weapon wielding monstrosities who cut down anything through brute force alone Emperor we should we redeploy some of our northern legions back home? Hugit asked. W.H. What? Sorry, I. I was lost in thought. Alden woke up from his inattention. Redeploy some of our best legions to the Terrian border? Hugit repeated. Yes. Yes. But what about Lindus? Petra, Alden said. Hugo had his reasons to harbor a significant amount of distrust to the Grey Order and the Sephide Liad the former being nothing more but glorified mercenaries more concerned of their pay and living another day despite their numerous and credible skills that come with a price tag of hundreds of ducats. They also have a tendency to be quite insubordinate when it comes to the more lawful legionnaires who have a more uniform means of conducting battles for the elves, their more concern of the survival of their nation and peoples plus their tendency of secrecy and oftentimes manipulating the other peoples of Glee easier to do their bidding like pawns in a game board makes them feel condescending and smug at their supremacy. I do not think those two can do much good other than causing too much chaos in our own soil my lord. I suggest you let the legion do. Hubert was interrupted by the door opening suddenly behind them. It was Lindis, the Sephide Liad elf. Normally it is rude to barge unless a critical update was needed to be let known. Lindis, you said you and your colleague are working on something? What is it exactly? Alden asked. 
His dull face was reinvigorated by the elf's presence. Or maybe it's the fact that elven women are just supremely dashing in looks compared to the war-weary and stern faces of all of the generals gathered. I was just informed by my agents. That the other worlders are in Suville, Lindis bluntly said. The room was set abuzz by that heralding. These other worlders are making their move so quickly now and already their tentacles have reached one of Tyrion's neighbors, the Duchy of Suville, one of the most important economic centers in all of the Empire. Many of the generals began to fear the worst, a besiegement. The city from a strategic point of view was not designed to fight back a siege. We must rally the legions now. Suville will not hold out for long. One of the generals pleaded. They are not besieging the city mind you. Lindus calmed them down. But based on my reports they are attempting to do the same thing that they did to Tyrion. She said. Which is? Hugit asked. You generals lack subtlety. All you brutes can think of is bashing other people's skulls until they squish. As I was about to say. They are trying to seduce Duke the Bald to their side. My scouts reported that the other worlders have presented him many gifts, Lindus said. What kind of gifts? Alden's eyes twitched, his head now pried to this new development. From what they could discern, promises of riches beyond his wildest dreams, sights never before seen and fruits never before tasted. One such gift of the latter is what they could hear as Mesus fields. It said that the Duke and his court were already begging the other worlders to give him more of that strange dark looking bread, Lindus said. There was a slight cringe on her tone when she got to the part about the Duke clamours. That is most troublesome. I am afraid Suville is lost. Alden capitulated. The Duke was by all accounts from the lowliest peasant to even his own imperial guards. But the Bald is someone who can best be described as a man with the body of a bloated 31-year-old man but the mind of a spoiled prepubescent child of at least 10 autumns worth of age. Suville in the grand scheme of things from a wartime perspective as the aging emperor sees in his map of the empire is valued for its ports and richer recruiting grounds for sailors and marines. Then there's the wine and fruits of the region that could be used for a whole variety of purposes like preservatives, medicines and lamp fuels. It normally relies on Tyrion for its protection inland and a garrison of well-funded, thanks to the rich trading by mostly inexperienced knights in addition to the Estal Rocks going down all the way south of its coast. For the sea however, a garrison of the Slay Aegean's Imperial Navy sits atop the duchy but are mostly just fast and light frigates whose job is to patrol and intercept any intruders that fall into the line of pirates and smugglers. However, there was rumours that the garrison are easily bribed to feign ignorance. Not quite my lord, Lindus said. Oh, you have something? Alden asked, his heart skipping a beat. The duke still has to have a bard come into his chambers to sing him to sleep and some of those songs conform to several superstitious beliefs. I recall one song calls about a bad omen that warn of a disaster. Storms and earthquakes followed by famine or rebellions to name a few. I told my spies that if we can convince the duke that these are the worlders are a bad omen we need to make these warning signs to get the message across. Lindis proposed. Can you? Explain further. Alden pushed his ear closer. The games, that festival that the duchy holds around this time to celebrate the end of the summer, Lindus said. Ah. You mean the course he had? Everyone flocks there. Hubert interrupted. Are you saying we should make the course he had cancelled by causing the storm? It is in bad faith to hold a festival after a calamity. Alden said. Lindus silently nodded. The Emperor and his cabinet deliberated it for a while. The Corsia had held many kinds of games from fighting tourneys, art contests, races and even a fireworks display. It would be, huge blow to one's spirits and finances if it was unfortunately cancelled. Alden bit his lips and swallowed his pride. Tell your agents to do it. The Emperor said. A lot of people are not going to like this. Hugot sighed. Everyone in the room knew the consequences of this action. Dash meanwhile in Cowell Point. Dash. The clouds were slowly darkening the once azure skies of Suville and the wind began to flow hard like crashing waves brushing violently with the cliffside grass as Strider Group oversaw the vista from the ruined lighthouse. 
It was nearing sunset and Strider Group was assigned by Byeongchin to scout over Kal Point for the ships that Zartrak and his Tavai are transporting the mana crystals to. Another team by the name of Viking will oversee the unloading of the cargo while an escorted convoy of trucks arranged by Aparo to be transported back to New Albany for research. Hope they come here on time. Clay commented. The good light left from his binocular but it was immediately followed up by the Squadland cruiser's headlights turning on. It was laid back that time as dinner time approaches so Cairn thought it would be a good idea to watch a classical fantasy film for the sake of Aris and Aliathra inside. What is your magic mirror going to show us? Aliathra asked. It is called a. A. Smart Pad Aliathra. It will show you a movie that you might like. Cairn answered. He turned the device over facing the screen towards the two women. A movie is like a play princess. Iris explained in her own way. What are we going to watch? Aliathra asked. The Hobbit made by John Reynold Reul Tolkien. You may see some. Familiar. A. Things and ideas here that will hit you close to home. It is by the way. The prequel or what happened before the events of Lord of the Rings that you have watched. Well. For Aris at least, Cairn said. Close to home? Aliathra was bewildered as the metaphor didn't go through her head. Just watch it. Iris said. The two girls saw the story of Bilbo Baggins and his quest to help Thorin Oakenshield get his old home back from the evil dragon Smog. She also saw the moment that the halfling get the One Ring of Power. An artifact as the girls saw it of extreme and seductive powers that corrupts the souls that touches it. To Aliathra's astonishment, the corruption is less visually apparent and more psychological in nature with their own selfish desires doing the real physical changes such as neglect of one's exterior as in the case of the previous holders of the ring can attest. They four orcs who were by Iris' own statements were distorted and almost always male. Orcs normally allow their own women to fight alongside the men raids and compared to the looks between the orcs in Lord of the Rings and the orcs in Gleesia, the latter were much more presentable in facial features. Hey what's going on? Diaz said, he came back inside them wrap alongside a bee dyer and Lieutenant Rose, the top side of their heads had the scent of fresh raindrops. The Hobbit. Something for fun before dinner time. Cairn said. Oh my. Wonder how will Aliathra react to the elves? Samantha mentioned. There are elves in this play? Aliathra asked. Yes, look and see for yourself. Samantha smiled back. Just then, Crocker entered the land cruiser through the driver's seat and turned to the squad. His eyes widened in worry as he looked at the rest of his team. Damn. I just got a call from Isaac. He told me this is gonna be a rainstorm. Crocker informed. Oh no. Is the delivery going to be off? Diaz asked. I think it will just be delayed. Crocker said. I hope the Tavai know what they're doing. I noticed they use the same normal wooden crates to transport. Well. Everything to avoid arousing suspicion. Aliathra said. You say that like it's a bad thing. Samantha said. Mana crystals of exceptionally large quantities have to be transported in special crates that only a few groups of people in Gleesia are known to use. It's meant to keep them safe and stable during so they don't accidentally ignite. This however comes at the cost of less space being used up to properly separate the crystals from each other. Unfortunately for the Tavai they are focused on speed and profit over safety I am afraid. Although they did improvise several sub-permeasures but ultimately, one wrong move can cause the whole ship to blow up in an expulsion of magical energies. Aliathra explained, the way the elf sounds like it is similar to how we transport nukes and oil lieutenant. Cairn whispered, that is most troublesome, Samantha said. I don't understand is that the skies normally shouldn't produce any rainfall let alone storms this time of the cycle. Aliathra questioned. I think it's best if the ship is delayed for maybe one or more day until the seas are cleared. Strider lead, strider lead, come in, the radio announced. It was the voice of the Viking group leader contacting them. Samantha picked up the radio and pushed the button to talk. This is strider lead, Citrep. It's supposed to be me calling you first. Samantha informed. Sorry Lieutenant Rose, we just need to inform you that we are going dig in for the night. Storm is shutting down the town, and some people are pissed. 
Viking lead said, What happened did something go wrong in town? Samantha pressed, Not of our own fault, but many of them said that they are worried that some sort of festival called the Corsi ad might get cancelled. Viking lead said, Oh, that is very troubling. I would be mad too if Ultra Kesselheim got cancelled for the year. Wait. What exactly is this? You are, T. Ah, Diaz commented before his tongue twisted itself on the foreign word. Kwasi ad. Aliathra and Iris said together in its proper pronunciation, it is a grand game and festival held in Suville to commemorate the Duchy's founding. Aliathra said, translated to the English tongue of the bravery games. This festival celebrates the Duchy's founding and is commemorated by dancing, music and food followed by games and performances all happening outdoors. I have been to one such festival in my life and it was so colourful there. Masks, costumes and minstrels singing their latest tunes while knights and adventurers from across the realm compete for honour, money and glory. Iris said. So, like the Olympics and Mardi Gras has a baby gotcha. Damn. Now that I realize it, that's gonna suck a lot. Diaz winked. Sure, is going to suck more if we stay here. This place is unsafe for us to stay on. Let's get back now down there to the lonesome hearth, yeah? Crocker said as he revved up the engine and carefully guided the land cruiser back to more stable ground. Meanwhile, the rest of Strider group huddled up together to watch the rest of the Hobbit movie for the next hour or so before Super. But they were mostly just wanting to see the novelty of seeing Iris and Aliathra's reaction to the youth's interpretation of the many fantastic creatures imagined up by the legendary J.R.R. Tolkien. Although there was no vampires in Tolkien's adapted work, the vampire witch was held in a captivated stance whilst Aliathra chattered with her teeth every time she sees the actors playing the heroes of the story perform daring feats. The elf felt like she was seeing with her own two eyes the romanticized novels she read with her sister now come to life. From the slaying of giants to the odds defying stands the heroes took to get to the ancestral dwarven hole took the princess breath away. Oh Sam, this play, I. I. I am impressed that your people wrote and capture such epic scenes for me and Iris to see. Aliathra thanked. The only complaint I have is the elves not using much magic as they would. All the magic is being used by that old wizard they call Gandalf. Aliathra gave her feedback. Well it's how Tolkien wrote it and the story revolves around just Bilbo's party and Gandalf so happens to be the only mage in the group. Samantha said. I do say that I find Thorin and Keeley to be the most handsome of the bunch. Aliathra blushed. How ironic. Abidia said. As Strider group began to discuss their thoughts and opinions of the movie, Samantha turned her eyes away to the window of them wrap out of some boredom or maybe just curiosity because she likes to see sometimes the raindrops slide down from the windows. By the window Samantha looked towards at was facing the lonesome hearth's front door and she could see that despite the state it was in, the building was holding out strong and hopefully a lightning bolt doesn't smite the home and burn it all to the ground. She couldn't bear to see old man Sanjil lose his life's work. Speaking of which, she noticed the front door open from the inside and out comes the man himself whose clock flew like a charging banner standing against the gale winds. Excuse me, Samantha said to her team as she got out of them rap. Sanjil, what are you doing out here? It's not safe, Samantha yelled. Her voice was muffled by the winds disrupting the sound. She walked closer to the old man who was carrying some a small bag of discernible content. They called to me again. Sanjil replied meekly. Who? Samantha asked. Ah, a neary sound was detected from Samantha's ear. Suddenly, illuminations of light of uncanny humanoid figures appeared. Their bodies were a of the same cloth of a commoner but in a macabre twist. Their bodies looked like they were crushed, flattened by some heavy weight. The lieutenant counted four figures all male by the way their hair was set and the clothes they wore. The figures all flew towards the ruined lighthouse that Samantha and her team just left from. My. My family's restless spirits. They continue to do their duty one more time. Sanjilf sulked. Spirits? You mean ghosts? Samantha asked. Yes. They never accepted that they had died not while the storms continued to darken the night. 
The storm that took their lives away and changed my life for the worst is just like this one, Sanjilf said. There were tears falling on his eyes as the lieutenant could discern due to the reddening of his eye whites. The old man pushed the lieutenant away as he began to move forward, his frail body barely withstanding. But then a sudden acceleration of wind knocked Sanjilf back but thankfully the lieutenant was there to catch him. It is not safe here, Samantha argued. Then please. Take these candles up there by the ruins where my in-laws died and light them. It keeps them appeased at least for a while, Sanjilf said. With no other option or perhaps it was her own sense of compassion, Samantha grabbed the bag filled with candles and guided Sanjilf back inside his hostel where his goblin servant was waiting for him. What are you doing? Octo asked Samantha, helping. Now stay here with him, Samantha said. She held the bag tightly on her arm and dragged herself towards the land cruiser. Lieutenant, what are you doing? Crocker asked. It is Sanjilf. He wants these candles up at the lighthouse. Samantha explained that we just left. That's dangerous back up there. Crocker said. Please, it would mean a lot to the old man if we do it just now for him. Samantha appealed. It's too dangerous. Crocker argued. What's going on? Ira spoke it out. She wants to place some candles to where Sanjilf's family died. Up there by the lighthouse. Crocker pointed. The dead needs to be tended to with respect as decreed by Nenith. I will go. Aliathra said. Yeah, I did some shit like that for my more more. I will help. Abedia volunteered. Ah fuck this. Clay. Go with the lieutenant and make sure she and the rest of the squad get back here alive. Crocker ordered. Yes sir. Clay saluted. Samantha, Aliathra, Clay and Abedia trudged themselves up the cliff. The wind's weight made them struggle every step of the way. As they progressed they could hear the mournful wailing of the ghosts as they hovered around the ruins of what was once their familial duty and legacy. Hold each other's hand everyone. Don't get separated. We got to finish this fast. Abedia cried. Everyone held a hand to each other and gripped tightly. Together with each other's support the group made it back up the lighthouse ruins where they can see the ghosts hovering at the ruins of the once mighty tower. The ships are in danger once again father. A young faced ghost tapped an elderly looking spirit. Alas, the beacon is down. Hurry boy, grab the spare whale fat. Elderly ghost ordered. Samantha made her way past the ghost who did not notice her as she found a small sheltered compartment among the ruins where several dead candles lay. There melted wax rooting them on the cold and wet stone. Using her waterproof lighter, Samantha lit the bundle of candles she took from Sanjilf and delicately placed them on the driest section of the compartment. She silently prayed for a moment for these two lost souls who departed so tragically. May Nanith have mercy on them. The boy looks no more than fifteen. Aliathra commented. Aliathra, by any chance? How exactly are these ghosts? A spirit things are made? Samantha asked the elf. There are many theories about how these beings came to be. The humans say that these ghosts came to be because they have some sort of unfinished business and that they are tethered in this plane by the mana crystals until they fulfill whatever they wished they had done in life. Others from my own kind say that it is some sort of projection of a person's consciousness through the exposure to mana crystals. If we are going to believe but there are several lighthouses in the world that uses mana crystals over regular whale fat since the former can project a more luminous projection than the latter. But I have heard that it makes the lighthouse more vulnerable to fiery related accidents. The elf replied. I see, well by the looks of what I can understand. These ghosts are salty that they weren't able to fulfill their jobs as lighthouse keepers when they were needed the most. Samantha concluded. Salty, Aliathra asked. It means being resentful in our tongue. These ghosts that were Sanjilf's family-in-law were angry that they died while in the line of duty. The lieutenant explained. That is a good assumption. Aliathra admitted. The red-haired woman never fails to impress the elf. The wind began to pick up and the rainfall grew heavier on Souville. It was strong enough to cause the sea levels to rise and weak branches of trees to fly off. 
Meanwhile the ghosts of Sanjilf's in-laws continue to wail for the light that can never shine in their old enterprise. Moans of sadness, frustration and anguish can be heard from all the living who are present atop Cal Point which made them restless. This storm is getting crazier by the second now. We should get out of here now. Hope those Tavai ships can find their way safely. Storms like these can cause floods, Abidaya said, as long as the lighthouse down there is still on. We should have nothing to worry about, Clay said. The Tavai from his judgment were capable mariners. These sea elves should have no problem handling a nightly rainstorm. He peered over the cliff the new lighthouse situated at Old Suville's harbour burning brightly through the night like a sun that descended to be a lantern that lifts the darkness leading to Suville's golden sanctuaries. Before unexpectedly, the light snuffed out. Ah, LT, there. The lighthouse. Clay yelled. What? Samantha walked towards the radioman. The light on the new lighthouse. It, it just vanished. Clay panicked. From photographic memory. Samantha knew from that direction is indeed the new lighthouse that replaced the Cal Point lighthouse after its collapse. At first, Samantha couldn't believe it. Maybe they just needed to replace the light bulb or whatever is used to make that place glow in the dark. Samantha tried to reason out. Just as she spoke that, Clay's radio beeped. All teams. This is Viking Group. We are engaged in combat. I repeat. Viking group is engaged in combat. The radio said, Say again Viking, who are you engaged in combat with? Where is your position? Samantha asked. By the lighthouse at the port. Some hooded cloaks killed the lighthouse keeper. Static. Destroyed the fuel barrels. Static lighthouse is out of com. Static fire. Fire. 50 meters 3 o'clock. I need all available units to converge on my position now. We are pinned down my magic missile fire. Viking lead said, sabotage, who, Samantha pleaded for answer but the call dropped, who would do such a thing, Clay asked, look ho, my son, ships seeking shelter from the water god's wrath, the elderly ghost pointed, more ships, Samantha questioned, she dashed to the other side of the ruins and peered over to the great seer cross, Clay, use your night vision goggles, Samantha ordered, Turning on his NVG attached to the top of his helmet, the radioman looked truly past the darkness across him. He saw three ships that were blindly walking sailing hazardously fast towards Suville. He recognizes those ships. It was from the briefing earlier from Byongchin that those ships were marked from Zartrix Tavai smugglers containing the volatile but precious Unbinilium crystals and Suville is engulfed in absolute darkness. Shit, they are going to crash in blind to Suville, Clay realized. With those ships, they crashing so violently they could devour the whole city in an explosion of magical fire. Aliathra added, we need to do something. They are heading into fast, Clay said. We need a light source. They should slow down if they are nearing some light. Abidaya said, I got it. We have some flares back at the land cruiser and a flare gun we can improvise with those. Samantha said. The lieutenant then pointed downwards to the flat beach below the Cal Point's cliff. We can use the flares to light up the beach and signal the boats to land here. Samantha reasoned. But what if the crystals still explode from the rough landing? Clay argued. Well I rather have an empty beach on fire than an entire damn city any day of the week. Samantha argued back. I can use some of my illusion magic to make a big bright ball too if that can help. Aliathra said. Yes, you may also want Tyrus and her amulet to assist you on that too. Clay radio in Crocker and explain everything quickly. Miss Lutha, make that light ball now. Samantha ordered everyone. Yes ma'am. Abidaya and Clay saluted in unison. Aliathra meanwhile brandished her arms now conjuring a brilliant white light before raising them upwards to the sky. The beam of light illuminated the darkness for miles ahead to see that one must be blind not to miss such a sight. However, the elf mage's acts are an exhaustive effort for her to maintain. Normally a light spell should be no larger of a ball than the size of a child's head. Meanwhile, Clay radioed in Crocker from the land cruiser and as best as he could explain the situation to him. A fucking oil fire could happen? Crocker asked. Yes, get all of our flares out now, Clay said. The sergeant scrambled inside the land cruiser. 
toppling several objects and discomforting several of his own squad mates who were alarmed by the sudden shift of pace their sergeant was in. It took him a quick shouting of find the flares now, to whip up Kane, Iris and Diaz from their inert states. Here are reserve flares and a flare gun, Kane said after spotting the correct container box. He opened the box and made a quick inventory of its contents. Two green landing flares, three red landing flares, five white flare gun shells and the flare gun itself. What are those? Iris asked. Think instant bright light Iris. Kane explained quickly before closing the container box and running outside to the freezing and drenched storm. Crocker and the rest of Strider group quickly grabbed their raincoats before heading out where Clay rendezvous with them. He was gasping for air and trying to shake off the raindrops from his person after a mad dash back down Cal Point. Crocker. Aliathra is making the old lighthouse work again. She needs Iris for help. Clay panted. Got it. What about the flares? Crocker asked. You, Diaz, Abidia and Kane got to illuminate the beach so that those boats can land safely. Clay relayed Samantha's orders. Got it. Kane nodded before opening the container box of flares. Vincent and Kane took two each of the landing flares whilst a die took the last one. For Crocker he took the flare gun and all five of its ammo. He knew intrinsically that he is using these flares against its intended use. But he also knew that they can't afford to have the fantastic equivalent of an oil tanker fire to strike Suville directly. End of block 3